Council, I think we're about to begin our continuation of the public mm -hmm. hearings on budget. Um, if you could turn on your video so we can start the meeting. All right, City Clerk, will you do roll call of the June 15th, 2020 uh, budget hearing for the 2021-22 budget? It's a continuation. The following um, departments will be heard in the following order, airport, facts, fire, and police. Council Member Bredefeld. Here. Council Member Chavez. Here. Council Member Esparza. Aye. Council Present. Member Carabasi. Here. Council Member Soria. Here. Council Vice President Capriolio. Here. President Arias. Here. All right, folks, um, just a reminder, um, we put some additional measures in place to avoid some of the distractions or attempt at distractions of last week. That will result in council members and city staff being able to mute, unmute, video and, and video yourself. Um, so with that, keep in mind that we get a lot of audio feedback. So um, be cautious of your phone being so close to your computer and uh, whispering conversations that we will be hearing live on CMAC and the internet as we're proceeding. Um, with that, um, I ask uh, city manager, you have the floor with uh, the airport department's budget. Okay, um, great. Good morning, everybody. Um, Henry, do you, um, is your video up also for everyone? Yes. I okay, seen. great. Yeah, we're bringing in Kevin. We're just going to rotate in departments. So if you could just be patient um, in between departments, I'd appreciate it. And I have um, the director, Kevin Michael, right here now. So Kevin. Come on in, sit down wherever you want. Okay. Yep, we're ready. Go right ahead. I need them to be able to share screen. Allow us to share. Screen. Can you all allow us to share a screen, please? I don't know if it's Gavin or a council president. Your screen. Oops. There we go. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Council President Council, good morning. Kevin Michael, Director of Aviation. I've got with me my uh, the airport CFO, Daniel Del Signore, to answer any questions you may have. Um, as you're aware, uh, we've experienced a similar uh, situation as the as the rest of the nation with regard to airports. Uh, not much traffic. April and May, it's it's uh, coming back. We were down about. Uh, 7% of normal, now we're up over, well, close to 30% of normal, and we expect to be over 40% in July, so things are recovering on the aviation side. Um, the CARES Act dollars specific to airports is a bit unique in that it allows uh, Air Force to use it in any way they, they, they feel they need to with regard to replacing lost revenue. So with that, we're able to use those CARES Act dollars to get us through fiscal 21 um, as we uh, continue to recover. We believe we'll be at a full recovery by the end of fiscal 21, probably about 70% recovery uh, in the third, third to fourth quarter of fiscal 21. So, and just a, a note, uh, the international flights are, are all back. Uh, Aeromexico was the last one to return. They're 100% they're capacity starting July 1. So everything is from an airport perspective or an aviation perspective uh, pointing in the right direction. Um, with that, I'll just kind of pause and, and, uh, and open it up for any questions that anybody has with regard to what's going on at the airport and how we intend to navigate through this uh, next fiscal year. Thank you. All right, Council. If that's a, is that the full presentation of the city staff? Uh, it is at this point in time. We're just ready to answer any questions you may have uh, regarding to uh, what's happening out at the airport. All right, with that, we're going to go to public comment first. Um, if there's anybody in the public wishing to address the council on this item, please raise your hand and we, you will be identified for three minutes to address the council on the Fresno International Airport's budget. Um, the first person we see up is Lisa Flores. Um, you are being 
unmuted. You have the floor for three minutes. Hi, can you hear me, Miguel? Yes. Okay. Well, my big concern is over the weekend, with what limited time I had, looking for the budget for the line item, so I could actually see um, what the budget was for the airport, for the police, and also for the city council budget. I think I found city council budget, and I'll come back and address that later. But um, when I went to the agenda, I couldn't find line item budgets, and I'm just kind of wondering why. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Flores. Um, and just for your clarity, the city staff is not providing budget line items uh, during this budget presentation. What you see in the screen is the amount of budget information that has been provided to the council at this time. No, I, I wanted to clarify to Council President Henry, um, we do have the line item detail that we're utilizing for this continuing resolution up on the website. And Henry, do you want to direct the, the public to where that is? Yes, if, if the public goes to, again, the city's website, you want to go into the finance section of our website. And then within there, there is a, a subsection related to budget and under budget, uh, we have uh, included uh, the 2020 adopted uh, line item detail. So it is available by department. Thank you, Henry. Henry, can you make sure you email that information to all the council? Absolutely. Thank you. And does that, does that line Wilma, item? Wilma, let me go back where we're still taking public comment. So let me finish with public comment. Uh, next person is Jonathan O'Brien. Jonathan, you will have three minutes to address the council. Um, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Jonathan. Um, I live in Francis City, District 1, and I just want to mention that the airports are getting filled with niggers. So many fucking niggers. Please kill them all. Seriously. No more niggers in airports, all right? Make this a thing. Cut him off. Takes a second. I know. All Sorry. Right. Sorry. I apologize for that disruption. Next person is David Scott. You are being unmuted. You have three minutes to address the council. Yeah, I, I don't want people to spend money in the airport again unless we're deporting niggers and Mexicans. All right. All right, folks. Um, given the experience and the behavior of some of the public, we're going to go ahead and move on from public comment to council discussion on the matter. All right, um, let me start off with um, Council Vice President, Mr. Capriolio. Paul, would you like to address the Council, um, the City Airport Budget? Do you have any questions? There you are. Go ahead, Council Vice President. I, uh, thank you. Uh, my comments are uh, the usual, which are well deserved. And that is, that Kevin and his team are fantastic. Uh, they put our airport on the map. We're an international airport. We have so many good things going on out there, including our most recent improvements that the council approved. And uh, uh, Director Michael, Michael, please continue doing what you're doing, and their team uh, give them my best. Uh, Wishes and highest compliments for a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. All right. With that, we're going to go to council members. We'll go by district. Councilwoman Sawyer, do you have any questions for the staff on this budget? Thank you. Um, before uh, I move on to the questions, first of all, I think that it is important to note for the public that we all condemn those, you know, racist remarks. But I want to ask ISD. Is there any way that we can track who are these individuals, um, whatever they are? I just feel that not only are they extremely inappropriate, but if there's something that we can do, um, because I think last time when people came on, they said, um, we need to kill all the N. Um, and so I feel like those are threats and we should take that seriously. Um, you know, and go beyond just the fact that we're going to call out and condemn these type of statements. Um, so ISD um, and, uh, and our police department, can can we address that? Like, are uh, we able to check these individuals? ISD will, will respond to your question. 
Uh, Esmeralda, what we're doing is we're tracking IP addresses of everybody that's making a connection to these meetings. Uh, and we will make those available to the police department when we're done, as well as any information they may have entered like email address or names when they registered for the webinar. So there is some information that we will be able to provide to PD on those users, yes. Okay, and we did the same um, for last week? Uh, last week, I have to go back and look at the records because it was a different meeting. I'm not sure what information was captured, but on these meetings, the webinars, all of their IP information is being captured. Well, whatever information we did get from last time, I hope that we follow through with it and then that the council gets an update at whatever point is appropriate. I just I'll think be working with PD and I'll let you know what I find out. It is Thank very you. disturbing. Um, Thank you, Councilwoman. See. We'll refer to the IT and the police department and brief the council in closed session at the next uh, opportunity. Thank you. Um, then before I ask on the airports, on the line item budget that you guys are referring to, is that an updated, like reflecting the line items up to what we've spent? Or is it just the same line item from last year? Council members, sorry. Uh, uh, the line item that's available, again, on the website, it's as of uh, last year's version. Because we're submitting a continuing resolution, that is the basis of the resolution. Okay, even though the monies may have been spent differently or Possibly. there's additional dollars. Possibly. It doesn't reflect those changes throughout the year. Okay, um, just so the public knows, so it is last year's budget doesn't reflect kind of the changes that we've made in the last whatever months since we adopted the budget. Okay, thank you. Um, Kevin, um, thank you for providing the information and also providing the, the supplement on the COVID-19. Appreciate that, that was very informative for me. I did wanna ask in terms of the vacant positions, um, what positions are those that are vacant and how much of the um, money that we have yet to spend are um, salary savings? So we've got, let me just grab this in front of me here. Uh, 14 vacant positions. Um, some of these positions, well, let's step back a second. The uh, CARES Act dollars uh, plus the revenue we anticipate getting uh, throughout this fiscal year uh, will uh, cover our costs for the entire fiscal year, assuming all positions are open. Now, that said, we have a number, we have 14 vacancies some of those vacancies are um, more tied to activity level, meaning you know, how busy we are. And so we're proposing to keep a number of vacancies, eight or nine, I think it's eight, um, unfilled through at least until we get to a 50 to 60% uh, activity level. Uh, that'll further help us and give us an additional cushion. Uh, there are some positions, uh, about five or six that, uh, that are not tied to activity level, but tied to just uh, uh, FAA compliance, inspections, uh, safety, uh, airfield maintenance workers, or even if we have no flights, that, that work still occurs. So uh, we are proposing, we are working with the administration to hopefully get those filled uh, here in the near future. Um, but there's about eight positions, and that represents about 8% of our, um, uh, just under 8% of our total uh, positions to keep vacant, at least at this point in time. Did we have to lay off folks due to COVID? No, we don't anticipate laying anybody <laughs> off at all. In fact, um, one of the three major um, policies of the airport's COVID dollars is staff retention. So we're very, very uh, cognizant of that. Um, and. And so we, we, again, our budget is predicated on everything being filled. So not only do we not have to lay anybody off, we don't have to have any reduced hours, um, but, but we do know that we should keep a number of positions free and open because we just don't need them because we're not, we're not at the same activity level as we were last year. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, on the federal relief dollars that the airports re received, um, these dollars are not, um, don't have a short deadline to be spent like the general fund or the COVID-19 federal relief CARES Act money that we received as a city, the 92 million, right? 
Correct. They have a four-year uh, time frame. It's treated as an EIP FAA grant, and that's a four-year cycle. So um, we intend to use um, get $13 million, and we're proposing to use $3.2 million for uh, debt service, uh, $2 million to pay utilities, and $7.8 million for personnel costs through the course of fiscal year uh, 21. Um, so, so we're not using them this year, but we, we are plugging it in for the following couple years or three or four years that we can spend. Is that what we're doing? Kind of. So for fiscal 20, this current fiscal year, we are not proposing to use any CARES Act dollars. We had enough revenue generated through the, through the, you know, nine to 10 months of this year to be able to cover all of our costs without having to uh, use any CARES Act dollars. It's preserving the dollars for fiscal 21. So, so right now we're proposing to use all the dollars in fiscal 21. Now, if we don't need to, then some of that can be extended into fiscal 22 if, if necessary. Uh, right now, uh, the way the recovery is going with the aviation industry and the forecast that we've got, um, we don't anticipate at this point in time having an issue moving into fiscal 22 and 23 and beyond. Okay, so it seems like we're, we're in good shape there. Are any of the dollars that you guys um, received um, through either the CARES Act or because you don't have to tap into the other revenues that we do get, are we able to um, do some kind of workforce uh, program tailored to airports work. I know that in the past, you guys have um, successfully used the internship program and we've talked about how your guys' department has really taken advantage of some of those dollars that we put for our young people. Um, can you speak to that? So, um, I'm sorry, could you that? Briefly, one more time. I'm just wondering, um, with the investments that are coming in from the federal government to kind of keep our airports successful, is there any um, opportunity to do some kind of workforce, um, you know, type of program? I know that in the past, the airports has taken advantage um, of the you know, the internship, pro the paid internship program. I know that you guys, that's how you guys have hired a number of our young people after the fact. So I'm just wondering, given the fact that we got the Federal CARES Act for the airport and we've been doing reasonably or pretty well in terms of our revenues, is there a flexibility there to kind of expand on workforce um, within the air airports department to give people opportunities um, to to get a job. And I, I only bring that up because as, as we know, jobs is a big issue for the city of Fresno and our unemployment rate has um, has gone up. And so if there's an opportunity to, to create these job opportunities, I think that we should be looking at that. So the, the CARES Act dollars is treated as regular airport revenue. So, you know, whether it's CARES Act dollars or other revenue that we get, um, it's all treated the same. So with regard to meeting our needs uh, through um, the, uh, the uh, intern program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We will continue to do that as long as we have funds to do that with. So, so yeah, we, we, the bottom line is CARES Act dollars can be used for any purpose that we would normally use airport revenue for. So if we have a need um, later on this year for interns, um, that's possible. Like so, so. Um, you know, Kevin, I also think it's important to see where people are in playing for right now versus where they were last year because I don't want this false um, understanding that revenues are 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 status quo because they're not. Um, and even though they are improving, I think it's important for Kevin to talk to you about what riders we had, like for instance, let's say April as a benchmark. So, do you mind going into that a little bit? So yeah, so we, um, as, as everybody knows, we were on a record in the year after year records and uh, through mid-March, we were on that same pace. 
second half of March, uh, things dropped off immediately. They dropped off from, let's say, when you compare it to 2019 numbers, we, uh, let's look at the month of April. We ended up April at 7% of normal, okay? Uh, and then when you look at May, we are a little higher than that. Now we're closing in on 30% in June. So um, it'll, it'll take some while for us to get this recovery going, hence the need for the CARES Act dollars that Congress put in place. So uh, we are cautiously optimistic. Um, you know, the flexibility of the CARES Act dollars uh, means that fiscal 21, we're gonna be just perfectly okay. But we are watching every dollar we spend. We are suspending all cash funded capital work, meaning discretionary work that we may have thought we wanna do. Uh, we're suspending, again, cash funded, not projects that are all financing is already in place. Other projects are already underway, et cetera. Uh, yeah, we're moving forward with those. But, um, and, and again, the positions we want to keep open, we want to keep open to preserve every dollar we can possibly preserve. Because even though the forecast is looking, you know, pretty good, and again, from an airport perspective, when we get to a 70% level, um, we can function without any federal aid at all. Um, and we anticipate being at a 70% level, uh, perhaps as soon as this the holiday season. Um, so it's pointing in the right direction, but you never know what's going to happen, right? So, um, and again, when, when we talk in the context of airports and the ridership, it's based on airline bookings. It's based on the airline schedule. It's not, it's not so much as a guess to try and estimate what's happening down the road. They actually know who's buying tickets and how busy they're going to be. So, um, it's a, it's a little bit of a more of a known factor compared to probably other, other um, governmental entities throughout the country, but uh, still we're taking a very measured and cautious approach to uh, how we spend the money through this fiscal year. So if we don't use some of those dollars, do we still get to keep them? Or how does that work? You mean the CARES Act dollars? So if we don't use the full 13 million, it's a re we don't we don't actually have the 13 million. It's a reimbursable program. So so we may let's say we use 11 million throughout the course of fiscal 21. Two million are still there in the pot. So if if we need to use it in fiscal 22, we will. Uh, we don't anticipate that being the case, but um, but again, it's reimbursable only. So month by month, how much did we need to use? so forth. So it'll be a gradual use through the entire fiscal year. Underst understood. Okay, thank you. And then the last question, um, just on capital projects, uh, we underwent, you know, the big um, Fresno Airport's expansion program, the, the parking lot and the um, second terminal. How is that going? Um, has that been impacted um, by COVID-19? So no impact on COVID-19. The garage, the funding is already, the bonds are sold, the funding is already in place a year ago, as you recall. Um, and as you recall, back on December, I believe, 5th it was, uh, council awarded a contract phase one, which is the design and the pricing. Everything is uh, on or under, actually under budget because the pricing is coming out really, really well because of the, what we're in right now. Uh, people are anxious to get to work. Everything's complete. It's ready to go for construction. Um, if we if we were to start uh, here in late July, like the original schedule uh, asked for, that project will be finished in November of 21, about halfway through fiscal 22. Um, still about six months behind where we'll need it based on our forecasted uh, traffic, but it's not as bad as being almost three years behind when we needed that parking. Um, so zero impact to our finances, all of our uh, Financial plan incorporates the uh, the debt service for that, as well as the CARES Act dollars. Uh, again, it was put in place a year ago. On the terminal side, uh, we are well underway on design. Uh, TSA is engaged through a grant program. Uh, CBP, Customs Border Protection, is fully engaged. Um, the flexibility we have on the terminal side is that we have not yet secured financing, and we don't anticipate doing that at the earliest next year sometime. The advantage of being in that position is that if we need to wait a year, we can wait a year uh, because there's no obligation to move forward. Um, back to the garage side, 
uh, $22.5 million of economic development. Uh, 150 to 200 people will go to work. And the vast majority, I want to say 75 to 80 percent will be all local, just as we were tending to be with the PLA, um, PRA, I'm sorry. So um, everything remains on schedule, on time. And the one caveat again is on the terminal side where we have flexibility to say, you know, let's hold off one year, let's hold off six months. And so uh, we'll be monitoring that, that situation very closely. Perfect, thank you. Those are all my questions. Appreciate your time, Kevin. It looks like we have uh, council member Chavez next. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that brief uh, outline, uh, Kevin. Just a couple of questions. So with regards to the care dollars, you said it's a reimbursement opportunity, total amount $13 million. Um, and I saw the, I heard the breakdown that you mentioned um, with regards to what we're planning on doing that. Is there, is there opportunity to um, utilize some of those funds for the expansion that we're going through uh, regarding obviously complying with the social distance guidelines and some reconfiguration work or or is that something that's not been contemplated um, by your folks? So so there's actually two, two sources of CARES Act dollars available to the airports. One is the airport CARES Act dollars I just talked about. And the three primary policy goals that Congress established is that they want to keep airports reliable, safe, be able to serve the aviation industry. They want to maintain and keep airport credit ratings. And um, they want to keep airport workers employed. Those are the three policy goals that Congress established. And that's exactly what we're doing with the CARES Act dollars. Now, the other CARES Act dollars on the municipal side where the social distancing you know, labeling and signage and all kinds of things. We've been able to do a lot of that in-house work. So right now, we have 20 acres of farm. Solar farm generates 74% of the airport's entire region. So um, we have not yet to extend that. It's the point where you know, how much more the cost of is getting that, that last 10 to 15 percent. We certainly get that. Um, so, so, and we have the land to be able to do that. The um, staff director, um, 
was in the number of employees at the airport that have been out there. So, I have to break it down. about 20-25%, no less than that, actually, of field staff. Very few field staff uh, can telework if they've got to be there, the electricians and the maintenance folks. But at least on the office side, it's 75%, overall average of 50%. And then as, as we're looking at kind of dealing with this new reality of, of you know, COVID and, and the telework, I know that other cities have kind of came about the realization that it might be cost efficient to do some more telework um, models. Um, are, are we looking at that as far as the airport? No, um, we're looking at that citywide council member. And, and as we move forward after budget, we can come back and update you on how we're hoping to address that citywide. Okay, great. Thank you. Those are all my questions, President. Thank you. We have council member Sparza. Yes. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I think you've answered pretty much uh, almost all of my questions just sort of throughout these discussions here. Um, did want to uh, inquire, though, looking at your projected spending plan for uh, the coming fiscal year, uh, specific to the, the CARES Act dollars, the, the one specific to airports. Um, I mean, I, I assume, and this is the same concern that I brought up with Tim Arman uh, in talking about our our city's uh, dollars. Um, you know, does that account for the current circumstances, or would that be potentially spent differently if uh, circumstances change? So, um, is that what you're referring to, Council uh, Member? Like another round of COVID in the fall, or, or something around along those lines? Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, right now we have we have a pretty rosy projection, right? Of, of sort of a continued, uh, continued uh, increase uh, in in clients, right? For getting, getting on a plane, but um, if they go backwards for whatever reason, uh, would the just out of curiosity, right? If we see circumstances change, would that uh, result in a different spending plan for the, for the airport cares act dollars? So. Let me just play out a doomsday scenario for the airport. Let's assume for a moment that um, nobody's flying anymore for the next 10 months, right? I mean, like, we're not, we're not going to, we're now close to 30%. We're going to keep growing. But let's say that doesn't happen. Let's say it just stalls and it's like that's only 20% of normal for the entire year. The, co the, co the CARES Act dollars that the airport got can cover all airport expenses in that scenario meaning even at uh extremely low activity levels the COVID, the, the cares act dollars for airports will get us through the entire fiscal year with, without any any issue at all so so so, so the, the minimum threshold we would have to continue to see is an average of 20 percent throughout the fiscal year and let me tell you why so so um our bare bone minimum revenue stream that we need to have is 21 million okay and um, if you use all 13 million, that's a difference of now $8 million. Well, we receive $8 million just in fixed rents with zero airline activity, just fixed rents. So that's why we're very confident that we're gonna be able to navigate through this coming fiscal year without any issue at all. And that's what I was uh, referring to earlier when I said that we have a cushion. Okay, great, Kevin. Yeah, again, uh, appreciate that. That sounds, you know, good to me. Uh, you answered all my other questions again throughout the discussion about, you know, how you were pulling dollars and billing against our general uh, CARES Act fund uh, versus the airport and uh, about the capital uh, projects that we've been voting on here the last year and a half. Um, uh, Council President, I, I did want to uh, just take a second to, um, you know, as we're navigating the, uh, the landscape here with all of these disruptive uh, racist comments and the public comment. Um, you know, for folks like myself who have, you know, experienced racism our, our whole life, we, we, you know, we, it's tough to hear, but we kind of, we shrug it off and we, we move on and, and carry on with life. But, um, you know, maybe we can figure out a way to 
I don't know, better screen these folks. In the council chamber, we would usually have folks announce their name uh, and their address before they, they speak to us. Uh, now, because of Councilmember Soria's line of questioning, we know that we're checking IP addresses. So, um, you know, obviously that's uh, kind of left to somewhat to your discretion, but I gave you my input as I'd like to continue to see people uh, allowed to, to weigh in on whether it's airports or police or fire um, uh, with, our IT folks ready to kick anybody off who is disruptive. Thank you. All right, Council Member Bradfield, I believe. <clears throat> Kevin, uh, I, I think you do a great job at the airport. I think we all probably feel that way. Uh, have you seen an increase um, in people flying over the last month, or where where are things at with that? I would say. Uh, the Labor Day, excuse me, the Memorial Day weekend, we just saw an immediate uh, shift, partly because of news of things starting to open up. Um, you know, we hit June 11th, we hit 29% down from 7% in April. So, um, and uh, the airlines are all ramping up. So I would say from Memorial Day weekend, it's been a steady increase. And people are, I mean, it's people are not afraid to get out there. We got good social distancing in the airport. People are wearing masks. People are flying. Um, you know, uh, the the, uh, the Mexico flights are full. Um, initially, Valeris came back with two a week, and it's, and immediately before they even started, they went to four a week. I got a call from Aero Mexico last week. They're back to 100% starting July one. Um, Delta has been great. They're moving back to the three a day from two a day. Uh, of course, you heard the news about Alaska. So all the airlines are uh, full steam ahead in reaction to the bookings that they're seeing, both coming into our area as well as going out. So uh, everything is heading in the right direction. Doesn't mean that there could be some dip because something happens later, but um, we are we're ready for them. Um, and it's good to see uh, people moving around and not afraid to get out and, and uh, you know, live their lives. Okay. Are they all? Are they all the airlines uh, requiring masks on the on their flights? They're requiring masks. Yes, and they do special cleaning every single time the plane is empty. Um, and they're really. I mean, I will tell you this. So airports, not just us, but all airports, are working very closely with all the airlines to really put out positive messaging to build up confidence that it's okay to fly. We've got measures in place both at the airport as well as on the aircraft. And so the airlines have just fantastic to work with. If somebody comes into the terminal, I don't have a mask with them. The airlines uh, will give them a mask. If they don't have one available, we as an airport will give them a mask. So nobody will, uh, there won't be any need for masks. Uh, strongly encouraged to wear them, social distancing. So um, everything really is heading in the right direction. Okay. Um Thank you, Kevin. And, and I want to echo uh, what, what Esmeralda said in terms of finding uh, the IP addresses for uh, these folks. I mean, th these folks are cowards, basically. I mean, they have a uh, Zoom, they can be anonymous. Um, and I, I, again, I want to encourage uh, the, the council and uh, city manager, let's open up uh, this building, let's get back in the chamber because these cowards will not come forward before the council and speak. They do it anonymously behind Zoom. Um, so I, I hope one that we can track them. Um, I hope we can uh, uh, identify who they are because they're basically on keyboards anonymously uh, spewing this uh, racist uh, bile. So um, hopefully we can do that. And I look forward to getting back to the council uh, chamber uh, so the people can come, people who really want to talk about what's happening uh, in our community and what we're doing as a council uh, can address us rather than Zoom. Zoom is fine, but it's clearly uh, not uh, meeting in person with your elected leaders and addressing the concerns. But these these are cowards, basically, who hide behind Zoom. And uh, like uh, Esmeralda said, I hope we can uh, track them and identify them. Thank you. And uh, Council uh, Member Bredefeld, I wanted to let you know our target date to open Council Chambers is the 25th of June. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Great. You're welcome. Yeah, and, I, and I appreciate that, Council Member Bredefield. But I mean, even after we open the chambers, I mean, I think there will continue to be a problem because we'll have a, a segment of the limited folks who can be in the chambers with us. Um, 
and we'll have to continue to allow for this. So, I mean, it's, it's something that I think we long-term have to address, but I appreciate your comments. Sure. Thank you. All right, council, let's get back on the budget of the airport. We have council uh, vice president Caprolio. Um, would you like to speak? Yes, your hands up. Uh, I just wanted to add to Kevin's comments that, uh, and to answer a little bit of uh, member Soria's questions on the PLA, that I, the subcommittee that I chaired, we addressed uh, apprenticeships and interns and local hires in particular. So we've been across the board pretty well uh, supporting our local economy, our local community, our local workforce. And uh, Kevin's made sure that we follow through with that. And we're on a great path. Uh, to completion of the airport and again local 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 so uh, hats off to you again Kevin fantastic job uh, keep up the good work let me know if you need anything uh, from the council thank you all right that's all the comments from council um, I will go with my questions um, Kevin um, what modifications have you made to the airport under the COVID pandemic I haven't been to the airport since the COVID began what exact modifications have you made and have you paid for those modifications through the COVID funds? So to answer the latter question, yes, uh, we we have been or in the process of being reimbursed through the COVID funds for the modifications. But so we have uh, social distancing uh, signage and stickers uh, throughout in the queuing areas and the ticket lobby. We have them up at the gate areas. Uh, you know, the long uh, walkway to get back to the gates we put uh, space stanchions up to, to direct people going one direction on one side, another direction going the other way. Same thing as you go over into baggage claim. Uh, we've done that. Um, uh, strongly recommend, of course, masks. We've talked about that. Uh, a lot of signage um, in the, um, the Federal Inspection Station for the international arrivals from Guadalajara and that region of Mexico. Uh, same thing, but social distance inside the facility. We've got a uh, special tape on the signage all the way through from the time you go in the door until you um, get into where the baggage claim area is and the processing. Um, over 100 seize guards uh, throughout the facility. We've got over 100 counters that we've dealt with. So we actually bought the bulk material and fabricated them ourselves. Um, and then uh, back on the international side, one of the things that we're doing, because what we want to do is people off the plane quickly. They've been sitting on a plane that's a small tube flying through the sky for, you know, three, four hours. And so to keep the social distancing intact, once they come off the plane, um, we've set up queuing actually outside the federal inspection station. And, and, and fortunately, there are, there are night flights and people wait outside anyway, but not as long as they do now. And so uh, as winter approaches, we're looking at putting up uh, some tents, some uh, that you've seen like in parking lot sales. Uh, so that we can keep them uh, out of the weather um, and to be prepared for the winter time, because who knows how long this is going to be with us. So those are a number of the measures. And of course, we're working with the airlines with their messaging as well, too, and all of our uh, LCD screens in, in the terminal. So, um, and we're finding really, really good cooperation. People are distancing. Um, we're experimenting with the main doors in and out only. It's a little tough because you still get some cross traffic. So we're kind of playing with that. It looks like it's working well in the baggage claim area, but in the main ticket lobby, it's almost maybe creating uh, too much crowds by having a dedicated in and out. So we're just kind of playing with that still, but we're really looking at this from a holistic standpoint. Um, and so hopefully that answered your question, but um, the, the point is it's, it's, always evolving. Um, Kevin, um, given that it's an international airport, is all the signage and directions in multiple languages? Yes, Spanish and actually both in the international facility as well as throughout the regular terminal facility, it's all Spanish and English. And just those two languages? Yes. You know, one of the things is uh, we use a lot of visuals on our, on, our, on our distancing signage and visuals really is what people pick up on and what people people see and use. And we do visuals in a way that it's very, very intuitive. There's still language on the sign and it is those two languages. Uh, you can't really fit much more on these signs, but really we focus on these visuals. And then my last question is, um, you broke down the CARES Act money that you plan to spend. Where, where can I find that information? Because I, I have not seen it in writing anywhere.
bear with us for one minute because somebody's playing with the computer buttons that knows way more than I do. Oh, you had that up. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, what this is, this is just a one pager identifying the two different, in an air, the airport world, two different CARES Act funds for airport. The top section you see there is. Um, um, My question, Kevin, is where can I find this information and where can the public find it? It was sent to them. It was emailed on Friday. On Friday to the to city clerk office. to the city clerk's office. So it was on record with the city clerk's office. It went out on Friday. All right, good deal. Can you make sure that that's posted on your website and on the budget website? We're trying to make this information. I know it's given to us last minute, but we want to make sure the public clearly understands. And city manager, the the um, line item detail information that you referenced on the finance website. I went on it just now, and it just has the police department. Um, breakdown, no other department breakdown. So if we're gonna, if we're, we we're can, gonna check. I believe you all asked last week to pull out the police department line yeah. item, which we've done, and I'll, we'll make sure that the other one is on there too, if it's not. Oh, it have, it, Henry is telling me that it is on there. So we'll send you all the link. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, those are all my questions, Kevin. Thank you for your um, time and your presentation. All right, thank you. All right, city manager, before we go on to the next department, which is facts, um, we're gonna, we've been asked to allow the police department to test their Zoom um, video conferencing really quick um, to make sure that we have enough time to fix any technicalities on their end or ours. So can, uh, Gavin, can we get the police department? Yeah, um, we're working Steve? on it now. Just give us a two minute break, council. the moment so um, I'm hoping you guys get a passing grade here all right chief, chief I think you chief. are uh, on audio can you test it I can hear you All right, Chief. Um, uh, oh. okay. All right, Chief. Um, it looks like we got your some of your audio and feedback. Uh, what we're going to do is move on with the FACS transportation budget. And then after that, we'll take a 15 minute break before we hear the fire budget and make sure you guys are all squared away from your end. That sound good? All right, guys. Thank you. All right, Mr. Barfield, you have the floor with the fax transportation budget. And Council, we are officially back online with the budget presentation of our fax department. For the 500 plus employees of the transportation department which includes facts, municipal fleet, and public safety fleet. Uh, we will begin with- uh, Mr. Barfield, can I interrupt you for a second? Can you just start over? You um, got on audio a little late, so. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, again, on behalf of the 500 uh, members of our staff in both transportation, municipal fleet, and public safety fleet, I'm honored to be here today. We will start with uh, the facts budget. Um, as you know, FACS operates 17 fixed routes and a paratransit comp a complementary paratransit service. Uh, we uh, maintain the services of both buses, uh, both in revenue and non revenue vehicles. And of course, the uh, administration of all of our grants uh, and programming and services, as you see on the screen. And when I want to, want to advance, I go to plus. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, here is our fax budget um, as of May 30th. And again, this is all uh, federal funding. There's no general funds involved. Um, and at the bottom, you'll see um, our uh, capital uh, projects for fax. Moving on to Moving on to our uh, municipal service fleet, 
Um, we service the 2,300 vehicles of the city's fleet, uh, from everything from backhoes uh, to uh, large scale tractors, uh, trailers that uh, carry um, say like the spreaders or uh, heavy equipment for uh, both public utilities and public works. Uh, that department or that division also um, provides all the maintenance, uh, buys all the parts, and in, in addition, uh, will purchase the vehicles on behalf of that city's uh, department. As you can see below um, is the actual, oops, is the actual uh, budget for that particular um, group. Again, they derive their funds um, as an internal service fund. So we build a department for the, whose work we are doing. And then finally, uh, we will come to the CARES, yes, the special budget. All right. And then most importantly, you probably want to know about our CARES funding. Um, our CARES funding um, is $32.4 million. Um, just like Kevin in FAA, um, this is all reimbursable. We have yet to do a drawdown. Our goal is, to, uh, and it's retro to January 20th of this particular year. Um, it is our goal to, um, in July, once the June books close, is to uh, do a drawdown uh, um, and allow us at 100% um, uh, to recover all of our costs from July, tw uh, January 20th uh, to June 30th for anything COVID related. Um, that includes operating and all of the work that we've done to keep our buses clean every night, the extra staff we brought on, and the sanitizing we do throughout the day. That's further broken down. And then that's our um, anticipated revenue, shows our passenger uh, fares, which um, at the time of the slide, uh, we were seeing a 57% reduction in passengers, 6% reduction in Measure C and a uh, 6% reduction or more in state uh, TA funds. State budget, as you know, is scheduled to be voted on tonight. Um, and we expect that between TDA, SDA, uh, and some of our other uh, funds that we receive from the state uh, up to uh, possibly a 15% cut overall. Again, CARES, um, is retro back to uh, January 10th. There's no time frame, uh, uh, January 20th. There's no time frame for us on that. Uh, and again, it is our um, desire to um, go 100% um, once we do our drawdown uh, and the books close in June. With that, I will pause and uh, be prepared for any questions. Thank you. Um, we're gonna start off with um, our council vice president uh, Paul, do you have any questions for our fact department? No, I'll save them for September. Thank you, Paul. All right, now council members, is there any questions uh, for, we see council member Sparza, you have the floor. Hey, good morning, Greg. Good morning. So, you know, uh, you know, if you and I are in the same room or virtual room, you know, I got to harass you about the uh, Manchester Transit Center. Yeah, absolutely. That absolutely. is. And if there's any, any impacts or anything has changed? No, there's been a lot of changes. So uh, we finished, there are four uh, minor bid projects. Two of them are um, wrapping up. Um, this week, we're trying to figure out what epoxy will go onto the stone walls uh, for the bench seating. Um, and then we'll be able to um, also um, do the uh, planter boxes. Um, the goal is to pull all the dirt out, let the, the uh, company get in there, um, we'll, uh, make it waterproof, and then put the dirt back and then replant everything. So we're getting much closer uh, to being back home at Manchester Center. Great, great. And then um, has the, what, what is, you remind me what the projected completion uh, timeline is, and if there have been any delays because of the current circumstances? Um, the only delay uh, to, to COVID is one of our contractors is, uh, was also the contractor uh, that was responsible for cleaning the um, cruise ship in the Bay Area. Um, but we were able to do other work around that. So, um, and we're looking at 60 days. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Mayor Chavez, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, Greg, quick question. So, 
we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with regards to approaching the county about helping with some of the costs. Um, did, did we do some outreach and what was the response if we did? So we actually, uh, my team, um, as I had said, um, has gone out, done their preliminary uh, work, found a cost, um, and now we are presenting that to the county. So look forward to a trade memo very shortly. And then I know we're, we're looking at reconfiguring or, or analyzing our, our bus routes. Um, where are we at with conversations with regards to the school district um, with their new campuses that they're building, um, State Center Community College with Southwest, Southeast Campus, and then obviously um, having bus service out to the distribution centers. Um, what's the status of, of looking at that? So let's start with State Center because we just spoke to them over uh, on Friday. Um, we we're in conversations with State Center because uh, for the fall semester, they will not have any on-campus classes except for labs. Um, and so we're talking to them right now about what that amount looks like, what that number looks like, and then how, if, if needed, how we could uh, assist in servicing them. Um, the difficulty of downsides to that is um, each bus is only limited to 10 passengers at a time uh, right now for social spacing um, uh, reasons. And so we're having a difficult time, particularly along Route 1, uh, continuing to uh, move people accordingly. Um, as far as Fresno Unified, we are uh, um, in their, their, um, uh, their new site. We are uh, more waiting for them to figure out if they're even coming back in the fall. Um, before we dive into that dialogue. We've kind of been pushed to the back. Um, and then State Center, we already operate uh, Route 38, Route 34, um, and Route 32, and Route 28 that all serve that general neighborhood. Um, and so um, we're good for the new State Center campus. Honing in on the, the Southeast campus, uh, as you know, it's over on Jensen and Willow area. Have, have there been any conversations with State Center with regards to what that uh, would look like? No, not yet. Um, our goal was really to, to figure out, pre-COVID, was to figure out where we were um, in the um, series of route changes that we were, we were facing, and then move on to the next uh, conversation, which would have been that. And then immediately after that, we uh, have experienced COVID. So right now, we've just been trying to hang on. And then one of the things I want to put on your radar with regards to bus service and, and the need, um, and you know, we, you're familiar with this over in the, in the Southeast part where we had a lot of the new developments um, come up. We're, we're growing and we're gonna keep growing. Um, I, I would encourage you to reach out to also um, Sanger Unified. Um, they're building that huge mega campus on Jensen um, and, and Fowler Armstrong area. And, and just kind of using that also as the linchpin for that neighborhood. There, there are a lot of folks that live out there that don't have access to bus service. And, and I understand that the need needs to be there, um, but I think a conversation with Sanger and, the, and then what their future growth plans look like would be helpful um, for facts. Um, and, and you know, we'd love to, in my office, facilitate some of those conversations for some of the residents that live out there. I've kept a little quick tally sheet on what that looks like. So we'll, we'll send you that information over to um, Greg. Oh, appreciate that very much. And again, the planning staff, that was their next directive, uh, but then we, we have gone into COVID. Um, and so that has all kind of been put on hold. Yep, just want to keep it on your radar. It's there, <laughs> Council Member. I got you. Thank you. All right, those are my questions, President. Thank you, Council Ms. Oria. Thank you, Council President. Uh, so a couple questions, but Greg, thank you for the information, appreciate that. Um, on some of the, the vacancies, I think, that are noted in, in the municipal fleet and then also in the facts, what, what kind of positions are the ones that are being vacant and are they being vacant for long periods of time or because it's together, it's 89 positions? So in facts, um, which has a separate funding source, the federal side, is primarily bus drivers, uh, and uh, bus mechanics. And so right before the hiring freeze, uh, we were uh, working to underfill the bus camp mechanic ones with uh, what we call equipment service worker twos. Um, pretty much uh, as a training program, we, we found great success. 
with hiring uh, those individuals, getting their, their beginning ASC certifications, and then moving them up to bus mechanics. And of course, bus drivers is always a continuous uh, hiring uh, that we will do. So uh, we are working with uh, the uh, personnel department uh, con uh, asking for a waiver because we continue to need those, those two positions. Um, when it comes to the um, public safety and the municipal fleet, um, those um, are mostly on hold because of, those are ISF positions. So it really depends on what happens with the general fund and our customers in the general fund as to whether we should fill those positions or not. If we're not repairing as many vehicles, we may not need as much staff um, in this first quarter or two. So we're holding on to those uh, until we figure out where people land. What are ISF positions? Uh, they're internal service funded positions. Oh, okay. So that means that um, our customers say um, your, your office um, may have a vehicle. Um, and when you bring that vehicle in for tune up, uh, we charge you uh, out of your general fund budget uh, for uh, the reimbursement of those costs uh, of fixing your vehicle. So the positions that are vacant there are mostly ma maintenance people or? Yes, uh, equipment service workers, laborers, um, and there are a couple of mechanics. Um, and so 59 seems a pretty, like a pretty high number. Um, is that pretty consistent? Or is it just attrition? What is what is the vacancy rate have to so do with? It is, it is pretty consistent. Uh, there's also um, a little um, competition between our three fleets. So uh, with fax, um, they love to rob from municipal. Municipal likes to take from fax and public safety likes to take from both of them. Um, uh, the, 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 the pay um, and the work uh, is, is rewarding in all three uh, of the divisions. Uh, but um, sometimes you find a good worker right next to you uh, in the next shop. So, um, what are we doing so that we're expanding beyond just stealing each other's employees? <laughs> so, uh, beyond the competition, uh, we actually have um, with Fresno Unified. We we have a cooperative agreement with them um, uh, to do uh, to do some training uh, where we bring folks in. Most of that training happens in the springtime, so none of it happened this year. Um, and then, of course, um, our relationship with Fresno City College keeps us active in uh, trying to reach out to them. But look, uh, a, a bus mechanic uh, or a, me a heavy duty mechanic is um, in or mechanic in general is in great uh, demand. So we're competing with uh, the future Fords and uh, the Toyota dealerships and the BMW dealerships for for this, too. Uh, so uh, we, we will continue to, to, to be aggressive. Uh, in our recruitment. Are our salary packages competitive? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, okay. Um, I'm just trying to think, you know, as we move forward and given that the, a lot of the funds here are not impacted by general fund, mm -hmm. how do we maximize the opportunity to hire folks that are going to be impacted by the recession and especially when we're talking about, I'm gonna be interested in seeing the makeup of our workforce. Um, because as we've heard from the African-American community and um, even other ethnic minorities in terms of the disinvestments and um, what we've done, how can we improve and create a better pipeline um, to make sure that folks have an opportunity for these jobs. And these are, you know, I think pretty decently paid jobs with a pension and health care. And so our communities, um, you know, should have the opportunity to, to um, compete for these jobs. And so um, I'm interested in seeing kind of, and maybe sitting offline um, director to figure out what is it that we can do to create a, a better pipeline um, so that we're expanding rather than just competing amongst our departments in shuffling people around. I'd like to figure out how we increase that opportunity for, especially for those that live in, you know, um, 93706. I know that I don't represent, but a lot of folks, um, there's a huge unemployment rate in, in that zip code. So how are we targeting is, is the training and the outreach really um, trickling down to the community um, to really get those folks um, ready and prepared to be able to get those jobs. 
Well, I will say one thing. We, we have secured a one and a half million dollar grant um, that we are the fiscal agent for, for the State Center Community College District and Proterra, uh, which is the electric bus manufacturer. Uh, Proterra will actually do training there. So as we move, and that's on the, on the agenda for Thursday, as we move from near zero emissions to zero emissions in the next 20 years, we need to retrain the workforce uh, to be able to work on electric buses and hydrogen buses uh, or hydrogen cars and, uh, and electric cars. Um, so we are actually creating a training center uh, using Proterra um, as the trainers uh, with State Center at, at the Southwest Fresno campus. Perfect, that's awesome. That's great to, to hear. I, I would like to just uh, chime in on the uh, exchange of staff among the divisions. And there are really two things that happen there. One is a person may come in as an entry level employee and um, there is a promotion in another division. And so they have the opportunity to move, which I think is a good thing, but that creates a new entry level position vacancy. Uh, the second thing is really just a dynamic related to shifts. And so uh, Fax runs three shifts, including a graveyard shift. Fleet, municipal fleet runs two, uh, and public safety, I believe, is running two with a small skeleton sh uh, crew on swing. So what happens oftentimes is uh, people uh, uh, get into a position uh, to get into the city, uh, which graveyard is often the le least desirable. They hire in there and then they, they tend to, when a position opens up on a better ship, move. So that's what the exchange is, is really about. Um, getting qualified people in the front end is the challenging part. Um, but as Greg mentioned, as we bring people in at entry level um, and, and train them within, then, then we see that movement upward and over into different divisions. So uh, I think Greg's on the right track in that we're, we're really trying to work with the community colleges uh, to get more people in on the front end. That's great. Thank, thank you for that explanation. Have we thought about, um, given that the, the less desirable shift is the graveyard shift, what we do to incentivize folks? Um, maybe they, give they some- They do have a shift differential, mm -hmm. but we, we might review and w see whether that, that is enough. Yeah, well, it seems to be an issue, so I would I would recommend that it does get reviewed, um, and that if we want to make it more competitive, so people want to do the graveyard shift, um, that we do that, so that we are you know attracting folks um, to do that work. So I would I would advise um, to do that. A um, couple other questions that I have um, on the public safety fleet. What's the role? Um, can you guys talk about that? Yeah, so public, the public safety fleet is responsible for uh, both our police vehicles, both marked and unmarked, uh, and all of our fire apparatuses uh, and their vehicles. Um, their role is to uh, purchase, uh, to service, uh, and to, um, at the end of their life, uh, take them apart and uh, sell them at auction, um, which turns out to be about a thousand bucks a piece, uh, maybe a little bit more. Um, but uh, that is what public safety uh, fleet does. Okay, perfect. Um, have some questions on the handy ride. Um, so we have a number of our constituents that have been reporting on the handy ride cap um, capacity. And um, we are being told, I don't know if this is true, that they're no longer accepting standing appointments. Um, maybe you can clarify that. Um, and also, I think that we've asked, and maybe you guys have said that there are limits on those that are enforced by the FTA. So just trying to figure out, especially right now with COVID and how people may feel um, less inclined to use the, you know, a, a bus if they can't um, get a ride through Handy Ride. Um, have we had any conversations of um, expanding and using some of those Federal Care Act dollars to be able to expand um, accessibility to folks that um, could use Handy Ride during this time? Well, so for example, Handy Ride 
just like we are, are operating at full capacity with the exception of they have, um, because of furloughs uh, with the federal government, they have cut out their late night service uh, because those riders were working at the IRS. Um, but they um, are seeing um, a 70% drop in ridership. They are limited to three riders uh, per bus. Uh, of course, you know, all of our, our riders must wear masks uh, along with the driver, but there is capacity there. So if people wanted uh, to ride on Handy Ride, all they've got to do is make their reservations the day before, uh, and they probably will have the vehicle to themselves. Okay. Okay, well, we'll make sure that we're letting our folks that are calling us in. Um, um, okay, and then I wanted to get an update on the our program that we had with um, Fresno City College. Remember the bus, yeah. the bus pass? I know the last conversations people were kind of, it was, there were some communication stuff, some, you know, think if you can give us an update on where we're at um, moving forward. So our, our first conversation uh, and our only since the council item uh, was Friday. Uh, we, we did have a conversation uh, where we believe that um, based on um, the information we asked State Center, if it's reasonable, we will figure out a way to help carry those passengers uh, to both City College and to Clovis Community. Um, again, the difficulty is we are limited to 10 riders per bus. Um, and with our numbers going up, um, I am reluctant, um, as some of our other counterparts have begun to start doing, to go to 15 passengers per bus. Um, until our numbers in this county can start to come down, we will stay at 10 passengers mm -hmm. on fixed and three on hand. What about, but I'm talking about the, our bus, the bus pass program where uh, they were buying passes from us or whatnot at a discount rate, but we had a cap that essentially charged them without, it was no discount at the cap fee, at, at the cap that we right. had. So I'm just trying to figure out, um, cause I think we had given direction to go and negotiate something that where we would be supporting, um, and encouraging the the students to get these passes and the university to be able to afford it so that we are getting more students on the buses and off the, their cars or also just encouraging folks to ride the bus to go to school because we know that some folks don't have transportation so if they don't have, have transportation even through the bus because they can't afford it they will opt to not go to school so um, where are we at with that so because both State Center, Fresno State, and uh, Clovis Community have all going to do online classes, mm -hmm. the only um, population that we're talking about right now are those students, primarily in allied health, who have to physically come to the campus. And so our conversation on Friday was, how many sections, how many people is your population? Fresno State has suspended their program indefinitely, and we understand why. Um, and so with State Center, it's uh, on them now to get us back that information. And then we'll figure out how we can come up with a, a, a solution in order to provide access to those people who need to physically come to the campus, uh, a way to get there. Okay. Um, beyond this next semester, because I know that, you know, in our bureaucracy, sometimes it takes months and months to find an agreement. And so while I recognize that this next fall semester, we're gonna be predominantly online, um, it is my desire that we really start getting serious about having a conversation come, you know, before, way before January. So the students know, um, are they gonna be able to get a bus pass so that once they're, once the, you know, the college says, hey, we're, we're going, coming back in person teaching, that we're ready and that we're not scrambling last minute. Uh, at least that's my desire from the, the city, from you know our perspective. I will also talk to you know some of the trustees and president, but I'd like you guys to kind of start that process now because I know that it may take a few months. Yeah, so our commitment at the end of the call was um, that we were going to look at the current contract, uh, begin to uh, resharpen our pencil uh, my only concern is the money that we would normally use to help with a program like this uh, would be state and local. 
um, and we're losing a lot of that state, state and local funds. So I may not have the flexibility, but we are beginning that dialogue um, and we committed to uh, sometime in September to begin that conversation in earnest. Um, what, are the, what are those state and local funds and how can we work with uh, our state reps to see how we can? So th that state money would be, um, which, is, which I explained is part of the budget uh, in that one slide, what we expect to be a possibly 15% reduction in our state funds. It's SDA, it's TDA, STD, um, uh, state of good repair, um, and what we call uh, uh, LCTOP, low carbon, um, uh, low carbon program. Those ones that will are going to be severely impacted. Uh, and um, we have negotiated uh, to, uh, to the, the ends of the earth uh, through the California Transit Association, um, pleading with the governor and the legislature to not touch that, that money, uh, but they will be making that cut today. And then locally it's measure C, um, and that's really gonna be about how much gas we sold. You don't sell a lot of gas, we're not gonna see a lot of revenue out of measure C. Um, and as I indicated earlier in, in my presentation, it's 6% already um, that we're seeing less. And that's only going to get worse as the year goes on. Yeah, and on the Measure C issue, we know that Measure C is right now a, a topic of conversation in terms of um, going out to the taxpayers again. I think that we need to make sure that um, not only that we advocate that we get what we've been getting, but actually increase if we're gonna get serious about increase the access of public transit um, to our community and to make sure that if it's a priority for us to educate folks um, within the city of Fresno, that we find the mechanism to be able to provide um, affordable, an affordable way to get there. Um, that is through, you know, these bus, pa bus pass programs that we've done in the past. So I think that we have to be able to leverage the fact that, you know, we are, our population pays, you know, at least 50% of those dollars that go into Measure C. So therefore we should be getting um, a significant share to address the needs that we have. Well, you'll be happy to know that both Scott Moser and I are on that working committee um, and we are mm -hmm. uh, supposed to begin meetings uh, in late July, early August. Um, with the um, uh, FCTRA. So um, we will be at the table and we will make sure that uh, we advocate very strongly for our city. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, two more questions, one on the Wi-Fi. Um, what's the status on the Wi-Fi of the buses? I know that this has been an issue for some time. Um, the young people have been pushing for it for a while. Can you give us a status? For the public. I thought that was going to be your first question. <laughs> Off the bat. My second to last question. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Wi-Fi. So what we did was uh, we began to study uh, uh, what Wi-Fi would look like if we did it internally. Um, and then ISD approached us and said, let's test that. Um, and so over the fall, they did test that. They found that there were some security issues. Uh, and so now we've gone out to a third party vendor uh, uh, we've got an RFP on the street and we're looking for a third party vendor to, for them to bring e equipment on versus us using ours and being that security risk. Okay. And have we had any conversations with, um, Bitwise? Um, it was, I know that there is a couple of us that met with them and there was a, a strong interest, um, in them, um, entering into a partnership with the city. I think given the fact of the investments that they've done and what they've grown, I think in my perspective, this seemed like a, uh, a great potential partnership. I know that they wanted to be able to uh, maybe work on, on the Wi-Fi. And I think one of the tra trade-offs or one of the things that they had said, they would help offset the cost for these bus passes for the college kids. Um, so just wondering um, where, if those conversations happened, um, did we have to go to RFP versus um, working directly with some of the folks that are, you know how sometimes we just enter into agreement because they have the ex that knowledge and expertise, I forget what it's called, but those specific. Um, so, so in this case, um, Bitwise never came to us, they went to you all. 
uh, and to the trustees. But Bidwise had come to us two years earlier about an app. And that's what they wanted to create. That's the trade off for State Center. Well, we actually created my uh, fax bus app here locally within the city uh, structure. And um, literally uh, two weeks before COVID, we were uh, in the testing phase uh, to, to, to release it in March. Uh, so it's, that's on hold um, because uh, ISD has been extremely busy trying to get all the Zoom technology and get you all looking nice uh, every day. Uh, but we already have that technology uh, from a programmer who actually came from Bitwise and now, and now works full time for the city. Uh, and we did that at far less cost than Bitwise um, had asked for. And so when, when will we start testing it? Um, as soon as uh, ISD has promised that they are almost back to being able to focus on ISD projects, meaning the rest of us. Um, now that they've got everyone working remotely and Zoom and everything else. So I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks we can do our, finish our internal testing. It's just with our staff that has to test it. And, um, and is, is they gonna test the, is it gonna show the bus like, um, like live or wherever, wherever the bus is or whatnot so people know? So back in February of 2018 when we uh, launched BRT, we also launched my fax bus app. So it already shows you that um, this one, the version two, uh, two and a half years later now, will be more um, user friendly uh, and have more of that, um, uh, how many steps it takes to get to here to there, um, first and last mile uh, options, those kinds of things are more included in this. And it's a much faster app. Have we talked, have we thought about using some of the folks that actually use um, the bus, like maybe some of the young people or our seniors to try to ha have them test it out too during this period of time? They actually are part of our smart card testing. So as we begin to roll out smart cards, we plan to give students and seniors and regular riders uh, the ability to test out our smart cards. Most of the feedback in the update of my fax bus app, uh, which has over 12,000 downloads, um, happen to come from our users. And so that's why we made these upgrades. Okay, okay, perfect. And then um, the last thing, the census is a big issue that is still looming before us. Um, there's been a, a extension um, to it. And I know that you may be asking, well, why are you asking me about this? Um, oh, just in, term, in terms of ad space, are we doing any census ads on our buses so that we're promoting, making sure people are filling, filling it out? No, um, we were originally, we were approached very early on, but never had any follow up, um, probably more so due to COVID, uh, because that followed that uh, er initial outreach was from a former city staffer and that was like the first week in March. So is there any way that we can do just like some ads um, sponsored by us that say are essentially promoting folks to fill out the census and I bring this up because if it were not for the fact that we, we in the 10 years ago, we counted over half a million people, we wouldn't have got the 92 million, we wouldn't have gone the 100 whatever plus million for facts. And so I just wanna make sure that folks uh, are aware um, that that's still happening and that where they can go to fill it out um, so that we get a more accurate count. Um, the 93706 right now is the zip code that is lag lagging behind. And so I know that many of them ride our buses. So I think if we're putting that information in front of their face, hopefully it's a reminder to them and it's a reminder to the other populace that um, the census needs, needs to be filled out. Can we do that? Yeah, well, we can follow up with Lamar who handles our, um, our, our um, both our wraps, but also our internal, uh, in each bus, there are channel sets um, on the bus, and we can see if uh, through the PSA program that they have, if uh, this is eligible. Perfect. Yeah, I'd love to follow up with you on that. Thank okay. you, Director. For the ridership itself, um, the internal uh, advertisement that Greg uh, mentioned would probably be a good way to do it because they, they see it every time they get in the bus. 
was the stuff that we were going to pay. Thank you. Council Mayor, are you done? Yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Great. Council Mayor Carbasi, you have the floor. Thank you, Director, for your time. I really do appreciate it. Oh, thank you, sir. Um, sure. So, um, I, can you provide a brief description of the Herndon Crosstown? It's a new fixed route uh, that's really important to my district. Yeah, so um, when we came to council um, several weeks ago, we talked about uh, Route 28 going to the new Department of Social Services. That would be the first one we would do. Um, we would do what we call an interline of uh, Route 12 and then 35, really making it one route. Um, and when it gets to a certain point, it just changes head signs. Um, and then the Crosstown uh, uh, 3, the Herndon route, um, those are still planned. Um, however, they may not occur in the fall. Uh, it may be more like January or early next year. Uh, again, we have to figure out what our funding looks like uh, to sustain those routes long term. And that's the one that, that has additional costs. Yeah, so can you explain to folks how far it's going to extend uh, down Herndon, at so least it west? Will go, it will go from El Paseo on one side all the way to Peach on the other side serving um, all of those medical facilities along mm -hmm. Herndon um, and businesses. Um, and we're very excited about that. And then the other yeah, route, <laughs> go ahead, please. You are. the other route that we're looking at is taking Route 20 and extending it through um, Highway City up to the back of El Paseo. So it will connect um, west of 99 with uh, the El Paseo and also make connections to the route. And that's really important. You talked about the medical offices, um, but people may not understand, and this is something I, I, I've learned over the years, is our, our paratransport support for folks that, um, you know, be disabled, uh, that, that's tied to our fixed route system for federal funding. Is that right? Well, yeah, the way it is, is that we have to have a combination of paratransit service. So, so that service has to be uh, up to three, three four miles away from the fixed route. So adding route we basically open up additional um, territories that will be serviced by air transit. Great. Okay. So that's, again, uh, I do appreciate that. And uh, my residents, um, several of my and that was Camus neighborhoods, we really should have that option because um, it's really hard, especially when you're in a neighborhood, but, um, they may not have access to transportation. Uh, they'll be able to get to their medical appointments faster. Thank you for that. Um, the next thing I want to talk to you about is COVID and mass transit. Um, something that's not really being discussed a whole lot right now uh, is SB 743, the new VMT laws that's going to start July 1st. And in a nutshell, basically, it's going to increase the price of housing and punish people for not living near a transportation hub and using mass transit. But aside from that, here's my concern. One thing that we've learned from COVID, like with the New York subway system, is how Mass transit's great, it can reduce pollution in the environment, but it's a great way to spread a pandemic. So what measures are being taken um, using the CARES Act money um, to be able to deal with another pandemic or to reduce exposure um, to uh, a virus on our buses in Fresno? Um, let me just say that uh, when city manager uh, Wilma Kwan invited me on a Friday afternoon, um, the last Friday in February to a lunch meeting on Monday with Dr. Boris and Dave Pomerville. I learned everything I could over that one weekend, working with uh, my friends in San Francisco who had just um, had uh, declared a public health emergency. Um, by that Wednesday night, we were cleaning buses overnight. Uh, by that weekend, we had put hand sanitizer stations on every bus. By that Monday, we were had, we had public facing information on what COVID meant, what symptoms to look out for, um, what things um, that uh, we wanted you to do. Like if you had a fever, don't ride with us today, ride with us tomorrow when you felt better, those kind of things. We also did that internally with our staff. Uh, we did a big social media push. I basically <laughs> took over our social media um, uh, for a month and we pushed a lot of this out. We also did this with Handy Ride. Um, at some point, uh, we went to probably right after shelter in place, which was a Tuesday or Wednesday, I think. Um, that weekend, I had a conversation with the city manager uh, and requested that our drivers be allowed to wear masks. That was quickly approved. So that Monday, we began doing masks. By the following week, uh, we were providing the PPE. 
and, the, and no later than, uh, than a week after that, our passengers were wearing, and we were down to 10 passengers per bus. Um, we now have a crew of people who sanitize the bus during the day. So they're located at L Shelter um, uh, and, and uh, A and B Shelters downtown, and uh, someone's at, at Manchester. So they jump on during the time point, they wipe down the bus, they jump off the back of the bus. So we have been doing all of these things to keep our folks clean and zero COVID cases um, of bus drivers uh, to this point. And we want to keep it that way. Craig, you me know, you're doing sneeze guards, I think. Oh yes, uh, I forgot about that. Which sneeze guards, yeah, yeah. Sneeze, uh, sneeze guards. And we, uh, thanks to the council's action the other week, we are um, uh, supplying every, additional bus that, no, that does not have one yet. Um, we've got 20 that have uh, security doors. We're putting the rest of the fleet will have those security doors. So that's an another thing that we've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my next question. Uh, safety for our drivers. Thank you for doing that. Um, thank you for being pro pro so proactive and in, in ensuring our residents that it is safe to use uh, our fax bus service during, the, during uh, this time. Uh, my last question, uh, more generally, is about lawsuits um, and exposure to the city with fleet services and the fax service. Um, any city is always susceptible to, to lawsuits. That's what happens when you're a billion dollar, basically billion dollar corporation. My question though is what measures are we taking to reduce our exposure? So um, I was just reminded that we have just submitted to the council approved um, our public uh, transportation safety plan. Um, you all did that a couple of weeks ago. That is that is data driven uh, information, um, and it it requires us to have monthly meetings with our drivers. It requires us to do certain safety related tasks, um, and it requires us to report out every year what we're doing to keep things uh, uh, in check. Um, and we will. Uh, that's now headed to the FDA. Um, we've got it in early, even though FTA ex extended the deadline to the end of the year. We thought it was important to get it in now, and that's what we will be following from here on out. Um, that, that public plan, you will get to see once a year, uh, and shows all the things that we're doing. Uh, we, but we do more training than ever before. Uh, when our drivers uh, have intersection issues, uh, such as running a, uh, going hot through a, uh, a yellow light or running a red light, they go through what we call intersection management training. It's eight hours. Um, and they have to do that before they're able to come back to work. So uh, we make sure that we are doing those kinds of things um, all the time. Um, and we uh, continue to stress, um, you know, the importance of being a safe driver. Thank you, Director. Those are all my questions. I do really appreciate you always being accessible and professional. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you, Council. Those are all the questions uh, from the Council. I'm going to go ahead and um, continue with my questions. Um, Director, I, I know we're limiting 10 people per bus um, given the COVID outbreak, and we have a flush of um, millions of dollars from the COVID relief fund. Is there any reason why we just can't add more bus routes or more bus buses to serve more people since we have the $32 million in COVID money? Well, I, re I really wish I could, but it's, it's an issue of manpower. So um, currently we have 27 uh, of our employees who are on workers' comp. We have another six or seven who are on their own personal disabilities leave without pay. Um, and so that right there creates one vacuum. The second vacuum is we have a number of staff who uh, are lacking childcare. And so may not be working a full 40 hours a week uh, they may not be working at all. They may have uh, underlying health conditions. So um, I think we have 40 of those who work intermittently uh, or are off altogether. So we are right now, manpower-wise, uh, we're just decimated. Um, when we do have the ability to have manpower, additional manpower, we do put additional buses out. Um, we call them sweeper services now um, because they're unscheduled um, and they're based on we've passed up um, at three stops, uh, eight people. And then we sweep the, the, the new bus in behind to pick up those people and continue on down the road. And part of that funding uh, that we receive is supporting sweeper service. So in, in short, it's a staffing shortage that would impede yeah, us from adding more routes. Okay, thank you. Um, how's the um, route 
to the California Veterans Home going? I know. So, um, yeah, that route unfortunately was suspended immediately among shelter in place. Mm -hmm. um, and as you know, Council President, um, the home unfortunately experienced some COVID related uh, illnesses. Um, and we have yet to get to a point where either side of us really feel comfortable in starting that back up. Okay. So it's on pause until further notice? Yes. But is it still part of your budget? Oh, yes. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. And then my last question is, um, how, much, uh, how many police officers does the fact department fund? So we currently fund 12. We have two sergeants and 10 officers. Um, and um, they typically are uh, two on per shift and possibly a sergeant. So 12 officers and a sergeant, what's the cost um, to the facts department? It's at 2.1 million. And um, 12 officers gets you two officers per shift? Is that what I understood? Okay, it's two officers per, per shift plus a, um, a sergeant. So it's, but it's 12 officers. Right, because, because our system runs from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m., there's always an officer on duty. And you need 12 officers to cover two people per shift? No, it's not two people. It's our entire system. So those two officers and the sergeant um, at peak times will all be on. But we can have an incident at, say, Peach and in, um, in, in Kings Canyon, um, and yet also have an incident at Blythe and Shaw. Um, and that's two officers right there who have now been taking um, uh, uh, some kind of uh, action based on our request. Understood, but what I'm trying to say, and in, in, in let's try and keep me as, a, I'm a simple man. Okay. So you're paying for 12 bodies, 12 FTEs, right? right? At a cost of 2.1 million. Yes. And that provides you two officers and a sergeant on patrol or on standby in case you need them. Yes. Right? And how many shifts does that cover? That covers three shifts. And then on Wednesdays, both um, we have an overlap of both shifts are on. So that's typically the day they do trainings, they meet with us, et cetera. Do they support the weekend, Greg? And they do support the weekends. What, what kind of, um, how many calls for service have you had in the, in the past year for the officers? Ooh, uh, if I had my radio on right now, you'd probably hear one. Um, calls for service are very high. Uh, we, uh, because of the unique um, population that we serve here in Fresno, uh, we um, tend to have uh, those folks who may need mental health services who are riding our, our bus and may have an outburst. Uh, and so thus we have to call. Uh, we have people who uh, sometimes have medical emergencies on our bus. Uh, we have folks who um, are just defiant or um, as Councilmember Kabasi talked about, we do have uh, riders um, who sometimes want to assault or attempt to assault one of our bus drivers or may have a physical altercation with another passenger, both on our bus or at our, our bus stop facilities. So those officers handle all of those calls. And all of that is generated via our radio system um, and not re regular patrol. Um, so what, what specialized training do the police officers get since a lot of their calls are related to mental health and medical? So they get all of the regular training that a police officer would get, um, but we also um, um, sit with them on a regular basis and talk to them about our passengers. Look, many of our facts officers have been with us for a long time. They, these are not new folks. Uh, so they have come, come uh, accustomed to dealing with the kinds of calls for service that, that they get to deal with uh, on our system. Yeah, I'd like to clarify too, if, you, if I may, um, I'm just hearing from the police department that there are 15,000 calls for service per year for facts. Yeah. What's the response time that the facts department gets when you call for service? Well, it really depends on the location of the officer. Uh, if it's a crosstown uh, response, then uh, sometimes they may call patrol to ask for assistance. Uh, but for the most part, uh, it's them uh, making a response. Again, it, they may start at Kings Canyon, they may uh, end up at Shaw and Blythe, uh, and they may have to roll code, code three. Um, but they get there, uh, and so we're very we're very happy and supportive of them. Are your calls considered priority one for the police department since you're paying for um, a set of officers? Well, we've actually prioritized with them what our calls look like. 
Um, and so um, like a sleeper on a bench uh, is more of a low, low priority call. Uh, but an accident, um, uh, a stabbing, a shooting, a whatever uh, would be a more of those priority one calls. Okay. Can I get a, a breakdown of the 15,000 calls for service? Which ones are medical, mental health? Which ones are violence, assault? I'd like to know exactly what kind of calls uh, the $2 million in the fact which is paying for. We can um, gather that information and get a trade memo, memo out to council. Great, thank you. And if you can get it to us before the 25th budget vote would be great. That will be our goal. Thank you, um, city manager. And then one last thing, um, the um, fact uh, police officers are they treated the same way as school officers are treated? I know some of our school officers are asked to patrol the neighborhood when they're not on call. What what do the fact police officers do when they're when they're not on call? Well, just like any any other officer, they could be driving uh, and they can see uh, a, a situation occurring before them. And as sworn police officers, they are required to stop and, and intervene. So um, when they're on standby for a call, where are they stationed at? Well, typically they're in their vehicles, moving around, checking uh, bus stops. It's mobile. It's not like they're they're stationed at the factory. No, no, no. They really don't even have a home. Um, okay. I, I think some of them dress out of Southwest and some of them dress out of Central. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Um, is there any other questions from the council for the director? Um, Councilor uh, Carbossi, you have the floor. Thank you. Director, I was just wondering if you could provide me maybe just a, a simple answer as possible about how your department feels about having the asset of having a, fa a fax unit um, for driver safety, for public safety. Um, you hear people say it's not safe to ride the bus. I've ridden the bus myself. It's safe every single time. Drivers are great. But do you feel that working with fax is an asset or a liability? It's actually an asset for us. Uh, when we came from, remember the beginning of this year, we started with 18 officers. And we went down to 12. Um, and 12 is what we thought would, could be the bare minimum. Fax has always had its own police force um, with nine officers. Uh, but with the size of our, um, our, our ridership, we were on record uh, or to break 11 million. We will get to 9 million. Um, last year, we served 10.5 million riders. Mm -hmm. um, but we want those riders and drivers to all be safe. And knowing that they can hit the panic alarm uh, and help is on its way, uh, because that panic alarm opens up the um, mic, so we can hear everything on on the bus. Um, that that really is um, uh, calming and soothing for both our drivers and our passengers. Great. And you mentioned that Fax has always had some kind of uh, public safety force. That's correct. That is correct. Okay. Thank you very much. As long as I've been here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Director, my last question. Um, you mentioned you have 12 officers that you pay for now. Since you, you've reduced significantly the ridership to 10 per bus, have we reduced the amount of officers covering fax during this time? No, or, because I have the same amount of buses on the road. Okay. We have not reduced any service. You haven't it's, reduced routes. You've just reduced passengers. Just passengers. By so how much did you pay? We still start at 5 a.m. We still run every route all day long. Understood. What hours. would you say is the reduction in passengers during COVID? Well, um, the last week's report was 49%. So we have started at 59%. We are now inching back uh, to, um, and if, like I say, if we didn't have the 10 rider rule, we'd probably be in the 30s. Uh, but 49% um, reduction from year uh, before last week. So you reduced passenger traffic by 50% essentially during COVID. Are you still paying the police department the full amount for the officers? Yes, because they are still providing the full amount of service through the, for the entire system and responding to as many calls probably as they were pre-COVID. Perfect. Thank you for your clarification and your time, Director. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Uh, we have Councilwoman Messari with more questions, so she has the floor. I have a question um, that just came to mind because I know it's an issue that had come up in the past about fair evaders. Has that been an issue? Um, are we going after folks um, that aren't paying for the fair? What are, what are we doing? So fair evasion was a big problem on bus rapid transit. So what we did was instead of chasing folks over $1.25, we put a fare box in that bus. Um, so now there's a fare box on the front of that bus. And so everyone has to pay. 
So it's no longer the free bus anymore. And people have gotten that message. There are occasions where um, a fare evader uh, on any route may, may um, board the bus. And we continue to keep that bus in service and attempt to get a supervisor to respond to that. Um, sometimes it's, it's a, it's, it could be a misunderstanding. Uh, for example, yesterday in, in my recap, I noticed that we had a, a rider who, um, for whatever reason, uh, the bill pack would not take her money. And so she waited for the driver to get back on uh, and then alert the driver who thought she was a fair invader. No, 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 your machine would not take my dollar bill. Um, and so that was resolved right there on the spot. A lot of times it's, it's really um, an issue of um, education. Um, and most of our fare evasion is really about what we call back riding. Like I've ridden from one end of the system to the other, and now you're, I'm supposed to pay another dollar twenty-five, and then believing that they don't, shouldn't have to pay. Thank you, and I'm glad to hear that you actually solved an issue because you, you know, I know that um, folks had talked about this um, some time ago. Um, I was against us going. Us, uh, you know, after someone that was evading for a dollar twenty-five, I just, you know, it's like a constant reminder of like criminalizing poverty. And so I'm glad that you guys were able to fix that problem. Um, I still, you know, to some degree, have concerns about um, maybe other issues that may feel and may may make people feel of communities of color that do predominantly ride the bus that. Uh, they have to constantly be watched. So I think, um, you know, I just wanted to share that because I, 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 I do have some of those concerns and I look forward to as we have conversations about policing in Fresno and what, what are some of the things that we can do better um, to improve the trust because that's, I think, what the biggest um, factor is within our community, trust with law enforcement that we're looking at opportunities to improve how um, we provide um, public safety services um, for our community. I understand that it's important for the driver and for other folks that are, that are riding um, the bus, but you know, just wanted to put, put that out there. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Director, again. And as Ms. Ronda indicated, thank you for solving a problem with some common sense and not just you know throwing more police officers or more resources uh, behind something such as a $1.25 invasion of a, of a bus um, charge. Council President, so. can, I, can I clarify something? I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. And your question about reducing officers was related to yeah, the, the floor city manager, as soon as the audio city, city manager, um, can you start over the audio cut out? Yeah, I, I can. I apologize for just jumping in. But um, quick clarification, your question about reducing facts of officers was related to the COVID incident, correct? Or were you asking in general if we have reduced officers prior to COVID? Because at uh, one time, FACS was paying for about 18 officers. 18. And then in January, that number went down from 18 to 12. Um, we, Director Barfield answered your question relative to the COVID incident, and we have not reduced officers since COVID came because we do believe that, it, that we will get back to our ridership City manager, to your question, I think you just clarified for me. So okay, what, right. what I assumed was that since we reduced ridership or passengers during COVID, that we would also reduce the amount of officers covering our transportation department. So it looks like you went from 18 to 12. And we went from passengers 18, go back we went up. From 18 to 12 at the beginning of January. So that was prior to COVID. Um, okay, got it. We have decided not to reduce facts officers now because we do believe we're going to hit a new norm soon and increase our, pa our, our capacity to more than 10 passengers per bus. Okay. Um, okay. And city manager, on my request for the 15,000 calls for service, if you could also tell us which ones, um, how, how many of them actually got a police response? I know sometimes we use people call 911 for everything, but not everything's a priority one call. So just to get us an understanding of of the 15,000 calls, what percentage of those actually got a police officer, you know, response or okay. intervention? Thank we you. We can do that. You, said, you, you said, said June 26th, correct? 28th. Okay. <laughs> but thank you for being sneaky. Uh, <laughs> Councilmember Carbasi, you have the last word on this item. No, 
No, I just have a clarifying question um, for the director, since we're talking about um, the facts unit through PD. Um, director, so by population, we're the fifth largest city, but by land area, uh, we're number six in the state. So it's a pretty big city. Mm -hmm. um, now, the fax officers, the 12 we have, they're not all working at one time, correct? They're staggering shifts. Right. So if we were to reduce that number, I'm, I think through common sense, I would assume it could put us at greater risk if there is a call for service where it's bus uh, ridership safety or, or, or the staff safety. Um, you know, what do you think about that? So I was the one who worked with our two sergeants to come up with the 12. Uh, because I wanted to make sure that we had coverage um, for our entire system um, from 5 a.m. to 11 uh, uh, or 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. every day. Um, and again, you know, Saturdays and Sundays, um, we also run uh, service. So it was important for us to make sure that um, working with them, we developed the right schedule because um, I didn't want to cut too much, um, but, I, but there was a request to... Um, have some additional officers come back into the patrol matrix, um, which we accommodated. And 12 was the number that worked. Got it. And I, I do appreciate that process you went through to do it based on metrics and a discussion. If the council was to vote, and I, I wouldn't support this, but to vote to reduce that number, um, would there be a negative impact to um, the department? There would be. Um, it, it would be about driver safety, passenger safety. Um, look, uh, our fleet uh, of 112 vehicles, at peak, 98 of them are on the road. Um, if all 98 are full, e even during COVID times with 10 passengers, there is um, the abundance of um, abilities uh, for many things to happen uh, when you have that many passengers on the bus. Um, the, the fax officers respond to any time our bus is in an accident, whether it's hit or whether we hit something. Right, um, whether someone slips and falls. Uh, and uh, uh, no, go ahead. Right. No, no. I no, sorry, so, it was a little bit of a lag. Please continue. Oh, okay. So um, our, our, our fax officers respond to any accidents. They also respond to again situations that occur in and around a bus stop, and that can be, um, for example, uh, there was a d domestic issue the other day. I think it was uh, Thursday afternoon at Courthouse Park that uh, called for not only our officers to respond, but it was so close to the sheriff's office that they actually walked out the door. So they respond to those kinds of things too. Um, and they handled the situation and they were able to peacefully solve it. But we also have those folks who um, have a number of mental issues out there and sometimes need hospitalization. And they are the ones who respond to those calls. They try to figure them out. They try to help them to the best of their ability. And if need be, uh, then they're put on a uh, 5150 hold. That's the reality of who we serve every single day. And I'm also hearing from the police department, which will be included in your tray memo, that 100% of those calls for service that come in are answered by PD. They do respond. I, I would like to add one more thing, uh, and it's secondary to the safety aspect, but there's also a, an efficiency aspect. So when that incident happens on a, or near a bus, it often uh, causes the, the bus to stop uh, to deal with the situation. So a prompt response uh, to, to clear the incident, whatever it may be, an accident, uh, a, a disturbance on the bus, uh, that response is critical to getting the buses back on, on in service and on time. So there's an efficiency portion of the equation as well. Thank you. Uh, Director, uh, one last piece. Um, a fair point was made, you know, if, if your department is paying for these units, we want to make sure that when you call the fax units available. Now, there may be times when they have to go and assist with another call, but I want to make sure if we only have so many units running at one time during peak hours where there's 98 buses running in this city and a fax unit rolls on the scene to provide help to the passengers and the, and the, and the staff. Will Fresno PD units come and also help out with those calls as well? If needed, if needed. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right, uh, Councilmember Berryfield, you have a part. Yeah, um, so Greg, I wanna just follow up. Um, are you having problems with people uh, evading the fare? No, uh, fare evasion 
um, the whole concept of free bus went away when we put fare boxes on BRT. Okay. Every now and then, every now and then, someone will try to get on without paying. And again, we'll dispatch a supervisor, but that is not the norm anymore. Okay, and so putting the, the box in the, in the bus is what changed that. Yes, and we, we stopped rear door boarding because that's where all of our problems were happening. And rear door, somebody would come on with a, the biggest bag of recyclables you can think of, which is against our cargo policy. It'd probably be leaking and dripping all over the place. Um, and then they quickly go to the back seat and the driver would not be made aware of that individual until he or she departed. Okay, because you know I, I, I'm just concerned when um, you know we say we're criminalizing poverty because people are uh, avoiding the fare. Uh, I don't think that's accurate. I mean, I think we're criminalizing uh, criminality, uh, criminal behavior when you're avoiding a fare. Uh, I mean, what do we say to the people who do pay their fare uh, every time? Uh, um, and do so. I mean, are we to say that, well, okay, the city of Fresno is not going to require it if you don't want to pay it. Uh, I mean, I think we need to be consistent. And if there's a fair, people need to pay it. And if you evade it, uh, you're, you're committing uh, a crime. So I think we need to acknowledge that. Um, I mean, I think the city of Fresno does everything it can to help people uh, with these fairs. I mean, we help students with these fairs. I'm fully in support of that all the time. Uh, we want to be helpful to people who need the bus system. Um, buses are very important. Uh, public uh, transportation is very important for large uh, uh, numbers of our population. I'm fully in support of that, but I don't think we want to dismiss uh, those who uh, want to evade the fare. So anyway, thank you, Greg. You do a great job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Director. And I would just like to point out, I know we're not in the police budget yet, but since your department funds $2 million of the police budget, I'd like to point out a couple of kudos to you. One is you went from 18 officers to 12 and the world hasn't ended and, and our buses are still safe. Two, you dealt with the fare box without having to have a law enforcement solution to it. Those are two very important things that the public should know and that you should be given credit for solving um, without you know the fire alarms going off across the city that the world's gonna end because we've decided to utilize resources differently while still maintaining public safety and the ridership of your buses and the clients that you serve, you know, on track. So thank you for solving those two big issues that in the past would have simply been more sworn officers that I think the credit to the police chief, he's been able to redirect to patrol and service calls. So thank you, uh, director, for problem solving those two things for us. Well, look, I, I can't take all the credit. I need to, uh, again, say thank you to the 500 employees that work for the department. Uh, a lot of their input uh, I rely on every single day, uh, whether it's that frontline driver or that mechanic uh, or some of the smart people that are behind me that helped uh, create uh, this budget presentation. So thank you. Great. Thank you. And now we'll go to public comment. Jonas, you are not unmuted. You have three minutes to address the council on the Fresno, uh, City of Fresno's Fax Department budget. Good morning, council members. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, Greg, first of all, for running all the buses during the COVID-19. My name is Jonas Palos. I advocate for our severely damaged homeless veterans and their PTSD. Uh, yes, COVID-19, we took a hit. I'm all for safety. It's good that uh, you know we follow CDC guidelines. Uh, at the same token, uh, Esmeralda, actually ask all my questions. Yes, City College, let's, uh, we have 12% homeless students. I got that data because my son goes to school there. So when we talk about poverty, we need to help poverty. I want those 12% into graduation, into jobs. And you're doing a wonderful job. You know what I do, actually. And thank you for uh, giving me those tokens in the past. And you know what I'm telling you, with COVID-19, we need to keep that veteran's transportation home. Thank you, Miguel, for asking that. Because you know what? They are devastated in that home. They're not treated well. And I'm not welcome in there. They called me mentally ill for advocating for these veterans. And I filed a complaint with the Department of Justice. And they're going to be dealt with because they don't have no business calling me that out of my name. A lot of people have been calling me out of my name. And it's sad to see that during the meeting also. It's very hurtful. 
these Let's people need to be dealt with. And I just want to tell you, let's keep City College going and let's keep the veteran home transportation going because Thank they you, suffered a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Next person is Matthew. Gillian. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you and uh, good morning, council members and good morning, Director Barfield. Um, thank you, Greg, for your clear and concise budget. Uh, I have used my facts in the past uh, to go from District 2 to District 3 to then also District 5 that same day. Um, so I would love to, as we continue our conversations, oh, forgive me, I did not introduce myself, but Matthew Gilling with the Inspiration Transportation. Um, so as we continue our conversations, Greg, I would love to let you know uh, some of my thoughts in regards to how yeah. That, how that your my facts can play into the our last mile conversations um and as councilwoman sorius mentioned i do believe that bitwise could be a good strategic partner in regards to uh tech within the transportation space um as i have emailed a few of the council members this morning i think that they may be able to be a very good partner in regards to these virtual meetings and the maintaining the sanctity of these meetings um so, Director Barfield, thank you very much for everything that you're doing with FACTS, and thank you, Council members. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, next person is Carolina. Yes, um, I would like to thank my District Council member, Juan Soria, for her questioning and for everything that um, she gave during um, this moment, and Miguel as well. Uh, we have two perfect examples um, of how policing and D needs to change. Um, and I would like to first suggest that our city council members, along with Fresno Unified, who announced that their teachers will be receiving anti-racism training. They gave it a different name so you feel comfortable. However, the city council needs to understand anti-racism and how $1.25 in fact is criminalizing and has historically people of color and that the transit system has historically also criminalized overall people of color. And I would like for you guys to understand it so that people like Wilma Kwan doesn't roll her eyes when asked for the data. Um, it's really important that we don't repeat rhetoric um, from Blue Lives Matters and other um, people that are not understanding this moment in time. I really hope our council member is committed to learning. Um, it's unbelievable that the response to what additional training do police officers have uh, for what we know are mental health problems is that they're old and they have served for a long time and we talk. Unbelievable. I yield my time. Thank you. <laughs> Next person is Lisa Flores. You have been unmuted. Good morning, Greg. Um, first off, I want to talk about um, this ferry evasion. Um, it's a really, technically, it's a really small amount mm -hmm. in the whole budget of your transit. So I don't know why people are harping on ferry evasions because if you just leave it be, it's not a big deal. It really isn't. I used to review your plans for transit for uh, giving the city of Fresno both state and federal money and the ferry evasions was really the last thing I ever looked for. Um, also, too, it seems like you're having to use $2.1 million for duplication of services. If you cut one supervisor, even at $170,000, imagine what you can do. You could actually offer differential pay to solve your labor issues. You could actually subsidize some childcare to get your people back to work. I mean, there are ways of doing things. Um, also too, what is the game plan if, if we're all put in shelter in place in November? Will there be free transit available as people may not be working anymore and may see a reduction in their income, but they still have to go to grocery shopping and doctors? What's that plan? And also too, um, can Handy Ride expand um, their transportation regarding people taking their doggies, their small little dogs under 35 pounds in a crate to the dog park. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa.
The next person is Jen Rojas. Yes, Jen. hi. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Jennifer Rojas. I work with Reservores Unidos. I help coordinate a youth group there. Um, and a large part of our youth group rely on the city bus to get to and from places, even to and from our programs at Barrios Unidos, and have called for um, more accessible experience when riding the bus. Um, one which was already mentioned, Ryan, being able to have a uh, bus pass mm -hmm. to our young people is very, very important, um, but not only to just college students, but also pushing it for high school students. Um, and the other part that our youth have been asking for is that they demand a, a increase to bus routes that are going out to the west side. Our students in the west side oftentimes have trouble uh, making it to um, our programs that are usually after school, right, um, in the afternoon, um, or having to find a bus, I mean, find an alternative route home because of the, the limited bus routes that are in the west side. And we continue to, to hear time and time again um, that our response to safety is policing. And now we're hearing that even more here um, in the discussion about having uh, police, fax cops um, respond to mental and medical health issues. And we would just like to continue to push you to, to reimagine what that means, what safety means. And if they are responding to these things, we should have mental health um, professionals respond to to the mental health case should have medical professionals responding to those medical um, situations and instead put that money um, that are going currently to to fund these police officers to those locations to fund accessibility for our bus routes for our young people in Fresno um, so I just want to continue to challenge all of you um, to reimagine um, safety and safety does not always have to mean police. Thank you. Thank you. Next person is Anthony Woodward. Matthew? Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, thank you, uh, council member. And uh, my name is Matthew Woodward. I am just here kind of as a city college student. Um, and uh, I definitely want to thank all the council members for strongly saying that they want uh, to continue the bus pass program and also, well, through the, through everything that's been going on. Um, I also just wanted to say, I strongly agree with what Esmeralda Soria said about um, trying to uh, potentially uh, increase Measure C. I don't know what the feasibility of doing that right now in this uh, economic climate uh, is, but Obviously, there's like a ton of things you could do. You could, as I think top of the list, just based on the conversations today, would be free transit for the for the first the entire city. There, because fare evasion, at least just going after people like that, that de definitely criminalizes uh, poverty to a degree, what, regardless of what certain council members might say. But anyway, that's kind of my, uh, my piece. Matthew. Thank you, Next person is Cesar Casamayor. You have three minutes to address council. All right. Cesar, can you hear us? All right, we're gonna go to the next person. Jonathan McAllister, you are unmuted. Go ahead and address the council. Uh, hello, my name is Jonathan. Uh, I live in Frenso. I'm a local resident in Frenso, uh, California. And uh, uh, I just want to say that we should fund the police and kill all niggers and faggots. Thank you. Here we go. All right. Uh, we apologize for that disruption, but you can't block idiots from speaking publicly. All right, we are now done with public comment. We'll move on to the next budget item. The next budget item is uh, the fire department for the city of Fresno. City manager, if the fire department chief is ready, you will have the floor. So she is zooming in uh, from a remote location. If you, oh, there you are. Hi, chief. Hello. And then Mike Eddie for me too, please. Very good job, thank you. A 
say, Chief, as soon as we have your staff in here, I'll let you know, and then you can begin your presentation. Thank you. And city Good Manager, um, just for uh, reference for this council and the public, we will complete the uh, fire department budget presentation before lunch, and we'll take on the police budget at 1.30 this afternoon. Okay, great. And Thank we'll you for letting allow us know. lunchtime to work out any kinks that we have with the police department's uh, IT. Oh, wonderful. Right. Thank you. Fire Chief, you have the floor. Good morning, Council President, Council Members. Thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do is provide you an overview and some primary responsibilities of our department. Uh, talk about the budget uh, a little bit and then some comments and, and perspective. And then we'll go into an explanation of uh, overtime and shift replacement overtime and then open it up for comments or questions that you may have, okay? Uh, our organizational chart, uh, it's just a quick snapshot of what that looks like. Um, there you go. Uh, we have five divisions, operations, prevention, support services, our training division, our personnel and investigations division, and then our business and fiscal services. Um, three of those divisions are um, oversight is provided by a deputy chief. Uh, the personnel investigations division, I currently am overseeing that as well. Uh, we, we, are having a challenge to, to get another admin BC. And then we have a, a civilian, um, Mike Getty, who's there, um, oversees our business and fiscal services. So our primary responsibilities. Next slide. Okay. Operations division. This division is responsible for fire, medical, hazardous materials, water rescue, urban search and rescue, emergency responses throughout the city, the airport, Big Garden Fire Protection District, and through our automatic aid agreements with Fresno County, North Central, and Clovis Fire Departments, as well as our mutual aid agreements outside the, um, the county with the state. Fire prevention and support services. This is responsible for state mandated fire and life safety inspections, general inspections, plan and sprinkler plan review, five-year sprinkler tests and new construction inspections per the state fire code, as well as community outreach programs. The fire training services division is responsible for all annual state required training for 296 sworn safety members and 44 non-sworn safety members. The training division also participates in outside fire agency training through multi-company drills. We deliver over 78,000 hours of training annually to our fire department members. And this division also is responsible for our recruit academies and our probationary evaluation testing. The personnel and investigations division is responsible for all personnel management, promotional testing processes, work permits, customer complaints, recruit and hiring, internal affairs investigations, background clearances, disciplinary actions, sick leave review, wellness and, and safety, fire investigations and career development for the department. And then finally, our business and fiscal services division is responsible for the day-to-day -day financial operations of the department, including payroll, accounts payable and receivable, general ledger accounting. Also, the division is responsible for budget preparation, grant management, including our uh, OES, grant audits, fire district administration, and works directly with other departments. Next slide. Um, the next slide um, is really our operating general fund. Uh, you'll see in the personnel area, this is as of January 20, these budgets, excuse me, it was estimated that we'd be about 58.7 million um, that was about estimating of about 1.7 million over in our PERS costs. However, due to COVID and the state shelter in place orders, we really saw uh, that our members were not taking vacation. They were, they were there. And so we didn't have a lot more vacancies to fill. And we probably are seeing that number be closer to about a million over. Our non-personnel costs are about 5.9 million. These are lease payments for our eight-year apparatus replacement of about $3 million. Our county dispatch contract and utilities costs are kind of the larger um, ticket items in that area. Internal services is 
million um, for a total of around 69.5. Our authorized positions are 340. Of those, 296 are sworn safety, 20 are non, uh, they're sworn non-safety, those are your fire inspectors, and then 24 civilians. We have nine vacancies, seven of which are sworn safety, two of which are sworn non-safety, again, two inspectors. Our capital general fund, which is um, down below is, we don't have that, um, so next slide. Our operating non-general fund, this is basically our debt service, state center community college training uh, grant, our airport fire rescue um, uh, contract and our Homeland Security grant. There are six sworn safety members as part of the airport contract within this, um, this uh, fund. And I went through those already. And then down a capital non-general fund um, really the largest ticket item here is the construction of station 18, which is estimated around 6.9. That's, that was, um, is moving forward and, and then some other, uh, non-personnel, uh, costs. Now, um, I'd like to offer you some perspective and, and some comments from, um, about the, our department. Um, your fire department is consistently run thin. Uh, this this department doesn't have a lot of fluff in its budget or its staffing levels in every division. We are below our peer cities and in some cases below other city departments in the same category. Over the past six years, uh, I have consistently communicated the state of our department and our needs uh, for the city's fire department and asked for additional positions, sworn safety and other to bring the department up to a safe and effective level. While we have made progress with this uh, council and past councils uh, and, and administration, the fire department has been and continues to be the lowest staff fire department in the state and the country that serves a similar population and runs the similar call volume that we do. The minimum daily staffing today is the same as it was in 1980 where we had half the population and we ran half the calls. So essentially at 80 firefighters on duty today, we have 0.55 firefighters per thousand. And the state average for a Metro department is 0.81. The fire department cannot afford to reduce its minimum daily staffing or firefighting force. Reduction in staffing will result in daily closing of fire stations, impacting our citizenry, with slower response times, increased risk to firefighter safety, and erasing the organizational progress that has taken place for the last six years. Now, let me take you back to the Cortland incident of 2015, where Captain Dern, there was a near miss there. That resulted in the SART report being completed. The department, again, with the support of this council and, and prior and administration, has followed through on the 169 recommendations in that report. To date, 95% of those recommendations have been completed. Now, I will share just humbly uh, through the efforts of the team, that's unprecedented to complete that type of level of work. Usually these reports end up being um, a paperweight or collect dust on the shelf. Uh, but this department has really moved forward and made a lot of progress uh, through the help of council administration's support. To accomplish that level of success, to change a culture and firefighting practices required the financial investment into our training division, into our training staff, a consistent and relentless training classes, our personal protective equipment improvements, and increased staffing and accountability at our chief officer level. The tragedy of the Cortland incident in 2015 was in part a result of taking six apparatus and 19 firefighters out of the field in 2009 during the recession. 
the department at that time stopped responding to 10,000 priority to medical calls. The training budget was cut resulting in computer-based training instead of hands-on and the hiring stopped for seven years, which meant there were no recruit schools or no new firefighters hired. This resulted in complacency and disillusionment uh, in, in, our, in our practices. And um, the outcome uh, was part of the, um, the result of that. I'll briefly mention our other divisions. The prevention division the fire inspectors proactively inspect businesses per the state fire code. This division currently has two vacancies at the fire inspector position. There is a projected revenue stream for these inspections, for plan review, for new construction inspections, including money back guarantee. And the department needs the appropriate staff to complete those inspections. Additionally, the current staff uh, is able to complete all of the state mandated inspections on an annual basis. But there's approximately 14,000 other inspections, general inspections that we probably can get to maybe 50%. Uh, therefore, we're not proactively really looking to reduce fire loss or safety issues. The administrative staff is not back to its pre-recession levels. We consistently are asking our people to do more sometimes the work of two or three other positions. Our capital maintenance, training, and other budget areas are lean. While we have higher expenses for repairing and exceeding what we usually are allotted due to prevailing wage and unexpected repairs at our aging fire stations. For example, we have a $256,000 line item for our maintenance and repair of facilities. I'll give you an example of how little that stretches. We had a recent estimate to repair a single fire station bathroom, about a six by 10. Uh, this triggered ADA requirements. That resulted in a price tag of $109,000. So you can see very quickly that that money doesn't go very far. And it's a very, very small budget for 19 fire stations and headquarters. Finally, our overtime. We have a minimum daily staffing of 80 firefighters on duty each day. Again, this is the lowest of any peer city or metro department. That requires that we have a butt in every seat every single day and for our chief officers and our firefighting positions. That results in shift replacement and overtime to fill those vacancies. On average, due to vacation, sick leave, injury, holiday, any type of leave, et cetera, we realize 14.5 vacancies each day. The base budget assumed the department um, would maintain a relief pool of six, six, and nine. That means six captains, six engineers, and nine firefighters. But through attrition, we have reduced down to today, we are at four, four, and three. This results in more shift replacement over time than it was projected. Additionally, we saw in the last 10 months or so an increase of injury uh, due to a long-term injuries and or illnesses such as cancer that required more shift replacement, I would say in the last 10 months. So let's go to our final slide and we'll walk through shift replacement over time. What you see in front of you is uh, trying to uh, really uh, simplify this, this discussion. Shift replacement A, B, and C shift, we have 80 people on duty each day. That's 240 members assigned to three shifts um, if, you, if you added all this together. Historically, the 240 members, we are absent on average of about 21 to 22 shifts a year. Again, that's vacation, sick, injury, holiday, um, et cetera. Those uh, numbers of shifts require uh, 5,280 hours of backfilling each year. The cost per shift on average is about, to pay the overtime is around $1,200. That results in an unavoidable cost of 6.5 million to, and that's without a relief pool. 
So those are those are numbers that are unavoidable. We're not going to avoid that that number um, to backfill. The alternative that's that some have discussed is to hire and not and, and not have any overtime or that 6.5. But to do that, the cost to hire and place people in a relief pool, if you will, so the <clears throat> relief pool would be much higher, like I'm going to guess around 14, 16 in each rank. Uh, that would require every member in the relief pool could fill those shifts. That cost would be over $7 million and it would only increase ongoing. It's important to note that you would need to hire 53 firefighters to create a relief pool sufficient to cover all of the vacancies that are not avoidable. Um, on an annual basis. To do that though, hiring 53 firefighters, one, it doesn't increase your minimum daily staffing at all. Uh, two, it's, there really isn't another Metro department that we are aware of that has a relief pool. No one functions that way. They, they function in a way of mandatory hiring for overtime. Three, um, it's outside the MOU and the constant staffing policy to have a relief pool higher than six, six and nine. And then finally, hiring 53 firefighters would require at least three recruit schools to the tune of about 500 to $900,000 each, depending on what the hiring requirements were. So if we were trying to cast a wider net and hire people that don't have a, a experience, you're gonna have a longer uh, recruit school uh, to, to secure many people. So our idea was to have a, um, you know, shoot for a middle ground and have some overtime and, and a minimal amount of folks in the relief pool, maybe three, three train or four, uh, to have some type of balance. Um, finally, we do have your city data. We, we know what other cities look like in the matrix and, and multiple uh, categories, and then we do our own call, call that in and uh, staffing model if you need any of that information. And with that, I will close my report and open it up to any questions. Fire Chief, as usual, thank you for one of the most comprehensive and clear presentations. Um, and I find your department to be the most transparent when it comes to providing us a clear review of your operations and your funding gaps. Um, so thank you for that. With that, we'll go to council members. Um, council members, sorry, you had your hand up. Thank you, Council President, and thank you, Chief, for um, all that information uh, that you provided. It was pretty concise. I just have a few questions. One, going back to the to Fire Station 18, <clears throat> excuse me, just for the public's knowledge, um, can you just let us know what the timeline um, for the, the station to be open? Um, we were estimating it was going to be April, March, April of 2021. Uh, they are pouring the foundation, I believe it was last week. Uh, so they are making progress, moving moving along quite quickly. Okay, and then um, do you guys know what you guys will be doing or is there a plan in place um, for the current location where the firefighters are housed out of? What are we gonna do with that? I believe it's a city asset now. Uh, they own, they purchased that. Uh, that would be up to administration and council what they plan on doing with that. Yeah, our goal was to sell that and help, help with furnishing uh, the new fire station 18. Okay, perfect. And then um, I wanted to ask about uh, the safer grant. I know that there was a time, uh, a deadline looming. I don't know if it has passed. What happened with that? I know that in the in a previous council, I had um, brought forward a motion to to give direction to apply for it, and then um, at the time, if we did get it, we would then decide if we wanted to take it take it up or not. So, what happened with that? Uh, the decision was made based on the economic uh, outlook for the city. The to not apply. So did the deadline already pass? It did pass. Okay. I thought though it was the direction of the council. Did that change? 
Um, Tim, do you wanna do you wanna address this, and then I can chime in? Yeah, um, uh, City Manager, if you could specifically address whether Council's direction was ignored. Um, I would not say that Council's direction was ignored, but we took, um, we made a, a decision, um, my office collectively with the mayor's office made a decision not to apply based upon um, COVID and everything else um, that we had going on. The, the hit to the general fund would have been $6.6 .6 million over a five-year period for nine firefighters. And given um, at the time uh, that the council direction came in, it was before COVID, and we were trying to make sure that we were doing everything we can to cut expenses and not take on additional liability and uh, save every job that we could. So we made the decision not to apply. Why didn't that come back to the council though? Because there was a direction given by the council. And so it takes me back a little that um, given the fact that council had taken action um, that you guys wouldn't even come back to at least one, let us know and then allow us to make the policy call um, given the information that, that you just provided. Um, I just feel that um, if we're a team, we need to be acting like a team. And um, it seems like our, our direction wasn't respected. And I get, I get the, the economic circumstances and the fact that we went into COVID, but I think regardless of us, had we applied, we, we didn't know if we were going to get it. Um, I think it would have been, in my opinion, I'm a little frustrated because you should have left it up to the council to determine if we were in fact selected, whether we wanted to take on the additional liability that, um, that you um, calculated would come from it. So I'm a little frustrated that our, essentially our direction was ignored. Our apologies. Well, how are we going to fix that? An apology doesn't, you know, revert back to the deadline. It's like if we give direction as a council, as a policy body, and then you guys just disregard it. Um, I'm sorry, this is unusual times given what's going on with COVID. And we tried to make that clear before. We also didn't want to uh, apply, receive a grant that we were going to decline and, and have um, um, a, a strained relationship with the granting authority or the agency. And so we made the decision not to not to apply. And I agree with Tim that, that we apologize if we've upset you, but it's unusual times. I yeah, get things it. Have been very, very hectic with COVID. I mean, we're having to make a lot of decisions in a very short period of time over the last 89 or 90 days. I get that. I just don't want it to be an excuse given the fact that, you know, we're still in the middle of COVID and as other things come up that you guys just ignore and not come back to the council for an additional vote if you guys needed us to kind of um, walk back on our position. So I'm, I am, you know, I, I accept the apology, but it doesn't change things. Um, so, you know, I just want to make sure that- You've learned that a lot more about COVID and are better able to manage it within our available time. And there'll be other future safer grants that we can apply for when we're in a better standing financially. Yeah, I, I understand that, but I also know that, you know, you guys want to do a continuing resolution because we're hopeful that the federal government is going to step up and um, fill that gap. And so this wouldn't have been any different. You know, I think that there, we, we would have been able to have the opportunity to make that decision and you guys pretty much made the decision for us. And so it's- no, a I have to be honest though too, I've, I've been asking for direction on other things too that you all don't wanna make a decision on like the fence around the charter official. And you've wanted me to postpone that without bringing it to council. So we made an executive decision not to apply for the safer grant because I did not wanna put the city nor did the mayor in the situation to take on another another $6.6 .6 million worth of debt. Uh, that's a that's a not a fair comparison, Wilma. Um, with all due respect, and I don't and I don't wish to get in a back and forth, um, but it's not a fair comparison. Um, so I'll I'll, 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 move, I'll move on. I will move on. I will move on. It is my time. I will move on with um, further questions. Um, other thing that I wanted to ask, Chief. Um, I know in the past we talked about um, kind of. Uh, bringing some smaller equipment so that we're not having to use our big um, 
I don't know if it, I don't know the difference. The truck, yeah. we, remember we were yeah. trying to bring a plan forward. What What is the status with that? I know that obviously it takes money, but what is yeah. this in our plan? Yeah, we were, um, the plan to move forward with squads. They are two person apparatus. They primarily respond to medical emergencies, keeping the engine and truck, which are 40 or 80,000 pound piece of equipment parked longer, mm -hmm. uh, saving that resource and having them more readily available to rescues and fires. Uh, that squad, we have, we have purchased a squad. We are in the process of purchasing a squad um, if we were to have applied for safer, that was how we were going to staff it. Um, so we will be, be securing a squad here, I would say in the next eight months, and then we will have to decide, you know, if we're going to let it sit or if we're going to staff it. Wow. Okay. So how will we let, how will we staff it if we don't have the additional bodies? So would it allow our, our trucks to kind of sit and not be used for those smaller calls or yeah we you know you could staff it with if there's folks left in the relief pool if you wanted to staff it full time that way uh, you could staff it with overtime hiring um what we want we, what we don't want to do is um rob peter to pay paul we you need additional minimum daily staffing to utilize this resource that's resource that's the point of of having these squads. The part of the impact fee study uh, was to implement, I believe it was nine squads citywide uh, as we build out this, um, you know, our, as we grow and as, as there's funding available. Um, that was gonna be my next, next question with the, the, the action that the council took to accept the new fees. I know that um, we were severely undercharging folks. Mm -hmm. um, so where does that put us um, for at least the feeling of one squad? Are we going to be able to do with those well, additional revenues or are those, because I thought that we said that those revenues, we wanted them to stay in, within the fire department, but I don't, I don't know if anyone can remind me of that. I believe that was the motion. Um, that was not, um, I was referring to the impact fees. Um, the, there is revenue there. We are generating more revenue if we are inspecting properly. Um, but again, I don't know where the, the city has decided to, what to do with that revenue. You know, I'll have Henry address that. Um, go ahead, Henry. Could you, um, Henry, could, could you clarify for me when we raised the fire fees, the council made it clear that they wanted those fire fees to go to the fire department to improve staffing. Are you suggesting that a different decision has been made? No, no. they are they are there, but I wanted Henry to kind of paint the no. picture of what Perfect. that means. They Thank are there. Manager. Can Henry can Henry have a second? Go ahead, Henry. He has the floor. Thank you, Council President. So yes, the, those new fees that council approved, it's structured so it will go into the fire department's uh, financial structure. But one thing you need to keep in mind is um, those new fees that were projected are programmed, were programmed in the last, if you will, general fund estimate. So that last one, which shows roughly about a 40 million deficit, it includes those new fees. So at that point, I just wanna make sure everyone's aware of. So they will go to, they will stay in fire, but we'll probably, they're probably gonna be supplanted. That's what I imagine. They will be in the department. They will receive it. Um, as far as supplanting, I, I'm not clear what you mean by that term. Well, will we take out other funds? No. But, okay, so will they be supplemental to whatever they already, their base kind of general funds that they, they get currently correct so we will see then in fact an increase in in the fire departments okay well financial structure well will we be will that be enough to cover that squad that we're going to receive in a few months reality is in my mind no because when you look at the total universe of the general fund 
it incorporates a portion that's related to the fire department. So right now, those new fees are embedded in that deficit. So if you add another service, you're adding more costs that then will add to the potentially to the deficit. So Henry, and excuse me, um, Council, I'm sorry for interrupting, but um, I'm kind of getting you know deja vu on. Last year we increased the police budget by about twenty million dollars, but we didn't add any additional police officers, right? On paper we added more money. So are you suggesting that we're gonna the fire fees are gonna increase the amount of money available to the fire department, but it's not gonna result in more services or more staffing? No, it's it's going to if you will, it's going to help uh, recover the cost it takes to provide those services, the inspecting services, for example. So that was to me a main driver to come and increase those fees because in order to, the goal was to, if you will, true up the cost recovery to those services. So fire chief, will we get more firefighters as a result of giving you millions of dollars more in fire fees? That is not budgeted that way. No. Okay. I'm gonna have to go back to college and learn, learn math again because I'm not. <laughs> seeing that's, the, why I'm, that's why I'm confused. The equation work out. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I, I don't have a, a clear picture. If we are seeing an increase of revenues to cover the fire inspections, we were gonna have to pay for the fire inspections either way. Now we see an increase in the revenues. So wouldn't that increase the budget to be able to provide whatever additional staff we may need? We're bringing Dane in to help We're explain. Yeah. Let me, Jane, do you have like a, a picture kind of drawing that you can walk us through and, you know. I wish I had a whiteboard. Um, I wish I had a whiteboard. No, the, when, when the fees were increased, the fees were increased specifically to pay for the inspections because that was, that was the motivation behind, behind those, those fee increases. But understand that the fire department as a whole does not bring in enough revenue to support itself. So all of those revenues will stay in the fire department and they will go to support the, the inspection function. They were not meant to fund any additional firefighters or any additional fire service because that's not what those fees are supposed to do. And in fact, we can only charge um, a reasonable fee for the cost of providing the service, which is the inspection. And so that's all we can do. We, we can't charge an extra fee to, to, to pay for more firefighters because that's not a part of the inspection service. And, and so all of those monies will stay in the fire, fire department but as a whole and the, and the budget for, for the entire fire department doesn't support itself anyway. And so all those monies will stay there, but it's not going to result in any additional fire service. It will simply pay for the inspection services that it's meant to pay for. And that's why you increase the fees. So, so that it would be, a, I guess, a full cost recovery or near full, full cost recovery chief. I think that's how it was presented. Okay. <laughs> And what it would do then is lessen the general fund, if you will, the other revenues from having to pay for that inspection. It, it's, it's not a simple concept. And uh, again, I wish I had a white. All right. Well, Councilwoman Soria still has the floor. If she's done, okay. then we can go to Mike Carbasi next. Um, just uh, one additional question. Well, before I make my last question, I do want to figure out this whole squad situation um, within the budget that we are gonna be approving. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this council, that we can figure out a solution to that with the administration. Um, I know that over the next, over the coming weeks, we're gonna talk about, um, you know, the services that we provide for, for our residents and if there's opportunity to um, restructure or um, as we're having conversations of, you know, in terms of public safety, are there other folks more adequately um, that are more adequate in responding to certain issues? Like I brought up last um, last week, and I brought it up last year, um, the homeless task force, and how in other communities it's not police um, responding directly to moving the homeless and getting them the services that they need or connected to. Uh, but that is another, like in Long Beach, the there's the heart 
it's a squad of folks that are going out there with mental health folks um, to try to connect these people and get get these folks um, out of the street. Um, so I want this council to really think about that or think about a different model. And given the fact that we're gonna get these squads, maybe it's a perfect opportunity to pilot something different. Um, so um, I hope that you guys think about that. Lastly, I just wanted to ask about um, the, the utility usage. I know that in the last budget, I asked about the increase in utilities. And I know that as a city, we're looking at, um, at trying to figure out ways to reduce that, um, being um, having more energy efficiency projects. Have you guys done an analysis yet on your guys' departments and facilities or um, something that we're looking at? And then does the new station incorporate solar and so forth, which will hopefully help, could help offset some of those um, utility costs? I believe it does incorporate solar. And yes, we're working with Ann Clues to um, evaluate our fire stations and, and headquarters and ability to utilize solar there as well. We had discussed previously in council uh, bringing forth uh, an RFQ once it's let out for, I mean, ready for award that covers uh, a citywide program, which would include all of the public safety buildings as well as parks. Okay. I believe that is out on the street. I heard, I heard that the deadline was um, June 10th to be submitted. Um, can the council get a report on it, its next council meeting on that? Sure. So that we know where, where that's at. And I don't know if uh, any, we have council participation in your guys' um, process. Uh, we will you, be Jim? following our normal um, bid evaluation process. Okay, so if you can give us an update, that would be great. <laughs> Council Member Carbasi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Chief, before we finish, don't let me forget to ask you a question about Homeless Task Force. Council Member Sawyer brought up a good point. Um, I want to talk about uh, something you said. One more time, in the beginning of your presentation, you said that we are the lowest staff fire department in the state. You were the lowest staff metro fire department that serves a population uh, that we have, similar to what we have in the call volume we have in the state and likely the country. Okay. Um, so I have a bit of a heightened uh, level of concern on staffing. Part of it is that North Central uh, is a big chunk of my council district and we're under contract providing services out there. We have the bluff, which is susceptible to high risk grass fires, which can um, utilize a lot of our fire, uh, fire department apparatuses um, if there's a um, serious incident. So um, staffing to me is really important. Now, I do wanna briefly discuss what council member Soria brought up, because if I recall, it was the council meeting uh, back in March, I think 21st, where it was Council Member Bredefeld who made the motion and Council Member President Arias um, seconded it. So the opposites really attracted on this one because of staffing, how important it is. And we did it because we wanted the option um, to apply for a safer grant. Um, I'm a new council member. So for me, I just want to understand better. I'm a bit concerned because we clearly six to one supported um, applying for the grant. And I understand we don't wanna hurt our reputation with the other grant authority, but what's happened is the reputation is gonna be strained between the council and the administration. And it's really important to me, and I know it's important to people in the administration that we have a good relationship. I don't want that strained. I, I, before I came here, it was pretty strained and I'm trying to work to undo that, but forgive me. But to me, it's not acceptable to disregard the council's vote. If, you, if there's executive action, that's called a veto. There was no veto taken on this action. And I'm, if we're counting on revenue replacement from CARES money, and I hope that we don't spend too much of that money so that we won't be in the red. I know there's a, some concern about that. We no longer have the option to apply for a safer grant now because we missed the deadline. If we had followed the council's decision, we could have met that if the federal government decided to allow revenue replacement, then we would have had nine more firefighters and we could have been able to um, get through that. And I'm just gonna give you a quote from the treasury secretary um, regarding um, 
the concern about layoffs with, with fire and police. Um, he was asked by a Senator Van Holen and his response, uh, the Treasury Secretary's response was, well, I've recently provided guidance on the $150 billion we sent to the states and that they can use that money for police, fire, and first responders without restriction. So I hope there would be no layoffs as a result of that relief. That was our objective. So the mood of the Treasury Secretary and the feds when it comes to public safety is very supportive. So if we do get revenue relief, which I hope we do, um, we can't apply for the SABRE grant anymore. And that's just uh, very frustrating for me. If the chief of staff would like to comment or anyone. Tim, do you wanna address that this time? Yes, one of the factors I didn't mention going into this is even if we got $40 million of CARES Act for revenue replacement, mm -hmm. our five-year forecast shows us being $50 million in the red currently. So it would be hard to make that $56 million. Right. Now, from a fiscal standpoint, if we don't have the money for the grant, I can completely understand that. And that's totally fair. And I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, Jane brought that point in the, in the presentation last week. And I can accept that. But what bothers me is that we no longer have the option at all. Because we voted 6-1. A unilateral decision was made. I would have preferred a veto, frankly. Um, but this is where we are. And I just, I think that we need to work better at preserving the relationship because I think I have a great relationship with the administration. The council needs to have that relationship too. That's all I have to say. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, council member Carbasi, council member Chavez and then Esparza. Thank you. Hey chief, just wanted to thank you for the presentation. Uh, appreciate the updates you give uh, my office with regards to where the fires are occurring, um, calls for service. And I agree with you that you know, we, we, we are understaffed here in the city of Fresno. We're going to have to wrestle with that a little bit down the road. Um, the, the, the last thing is council member Corbasi asked a lot of the questions that I was going to ask is, and, and then I just want to put this on the administration's um, radar where, you know, the reason you're seeing this conversation happen is, and, and we all understand that we each have our perspective roles and what that looks like. But when the council votes six to one to give direction for a, a fiscal matter that affects the decisions and the tough decisions that we have to make here uh, on our end, it's important that we have that trust. And, and when that happens, um, you usually have council members, uh, rightly so, that want to put extra conditions, restrictions, and you know caveats that at times can make the managerial um, of the city's work um, difficult. So I, I'm not interested in apologies. Um, I'm more interested in ensuring that this doesn't happen because I don't want to see a reaction from our body where, where we are, you know, kind of going into that lane, but we also need the administration to be respectful. Uh, that was a policy decision that was made. Um, and, and like I said, I'm not interested in, in apologies. I just want to make sure that we ensure that that that's very clear. Um, and, and, and if we get into the territory of making executive decisions, then that's going to go both ways. Um, and it's not going to be good for anybody, right? Because we're in a situation now where that actually took place. And now because a decision that was given direction wasn't made, now we have to make tougher decisions that on our end, you know, will be a little bit more difficult as policymakers. Um, so I just want to put that on the record. Um, I too have a great relationship with all my colleagues with the administration. I want to keep it that way, um, but we need to make sure that we trust each other um, with the work that we, each of our respective bodies have to make. Thank you. Councilmember Sparza, you have the floor. Yeah, I'll uh, want to go to thank the chief uh, again. You do a, a lot with the with what is provided to you uh, here monetarily, uh, fiscally uh, in our budget. Um, you know, I want to echo the sentiment of my, my colleagues, uh, just in terms of would have loved the opportunity to, to apply for the safer grant. Um, you know, we're the, not only the policy making body as mentioned by council member for Chavez, we're also the, uh, the money allocating body. Right. And, and for me, right. Even in, in spite of a pandemic and a recession, uh, you know, this department is one certainly worth uh, investing in, right. And, and having those supplemental resources, we, we, we could have potentially uh, been awarded. So I want to go ahead and echo that, that sentiment. The fire department, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Chief, but when I asked you last year, in the last year's budget, 
I mean, it doesn't uh, make a whole lot of sense to be able to sort of add incrementally, right? If you add a one sworn uh, position, safety sworn position, I mean, it's really you have to add three in, in threes, I think, to increase your minimum daily staffing by one. Is that correct? Correct. That's correct. Yeah. So, you know, this is one of those departments where that incrementalism is, is you know, has a very little to no impact. You have to be able to increase the minimum daily staffing uh, three positions at a time and Saber Grant would have been a tremendous opportunity. Um, Chief, when it comes to your vacancies, I think you said uh, those nine, uh, seven were uh, were safety sworn and two were inspectors. Correct. Is, is, that, a, is that a pretty regular revolving amount of vacancies or, or uh, are you having trouble filling positions or is that uh, or is that just sort of what the circumstances right now? What's the sort of revolving number? That's about right. That's about the, the attrition rate. Um, when we have vacancies, though, we, we can't just have a recruit school for five people. We would have a recruit school for probably a minimum of nine uh, because it costs, you know, quite a bit of change to, to do that. So uh, that's why we are trading down in the relief pool. Originally, it started at six, six and nine. And, and now, well, as of July, it'll be probably three, three, and two. Okay, so 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 we're not seeing any sort of extraordinary amount of vacancy rates. It's kind of it, it's been consistent. There hasn't been too much of an impact. Correct. Okay. All right, Chief. Well, uh, that was just my only question. Again, I've, you've been answering a lot of uh, a lot of good questions throughout, throughout the course of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Bradfield, do you have the floor? Yes, Chief, uh, I want to first thank you for you and your department and all that you do to make us safe. Um, I want to ask you something about the safer grant that we had all talked about. If that had been applied, if we had applied for it as directed by the council, it was my motion seconded by um, Co Council President Arias, what would that have meant if, uh, to your department if we had gotten that uh, passed and accepted? Well, we would have increased the staffing um, by three on each day. We would have hired nine. Um, and we would have had uh, one safety officer, which was one of the last pieces of the start report we haven't fully committed to, uh, completed. And we would have implemented a two person squad. Okay, so nine firefighters, a safety officer, and completed the recommendations from the report that you said that's 95% completed. So this, this council, uh, said we need to move in that direction. Uh, you, I know, have been pushing and fighting to, to add more staff. Obviously, you need it. We are down comparative to every other city. And this council took an administrative action, a legislative action, not administrative, a legislative action to apply for that safer grant. Um, and uh, this administration decided not to tell anybody on the city council and just to say, well, we've made a decision not to do that. Uh, that uh, usurps the entire role of city government, the entire role of city government. And frankly, an apology from the chief of staff means nothing to me that the chief of staff, the mayor, should apologize to every firefighter that works for you that is now more unsafe because we didn't apply for nine more firefighters. That's where the apology belongs, uh, in addition to the city council. Uh, council also, as is expressed in some some gibberish from the administration regarding fees this council sets the policy if we want those fees that have been approved and adopted into the fire department budget i think we all did that with the understanding that firefighters would be higher the council makes those decisions um, they can decide that it goes into the fire department budget and find another way to uh, re, uh, exit those fees for other things, but we decide where that money goes. If we want to hire firefighters, we should make sure that that is what is done with those funds. Uh, and I certainly supported those fees with the understanding we were going to help the chief uh, hire staff uh, so that we are at levels that we need to be. So I want to encourage the council not to be um, uh, fooled by the double talk, double speak, and bureaucratic speak that we get. Uh, if we want to use those fees for firefighters, that's what we ought to do. Uh, if we've been subsidizing inspection fees before, we can continue to subsidize inspection fees and use those fees, the new fees that are coming in from inspection fees to hire firefighters. That's up to us. 
That's what we're elected to do. So I think that's what my expectation is we're going to hire firefighters. That's what's needed. And we need to do that in consult in consultation with our fire chief. Uh, lastly, in terms of the fact that the safer grant was ignored, we didn't have the opportunity to hire any firefighters. And the mayor, I guess, his city manager, and I guess the uh, chief of staff decided to ignore the legislative action by the city council. The city council during this budget ought to look at the mayor's budget and determine what, how many firefighters we need and start cutting from the mayor's budget to put those uh, numbers that we cut into fire. I'm more interested in putting firefighters out there than a bloated uh, uh, department in the mayor's office. So I think if we're gonna get serious, it's not enough to just be annoyed and irritated about uh, uh, the administration ignoring council legislative action. Um, I would like to ask the uh, city attorney, city attorney, what options are there available for the council when the administration completely violates their duties and ignores legislative action by the city council? Well, ultimately, the council's authority is over the purse strings. The council controls the budget and funding for each department and could take action, as you mentioned. That's it. Is there anything else? Uh, for, if it were a specific thing, the council could ask the city attorney to file an action in Superior Court to require uh, the administration to perform uh, an obligation. Okay. Well, I just would say to the council that I think when we do deal with this budget, we ought to look at the mayor's budget, and I have no problem cutting uh, that department at all and hiring firefighters as they should have done. And I think if we're going to get serious, uh, that's the message we ought to send. Thanks. Thank you, council member. I'm willing to support your idea of we include the city manager's department and apologize after we take the action. Council member Carbossi. Okay, well, I, I really do hope, uh, and despite what was just said by the sponsor of the original uh, motion from in March, we can move forward and work something out and not have this happen again. Um, I was gonna mention chief, going back to you. Um, I forgot to mention another level of my urgency for fire response in, in, in my district, uh, district two. Um, in the annual report in 2019, in addition to talking about North Central and the, the possibility for bad brush fires, which has happened before, um, stations north of Shaw had an effective firefighting force effectiveness rating of 60% in 2019. Mm -hmm. So it's another reason why I am concerned. This is not a criticism on the department. We're, we're, we have if the resources are what they are. It's challenging. So we, we really need to increase our, our forces. And that's why I support, I supported the safer grant. Um, homeless task force. Um, I, I'm glad that we're going to start having this discussion about homeless task force. I, I would like you to be involved if we're talking about using the fire department, any component of that. Um, I think Long Beach has done that and I understand that, but there still is a safety issue. Um, and I, I hope this is one of the issues that that former council member Oliver Baines's committee looks at and comes up with reforms because I'm, I'm interested in, in, in a solution, but I don't want to just be hasty and do something at the risk to the public. Um, last Friday, unfortunately, there was a tragic shooting in East Central Fresno um, in a homeless encampment along the uh, freeway. So the risk to a social worker going on scene, while we should have social workers, there still is a risk, unfortunately, it's unpredictable. We have to plan for the worst case scenario. So I don't want our firefighters being at risk too because they don't have uh, protective equipment um, mm -hmm. from someone that has a gun. So um, I hope that you will be involved and you're interested in being involved in that discussion. Yeah. Chief. Just, a call, just a quick note on the Long Beach. Um, <laughs> I, I have looked into the Long Beach um, heat. I think it's called heat or uh, heart, 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 heart. Thank you. Um, they, uh, they are paramedics, which is a little bit different. We used to have a paramedic program in, in the department, but those are paramedics and, and they can, um, do some other things that EMTs, which is what our staff is, um, can do. Um, I, I would enjoy being a part of that conversation. Um, the, there is an issue, a concern of, we, we don't have protective equipment when it comes to uh, body armor. That's something we've applied for in grants and other opportunities, but um, you know, we'll just have to have the discussion and, and see if it's the right fit to have fire involved in that. And, and if so, to what level. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Council Members. Um, Chief, I do have my set of questions around this. Um, can you walk me through the, the total amount of the safer grant 
what would it have been if we would have uh, received it over multiple years? Um, the safer grant. Uh, It would have been about a million dollars the first year, um, and that would include the drill school. Uh, and then it would have been, by the time you got to year five, it would have been a 1.5 ongoing, the cost for nine new positions. So it was 6.6 .6 million over the first five years. And, and Jane went over that in, on Tuesday's presentation. Um, federal money or the match from local? Pardon me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, State Manager, but I want to want clarity. How, how much money at the federal level do we leave on the table by not applying for it? Oh, well, um, I'm going to estimate much? around a million dollars a year, at least, or a million, million and a half. Okay. Thank you. Mike, Mike, do you happen to have that? Mike Getty, our budget. We're, we're looking at it in here. Go ahead, Mike. Morning, Council. Mike Getty, Business Manager for Fire Department. Um, as far as a safer grant, they reimburse us at 75% the first year, 75% the second year, and 35% of cost the third year. So if we're looking at a cost of normally one and a half million a year, we're looking at 75% of that number the first year, 75% uh, the second year, and 35% the third year. Thank you. Um, Fire Chief. Since we didn't receive the safer grant, what's your plan and how are you going to fund the final um, recommendations being adopted from the report? We are really on, on hold. We, we have um, submitted some recommendations to utilize CARES funny, money to improve some communications. Uh, that is one, one piece uh, that we would like to finish in the SART report. The safety officer, we have our training staff kind of play double duty during the day. If they're not involved in a training drill or an assignment, then they can peel off from what they're doing and run out to a fire call and, and, and be the safety officer. However, that is, isn't efficient after, let's say, 5.30 at night. So then we have an extra battalion chief respond to the call. Um, so at this point, the full implementation of the recommendations is on hold? Yes. Until when? <laughs> Until funding is available. When do you plan to recommend funding request to implement the full report? Well, we've been doing that every year at budget. We've asked for a safety officer in the last three years. So um, city manager, is, is there going to be a recommendation to fully fund those positions in September or is your intention that it be a status quo budget for the fire department? No, it's not our intention um, that it be status quo for the fire department. But at, at, as soon as we know the, care, the CARES dollars and the plan for the 92 million, if there's another relief package that comes to the city, the whole intent of asking for a continuing resolution for three months was to us, for us to take a deeper look at each department once we knew the, tr the true COVID impact. And, and Carrie and I have been working for quite some time to check off those uh, recommendations from that report. We just have not had the funding. And you all know there's competing needs in every single department. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Fire Chief, where are you at with medical calls? Is, is it still um, the thinking that we'll continue to have the fire department respond to medical calls as we have yeah. been historically? Yeah. Yes, I do. Um, we're looking at it opportunity if we could introduce some priority to medical calls back into the system however we just aren't at that capacity we we're we're not ready to introduce those yet if we were to have squads i think there's a lot more opportunity to to do that how, how much COVID funding have you submitted for reimbursement already i'm going to say uh, approximately I don't know, 400, 500,000, Mike, and do you have a, a better, a better number? Uh, labor about 360,000 and about another 120,000 in uh, uh, PPE okay. and sanitation material. Ha has your calls for, um, has your fires increased this year compared to last year? You know, our, our, our fire calls have gone up um, quite almost 59% uh, year to date from last year. 
there was a dip in medical calls as soon as COVID started, but uh, that has that has gone back up. Okay. Um, and then my last question for you, um, Fire Chief, is um, as people have talked about reimagining, you know, public safety, and it's been a focus around police um, more recently. Is it time for us to reimagine um, and revisit your deployment model? Is it time for firefighters to go home after their shift every night versus staying overnight for three days? You know, we we have looked at, uh, we have had a, a deployment model, model that was once one day on, two days off. Uh, the current two days on, four days off schedule is um, been very effective. Uh, I believe you asked the question um, last year uh, about going to 12 hour shifts. We did the analysis on that as well. Uh, we'd be happy to share that with you, but to, to make that work, you would have to hire 80 firefighters and that doesn't improve your minimum daily staffing. So uh, I, I am fine with the current um, two days on, four days off model. Um, we, we don't have a problem having people um, sign up to work extra shifts and to fill the vacancies to ensure that we have a butt in every seat for those 80 positions daily. Chief, in your analysis, um, does it give us more financial efficiency? Um, I know we have to add more staff, but is it more cost efficient for us to go to the 12 hour shift model? Not at all, not at all. So it doesn't save us money and it doesn't speed up response times. It does not, it does not. Perfect. Well, thank you for looking into that. That's been a conversation from a lot of public safety folks is, you know, is it time for us to, you know, do 12 hour shifts and send people home versus, you know, having them stay overnight, pay the cost of their overnight plus overtime. Um, with that chief, the only other thing I, I have for this is, you know, when, um, this is more for the city manager and the mayor. During this conversation around continuing resolution, uh, you guys have asked the council for a, a significant Significant level of trust to allow you to continue spending at the current rate and not, not require any need budget for the transition. And that requires significant amount of trust. We finally reached a compromise where we would get some level of basic and I would say elementary level budget presentations, you know, elementary level information. And it is dumbfounding to um, see that you intentionally kept us out of the loop in such a significant decision because from my perspective and me as an individual when i voted to raise the fees for new construction and inspections it was on the condition that we wouldn't leave any money on the table at the federal level that we're going to do what we could to pull federal resources down state resources before and at the same time as we raise local fees um, it's been the same conversation for me around a local tax before you go to voters and increase their costs, make sure you pull down as much federal and state money. And um, I find it completely, um, you know, um, disappointing is not strong enough. Uh, uh, I am frankly pissed at the fact that it took this budget, budget hearing for you guys to be upfront with us and that you had to be probed for you to tell us. And quite frankly, I don't think I was the only one that was blindsided today. I think it's fair to say that a lot of other folks on this video call were also blindsided by the unilateral decision that you made in circumventing the council's authority, which is crystal clear on charter. So um, I would ask that if you've made other decisions, you disclose those decisions and those unilateral decisions in your presentation up front. You don't wait for us to probe you. You don't wait for the budget, the departments to come forward. Because as, as far as I'm concerned, we did. we did, we shared that on Tuesday when we rolled out, when Jane did the presentation, that's in your PowerPoint. But city manager, the, the decision sure and the direction was, what we did not the city manager, the direction was given in March, not Tuesday. It was given in March. And quite frankly, from you've lost me in the conversation to grant your continued resolution based on this action. So the trust that we've built thus far completely got burned after today's blind sight. So we're gonna have to spend the next few days trying to rebuild that. But from this point on, I'm not gonna sign off on continued resolutions unless the departments are fully transparent with where they are on budgets and decisions that we've made and direction that we've given. 
So um, with that, I'll go to my council colleagues. Councilwoman Soria, you have the floor. Then Bradfield, Carbasi, then Ms. Barza. Council President, I believe I was uh, first. Council Member Barza, you have the floor. Yeah, I just wanted to ask the administration, uh, you know, I think it, there was a reference about potential future applications. What is, what is, is there a solid time frame on the next opportunity to apply for such a grant? Can you answer, can you answer what the cycle is for the safer grant, please? I would expect uh, the next one to open up anywhere between uh, December and March of 21. December and March of 21, okay. December of this year, March of 21. So it's a bit of a ways off. Um, you know, and, and you know, in light of uh, us missing this opportunity, obviously we're not, you know, we've lost the opportunity to sort of tangibly uh, and cost effectively, uh, you know, bring on nine more positions. But I, I do want to uh, make a motion. I hope my colleagues will support uh, a motion to uh, add three uh, sworn positions in the fire department. Uh, again, that's that's doing the bare minimum, right? You know, um, in terms of increasing minimum daily staffing, uh, three rank specific uh, firefighters, uh, one on duty uh, per shift. Uh, so if I can get a second on that motion, and I don't have a funding source yet, maybe we'll we'll look into COVID dollars. Uh, we'll look at reallocation of our budget, uh, but I would like to get that in the queue uh, for consideration. Your motion second by Councilor Bredefield and myself and whoever you want. Thanks. Is that it, Councilor Barza? Thank you. Yes, that'll be it. All right, Councilor Bredefield. Yes, I'd like to make a motion if I could. I'd like to make a motion to remove $1 million from the uh, mayor's and city manager's office and move that to the fire department. And then the council will decide what to do with that money in terms of hiring firefighters. I'll second. Second. All right, council, uh, second from Councilmember Sparza. Councilwoman Soria, you have the floor if Councilmember Butterfield's complete. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, um, just something came to mind. So we were given, you know, the federal relief dollars and trying to figure out how we get created and if we're reimagining how we provide services to address the homeless encampments and, you know, having fire be a possibility, uh, to be able to to shift um, kind of the, the responsibility. Obviously, if there is a need for for police to respond, like if there's some kind of emergency, you know, I I, I said that you know that's what we should be looking at. But is there an opportunity for us to look at how these federal funds can can at least help us and in the short term look at some cost savings within our general fund because the COVID nineteen would cover this given the fact that we we are trying to um, make sure that we are halting the spread of COVID by going out and making sure that these, you know, encampments don't get too big and so forth to try to minimize that spread. Um, I don't know if the administration is thinking about that, but I, I want us to get creative and, and use this as opportunity again um, rather than continue to do the same, provide our services in a different way and utilize and capitalize on the moment that we do have some right now federal dollars that can at least allow us in, the, in this remainder fiscal year and a little bit of the next fiscal year, the opportunity to reduce the use of federal, of our general funds because we'd have those COVID-19 dollars. So. I put that out there. I want us to get creative. We have a few weeks, obviously, before the vote on the, continue, the continuing resolution. I don't know where it will land. It may be a case where the council will have to approve its own budget. Um, but I, I really want to hear from you, Dave, and let's continue to have this conversation to figure out um, how we can, can do that. All right, council. If that's it, Councilman Carbasi, you have the floor. Oh, thank you. Um, okay. Um, I'm pretty disappointed myself in what's happened and um, the breakdown uh, with the decision that was disregarded by the council. But I, I don't want us to take continuing resolution off the table. Um, I really ask my colleagues to keep an open mind. These are still really unprecedented times uh, fiscally for our city. Um, and we still have a responsibility to pass a balanced budget, uh, meet the needs of our residents by continuing to provide access to core city services at adequate levels. 
Um, let's not be reactive. Um, I, I'm pretty upset. Um, but let's be even keeled. Let's move forward and we can take the high road. And I think this council should do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Carbasi. With that, we're going to go to public comment. You will get a minute to address the council on public comment, and then we're going to end the session and come back after lunch for the police budget. Uh, Lisa Flores, you have a minute to address the council. Okay, here's the questions I have. Um, what is the fire department's expected impact with the second wave of COVID? How is that going to hit you financially, and do you need more money? I'm also very distressed that um, the department is not only underfunded, but that the city council is, um, city staff is um, basically willfully disobedient to the direct direction of the council. If you don't like doing your job, then quit. Um, also too, there is an opportunity for us to take some of the bloat out of the police department and give it to those people that actually do, do a positive impact to the community, which is the fire department. And I thank you for saving my life. Um, and how hard would it be for the potential, if there's a potential layoff in police officers, um, how hard would it be to transfer them over to become firefighters? Thank you. Thank you. Next person is Ivanka. Ivanka, you are now unmuted and allowed to address the council for a minute. Thank you, uh, Chief Donis. The first thing I just want to say is um, these are really dire numbers and Fire does not discriminate by district, so this really needs to be looked at completely together, um, all the districts and what we all need. Um, and a lot of the older communities, my concern is the bigger picture of climate change and how hot fires are. I come from Northern California, Sonoma, Lake, and Mendocino counties. Um, and also, what is it that the council can do to actually look at and focus on how to become compliant with the amount of fire stations um, per household or per square footage, whatever is the actual amount that would be um, considered the correct amount. Um, and also, I do agree with the motions you guys have come together and made today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next person is Carolina Garza de Luna. You are me to have a minute to address council. Yes, I want to thank the council for how they've responded, and I hope that we will see a follow through. Thank you to Chief Jonas. I would ask that Chief Jonas please consider and be a leader in looking into the Sunnyvale Police Department and the police chief who is more than willing to speak um, about uh, public safety officers versus police officers. In Sunnyvale, California, for example, the roles of police officer and firefighter are combined. Sunnyvale's basic training includes a 26 police academy week, 18 weeks of police field training, 12 week fire academy, and six weeks of EMS. And they have a 100,000 population, which is different from Fresno. However, there are full partial and nominal integration models. And perhaps the homeless task force is where we can start. But we are having a hard time reimagining safety. You do not always answer by police force. Um, and we have to really be creative. And I hope, um, Chief, that you will join us. Thank you. And our last speaker is Kimberly McCoy. Uh, Kimberly, you are unmuted. Thank you, no. Council President. My name is Kimberly McCoy, Fresno Building Healthy Communities Project Director. As I listen to the City Council meetings this morning and hear the presentation from the Fire Department, I am very upset and troubled that the city refused to go after a safe grant that the under the direction of the city council to provide more fire fighters for this department. This department is underfunded and this is the opportunity for us to move more funds to this department and other departments like infrastructure and parks department. Um, like other people have said and made comments, safe safety is not always responded by police. Uh, we have our fire department who responds. And um, I just think that um, I support the measures, the motions that were made today, especially the motion to take $1 million from the mayor's budget and move it over to the fire department to provide additional staffers for this department. Thank you. Thank you. And that ends our public comment for today. Um, Chief Donis, um, I do want to personally apologize um, to you for this um, budget experience. It's not something that none of us expected. And um, hopefully we can avoid this kind of experience um, for the future department presentations. 
thank you for your time and for being fully transparent and honest in your assessment. Thank you all. We'll see you after lunch at 1.30. Thank you. members back online you can pop up your video so we can confirm everyone is as a pulse and you're who you represent yourself to be on zoom all right here we go it's a nice background council member Sparza. my my council background thank you so we're waiting for council member carbosti and council Soria come online and we'll begin the continuation of our budget presentation. Um, City Manager and IT, can you confirm that our police department's ready yes. and patched in? I don't see their video, videos up. No, it's fine. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Uh, Chief Hall? Okay, yes, he's, he's here. Can do you have audio over there? Can you unmute yourself? What happened to the audio? How about now? Can you hear me? Okay, we can hear you now. Chief, when we get Councilwoman Soria online, then we'll hand over the floor to you. Very good, thank you. Oh, the breakouts only going to be the only situation. All right, Chief Hall, looks like we might be ready to go. If you want to turn on your video and your audio, we will proceed with the City of Fresno Police Department budget presentation. Uh, Chief, you have the floor. Chief, you just got to unmute yourself and then start over. We didn't hear any of it. All right, how's that? Perfect, we can hear you. Great. Well, good afternoon, Council President, Council Members. Uh, my name is Chief Andrew Hall with the Fresno Police Department. And I'm going to give you a quick overview of the uh, police department and uh, its, its functions. I'd like to start with uh, kind of giving you just a, uh, a uh, 30,000 foot level of crime in our city. Uh, currently, violent crime uh, year to date is down 12% in our city, and property crimes are down 7%. Uh, there are some disturbing trends that we're starting to see, however, and they include uh, shooting incidents. This is where somebody's either shot or a property or a house is hit with a bullet. Um, those incidents are up 33%. This is uh, really uh, been no most noticeable since the uh, start of the COVID pandemic. Um, 45 to 50% of these shootings involve gang members. Uh, robberies are up about 10% in our city and stabbings are up about 11%. And although homicides are down by about a third compared to last year at this time, 25% of those homicides occurred within the last 10 days. We've had four murders in the last 10 days in our city. 
Let's go to the next slide. This is an overview of our org chart. Um, it's all under the uh, uh, direction of the chief of police. We have uh, four divisions, each uh, commanded by a deputy chief. We have the administrative division under Deputy Chief Lydia Carrasco, the support division under the command of Deputy Chief Mike Reed, the patrol division under the command of Bill Cooley, and the investigation division under the command of Pat Farmer. We are currently authorized 1,145 positions, 1,145. Of those, 826 are sworn police officers. We have 309 civilian staff and 10 academy trainees. We currently um, are experiencing 92 vacancies in the Fresno Police Department. 27 of these vacancies are sworn police officers, and five of those vacancies are academy cadet vacancies. We also have an additional 45 civilian vacancies at the police department. I'll go through them real quick because I know one of the council members was asking. Uh, 10 of those are dispatchers. Seven of those are records personnel. Two of them are in the training unit. One is uh, in our IT department. We have two vacancies with our community service officers. We have three vacancies in our property evidence <laughs> technicians. We have one crime analyst vacancy, two background investigator vacancies, and 17 cadet vacancy positions. A lot of our non-sworn uh, staff vacancies are created when we converted uh, <coughs> positions. I believe we converted 30 temporary positions to full-time equivalent, and we were in the process of hiring those 16 positions uh, when the uh, when the freeze was established. How many vacancies sworn did you say, Chief? 27 sworn vacancies <coughs> currently. Thank you. Uh, we also, in addition to that, we have uh, 15 frozen positions which we cannot fill in our budget. Those frozen positions include 10 cadet positions and five community service officer positions. So this brings our actual complement of personnel to 799 sworn police officers and 254 civilian personnel. Now I want you to keep in mind that 10 years ago, uh, we had 849 police officers policing the city of Fresno and over 450 civilian staff. In addition to that, we have positions that are outside of the general fund. These are positions that are paid for by a different agency or, or um, different department. And I don't have a lot of control of those because they're not, they're not under my control. They are paid for by an outside agency. So they become under the control of those agencies. And we, ha we heard uh, the fact uh, give their presentation and kind of talked about the 12 positions that they have assigned to them. They report directly to that fact, and that's their priority. So if fact does call, they get priority service uh, with those officers. And these officers are 66 of these officers inside the Fresno Police Department that are outside of our general fund. This includes school resource officers, facts officers, uh, AB 109 probation, uh, funding sanitation officers, uh, cold case uh, investigators for sexual assaults, um, housing authority, and the ABC grants. We also have six civilian staff members who are funded outside of our general fund. These include one from the ABC probation grant funding, four at our regional training center, and one gang violence prevention personnel. To uh, make it uh, even more difficult to police this city. We have 66 sworn police officers who are out on long-term injuries. Now these are injuries that uh, they sustained either on duty or off duty. Some um, are recovering from illnesses such as cancer, uh, but they are not available to assign at this time. Uh, we also have 13 civilian staff who are on long-term absences. This brings our total sworn available staffing currently at 671 employees. And this doesn't include annual vacation, doesn't include sick, sick leave, family leave, or other personal time off. To keep that in perspective, um, our available staff, unrestricted staff assigned to the Fresno Police Department, if we were at full staffing, would be 1.4 police officers per thousand 
unrestricted officers in the city of Fresno. This compares to the national average of 2.2 officers per thousand. And that's consistent with the state of California as well for large cities. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is, uh, um, we're gonna go by each division right now. I'm gonna allow the deputy chiefs of each division and, uh, and their accomplishments. So we'll start with deputy chief Lydia Carrasco under the administrative support or administrative division. Deputy chief, maybe allow me to interrupt you just for the public notice. We will be taking public comment after the chief hall's presentation, and then we will return it to council questions after the public comment. Thank you, chief. Muted. Can you hear me? Yes, you come up here. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Council President and Council Members. My name is Lydia Carrasco, Deputy Chief over the Administrative Division. And I'm going to go over the functions of all of the units and bureaus in the Administrative Division. Currently, there are six bureaus or units in the Administrative Division. I'm going to start with the Internal Affairs Bureau. Uh, that consists of nine personnel total, one lieutenant, five sergeants, one officer, and two non sworn members of the court staff. And their responsibilities, and this list is not all inclusive. Uh, what I've done is uh, prepared a list of the essential duties that are performed by each unit and bureau. Uh, their primary responsibility is to think about internal affairs investigations. Uh, they're responsible for uh, preparing the uh, early alert, and uh, that is a program that we have that identifies officers that have multiple incidents, uh, whether it's internal affairs investigations, multiple incidents, uh, collision, uh, issues that are found to be outside of policy uh, that identify uh, an officer that uh, there could be potential concerns with. Um, and it's a, uh, designed to be a system to allow intervention uh, before uh, the officer becomes uh, an issue for the department. Um, they also uh, review all risk claims received by the uh, city uh, in reference to uh, claims against the Fresno Police Department. Uh, the staff is responsible for compiling internal affairs statistics and preparing quarterly reports on those statistics. Uh, they liaison with the uh, city attorney's office as well as outside law enforcement agencies. They assist in the, the uh, processing and uh, production of information subject to public records access request uh, pursuant to Senate 1421 or Assembly Bill 748 uh, relative to uh, confidential documents. They review and track all informal complaints and inquiries. Uh, they liaison with uh, outside sure. counsel, uh, whether that's uh, attorneys representing the department on cases. Libby, can you speak up just a little bit? Or uh, dealing with attorneys representing officers on cases. Uh, we also liaison with the Office of Independent Review. They manage the department's blue team. The blue team is a program used to track all receipt of complaints that, that are received, as well as uses of force uh, by department members, um, as well as uh, tracking uh, IAs and internal affairs investigations in the IA Pro program that tracks every single internal affairs investigation. They also conduct training for new sergeants in conducting internal affairs investigations, as well as uh, presenting uh, to new officers and new officer orientation. So that covers the IA Bureau. Moving on to the policy and procedure unit. Uh, that unit is made up of one sergeant. And uh, his responsibility is to maintain and update department policy, which is an ongoing uh, project. Uh, use of Power DMS, which is the program the department uses to put out the training policies to all department members. And we not only put out 
department policy, but uh, also officers or all employees are required to sign off for policy that they've received uh, and some training that they've received uh, related to pursuits of the CLEP system, et cetera. Uh, we liaison with Lexipol. Uh, Lexipol is uh, the company we contract with that gives us our department policy uh, for the entire uh, police department. They, they're uh, recognized nationally for putting out a department policy to law enforcement agencies nationwide. Uh, he reviews uh, uses of force or use the force report and uh, prepares uh, reports that are forwarded to the Department of Justice. He reports, report, prepares quarterly and annual use of force reports. Uh, he liaisons with the city's uh, ADA compliance officer to ensure the department is uh, ADA compliant. Conducts audits of the police department uh, when necessary to ensure ADA compliance. Uh, he assists the Department of Justice in conducting audits for our juvenile custody facilities uh, here at the police department. And then he also conducts training for new sergeants on the above. Uh, the next unit is the body camera unit. That is made up of one sergeant and three officers. And the responsibility of that unit is we have the UAV coordinator. Uh, UAV is the uh, drone uh, unmanned aerial vehicle coordinator. Uh, they're responsible for maintaining and updating the department's 556 body-worn cameras and associated equipment that's issued, the docking stations, the mounting equipment. Uh, they're responsible for updating the body-worn camera-related department policies. Uh, they conduct audits uh, for equipment function and body-worn camera use to make sure our police officers are, in fact, using their cameras when they're supposed to. They liaison with the DA concerning uh, video evidence or the filing of cases on an as-needed basis. They ensure when they're doing audits uh, that body-worn camera video is properly labeled. Uh, whenever an officer activates their body-worn camera, they're required to label it as such. Uh, they're also responsible for the entire department's cell phones, and those are the phones that are issued to department members that have phones or tablets. Uh, they conduct a video redaction on some PRA requests that are made of the department. And they're also responsible for the inventory and replacement of the department's handheld radios that are issued to department personnel. Moving on to the personnel bureau, this consists of 14 personnel total, one lieutenant, two sergeants, eight officers, and three support. Their responsibility is the recruitment and hiring of personnel to include the background investigation, polygraph exam, medical, and the psych uh, for sworn personnel. They oversee the field training program, a new recruit that are hired, the cadet program. They attend recruiting events, uh, specifically trying to seek underrepresented demographics for our police department. Uh, they were attending four to six recruiting events until the COVID pandemic. Uh, everyone started canceling their events, so we haven't been to an event uh, since late March. They liaison with the city's personnel department and the city attorney's office uh, regarding hiring, separation, important action. They oversee the uh, workers' compensation program uh, to include participating in the interactive process for employees, providing reasonable accommodations, and ensuring ADA compliance. They track all of the department's long-term absences. They liaison with risk management regarding employee and workplace safety, drug testing, uh, work comp issues, as well as the issuance of uh, work permits. They plan and coordinate department swearing in ceremonies, promotional ceremonies, and major accommodation ceremonies. They oversee the department's corporal testing and selection process. Corporals are the field training officers in the field to train new recruits and they liaison with labor groups regarding personnel matters relative to MOU issues. They issue 
concealed weapons permit to retired officers. We also have a concealed weapons permit coordinator for the city of Fresno that processes all applicants in the city of Fresno seeking a concealed weapons permit. The liaison with posts regarding the annual post audit is one of our departments, as well as making multiple inquiries to ensure that the department is within post compliance. They process post certification applications. They track the probationary status of all probationary employees in the department. They review all requests for acting limited or provisional appointments in the department. Process requests for reclassification of positions. They act as a resource for supervisors and managers on dealing with personnel issues in the department. They also liaison with Fresno City College and COS Police Academies, as these are the academies where we send cadets to attend the police academy. The next unit is the uh, training section. That consists of 16 total personnel, one lieutenant, two sergeants, 10 officers, and three non sworn support staff. The training section provides training for all personnel, as well as personnel from 27 outside agencies throughout the state. They train approximately 2,600 students per year. They're responsible for maintaining compliance with the post training mandate, ensuring all of our department personnel are trained to comply with the post mandate. They also conduct the trimester range training and annual range qualifications for Fresno State officers. They liaison with 20 outside agencies who currently use our regional training center for training. Those agencies include the Air National Guard, Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control, ATF, Department of Corrections, COVID-19, CDA, IRS, probation, secret service, to name a few. We present uh, train the trainer courses to outside agencies. We currently maintain certification on 58 post certified courses across the law enforcement statewide. And that's really important because what that means is that it, it allows our department to send our employees to post mandated training at our own regional training center. Uh, preventing the need to send them to out-of-town training courses at the department's expense. Uh, they maintain training records for all police department employees. They liaison with post on, on post standards and trends, certification of courses, compliance issues. Uh, they process training requests for employees needing to attend training. They process billing to outside agencies who use the facility or who attend training. Uh, they maintain the 78-acre training facility ground equipment maintenance, and we recently received a certification for a three-day firearms transition course uh, as we transition to a new firearm. I'm going to move on to the uh, Fiscal Affairs Bureau. Uh, that consists of seven non-sworn support staff one administrative manager, one senior account auditor, four account auditor two, and one accounting tech. Uh, their responsibilities are to create and manage the department's budget, manage accounts payable and receivable, process payroll for 1,145 employees, uh, resolve employee inquiries regarding payroll, leave balances, et cetera, track all department contracts, negotiate the contract and oversee and liaison with the department's janitorial service provider, uh, as well as liaison with several other service providers as relates to facility maintenance. Uh, moving on to the grants unit. That unit is made up of two support uh, personnel, uh, business manager and an MA2. Uh, their responsibility is to manage the department's 17 grants totaling 6.7 million. They prepare quarterly reports on all of those grants to present to the grant providers to ensure uh, compliance with the terms of the grants. They liaison with those grant funding agencies. And then uh, the business manager is the designated Granicus coordinator that reviews every council item for public content. 
uh, moving on to the employee services unit. Uh, that consists of one officer. He's the department's designated wellness coordinator. Uh, he liaisons with the Companion Officer Program and the Fresno Police Chaplaincy Program in providing support services to all of the police department's employees, both sworn and non-sworn. He responds 24-7 to critical incidents uh, involving our employees uh, to provide services to employees, and that's regardless of whether the employees are duty or off-duty. He plans and coordinates critical incident debriefings. Uh, he plans and coordinates department training on topics uh, related to employee wellness. Uh, he also frequently assists outside law enforcement agencies in starting employee wellness programs. And he conducts training on presentations, training presentations on officer wellness to new officers as well as to outside agencies. He's also the designated infectious control officer and uh, She's on my employees who are exposed to infectious diseases when they're on duty, for example, a needle stick. We also assist and provide services to all of our employees who've been exposed to COVID virus. That concludes the administrative report. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Carrasco. I'd like to now uh, ask uh, Deputy Chief. Uh, Mike Reed to come up and give uh, council an overview of the uh, support division. Good afternoon. Can you start the next slide, please? No, oh, you were on it. We're on support division. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Deputy uh, Chief, uh, Reed, if I may, my, may interrupt you, if you can just ask your folks to limit the background noise. We kind of hear all the paper shuffling and can't hear you guys clearly when you present. So try and freeze as you talk. So noted, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, council president, uh, members of council and staff. My name is Mike Reed. I am the deputy chief in charge of the support division and the support division has about 16 different units in three different sections or bureaus. So I'm gonna give you a high level overview of what that entails. Um, I'm also gonna give you some of the work product for 2019. So please feel free to ask me any questions during this. Uh, the support division, the three main legs of the, as you see in the org chart, are the Communications and Data Analysis Bureau. That's under Captain Gross, the Traffic Safety and Support Services section, which is Lieutenant Brogdon, and the Special Response section, which is Lieutenant Rowe. So I have commanders for each. There are a total of 328 FTEs in this division. Uh, just as a comparison, I believe Fresno Fire had around 346 full-time equivalents. So roughly the same size. Of those, the sworn are 113 FTEs and the civilians are 215. In addition, under my division, I also have collateral duty responsibilities. You see that in the org chart as our emergency response teams. I have a total of 151 people that have collateral duties, which means they have a primary assignment. And when a special need comes up, then we come in and bring those folks together. Uh, I also have volunteers under my division, and those fall into three typical categories. The first one is reserve officers. We have 20 reserve officers, which are voluntary non-paid positions. We also have 44 citizens on police. Uh, those are people that go through a pretty rigorous training and volunteer for us. And the last ones are 20 volunteers in policing. So the total number of individuals under this command and the support division is 563. So I'm going to give you a little bit about each one. Again, please feel free to ask questions. First thing we're going to talk about is the communications section. This has one lieutenant that manages that, six supervisors, and 99 authorized positions. We're currently carrying 10 vacancies in that area. A communications section is responsible for all the 911 calls that come into our agency, as well as the 6217,000 non-emergency. So as a comparison, last year for 2019, we had about 387,000 emergency calls that came into our dispatch center, and we had about 533,000 non-emergency calls that are also handled through that. Our goal is to uh, is really set by the state. It's really to try to get to 95% of those emergency calls within a 15-second period. Uh, depending on the call volume, we range from the high 70s to about 90% of that efficiency but we're always striving to hit to that 95%. Uh, 
the state on a regular basis comes through and looks at our call volume and then makes a determination about how many individuals we should have. Um, what they looked at, and it's called the ECAP system, is the state suggested that we had a 43 additional uh, people in our dispatch center. That's complaint takers or dispatchers. So just to go through the basics, a call comes in, a complaint taker takes the information by telephone. That gets electronically switched to a dispatcher who gives that information to the officer by MDS, which is computer, and by radio. The higher the priority, the quicker those calls come out. So our calls are prioritized as they come through that system. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is the information and technology section. That has one civilian manager, one supervisor, and nine staff. And to put it in perspective, they take care of the 1,250 different computers we have in our agencies. Some of those are desktops. About 340 are MDSs, which are in our patrol cars. But they take care of all those things. Last year, they handled about 4,000 calls for service that came through our Information Services Bureau. So they're, they're very, very busy. There's three basic types of employees in there. There's a programmer analyst, there's a database administrator, and there's a computer system specialist. All three of those combine to make sure our various systems in the Fresno Police Department work correctly. The crime scene investigation section, that has one manager, three supervisors, and 16 crime scene investigators in there. Um, what they do is they go out to scenes and they have two full purposes. One is off-site, one is on-site. The off-site is they'll respond to a crime and they'll collect evidence for us. And they do that quite a bit. Um, the other one is they'll process people, fingerprints and photographs here internally uh, for our agency. And they do that for a variety of reasons. There's a lot of people under some penal codes that have to come in and register. Uh, for instance, uh, 290 registrants, which are sex offenders. So they'll update those photographs and fingerprints on a regular basis along with other folks that have to register. Last year, um, the crime scene investigation unit responded to 6,450 crime scenes in Fresno. Um, they were, were able to process about 2,500 cases at headquarters, which means they took the evidence and came back here and dusted it for prints or other things. Um, they were able to identify about 600 bad guys with fingerprints from those um, cases they did at headquarters. And they also processed 12,500 arrests that came through headquarters before they go to Fresno County Jail. So that's, that's quite a bit of work. The next one is the record section. That's one manager, three supervisors, and 47 technicians, uh, clerks, or transcriptionists. And basically, we have, uh, in large part, a paperless system, but other agencies don't. So our record section is vital to what we do, and it's also the face of the public. A lot of people come to Fresno PD in their headquarters pre-COVID, of course, to get police reports for a variety of different orders. That's one thing that they do as a public county. The other thing the records does that's vital is they put immediate information into our state teletype system. Uh, that system allows other agencies, uh, law enforcement specific, to look for maybe people that are wanted or cars that are wanted for personal crime. So that's kind of an important thing. The other thing that we do there is statistical collection. We have some requirements where we have to report our crime stats and a variety of other statistical information to federal and state partners. They are responsible for taking those stats in based on our, our RMS system, which is our records management system. They look at those and they make sure that they're in the right format to get those to state and federal partners. Um, another thing that we do through our records section is our uh, CLO PLO which is our court liaison and prosecution liaison officer. What they do is they manage all the subpoenas that come into the Fresno Police Department from cases that officers have been on. So they manage the, the flow of the court system and make sure we get where we need to be on time. They also put together uh, packages for the district attorney's office and get them over there when we are gonna make an arrest or when there is an arrest made and the package is forwarded them for prosecution. So that's an important part of what they do there. Uh, last year, they went through 21,440 different subpoenas, and they managed that for our agency, which is a monumental task. The records section itself processed over 92,000 reports for the Fresno Police Department. And in addition, a, a very important function that they have is PRAs, or Public Records Request Act. Uh, last year, they processed 14,606 different PRAs. 
So that's a, quite a bit of work. Yeah. Um, if you like, I can go through each one of the functions of our emergency response team. Those are the blue colored blocks in there. Um, the first one is mobile command center, and these are all ancillary duties. So I want you to understand that our officers have primary responsibility, maybe in investigations, maybe in patrol. But when the need arises and we get a critical call, that's when they come in and do these secondary services. So the mobile command center uh, has three different components. First one is communications. Second one is going to be our negotiators. Our negotiators use that quite a bit uh, to facilitate conversations with people and try to get them to walk out of calls that we have. Um, the other part is, is it allows for us to develop uh, responses to these different calls that we get. So the MCC is very important. Um, the second one is the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Unit. That is actually one lieutenant, uh, two supervisors, and three bomb techs. It's one of only a few. Uh, there's only 468 certified bomb units in the nation. We have one of those. And what they do is they, they go out when there's a suspicious device. They go out uh, in large events to make sure there are no explosives in those areas, make it safe. Uh, but they also render safe anything that we find that's suspicious. So in 2019, we had about 16 different responses with our EOD team. Uh, the year before that, it was 32, so it fluctuates quite a bit. Uh, that's an extensive amount of training to get to be on the EOD team here. Uh, the next one we use quite a bit more, it's the crisis negotiation team. And that's basically a left hand of SWAT. And what we do is we always uh, have some train people. They're negotiators and they go out and what they try to do is a peaceful resolution. We're vastly very successful at getting people outside of these coincidences. A lot of times are barricaded, sometimes they're suicidal. Uh, as we told last year in 2019, we had about 51 of the crisis situation team. 33 were barricaded and were suicidal suspects. And we were able to get a peaceful resolution on every one of those calls. So that's an important aspect of what we do in Fresno PD. The last one you've seen maybe a little bit uh, recently, which is our mobile field force. Uh, what we do is we, we train on large scale disturbances, demonstrations, and riots. And what we have as an ancillary responsibility is some extra equipment, some extra training that we give these people um, in order so that we have uh, a layer of safety um, after an event and luckily in Fresno, we haven't had one, uh, but we're trained to react to those should we have one. And that is a group of just about 83, 83 officers, uh, five sergeants and one commander. And the last one is for the emergency response is SWAT, Special Weapons and Tactics. That's one commander, one assistant commander, four sergeants, which are team leaders, 25 officers, and we also have six support staff that work to SWAT bus. And what they do is anytime there's a high risk incident, we send out SWAT to make sure that we have enough equipment to handle it as safely as possible. Uh, we also have some special training with them. And again, they work hand in hand with our crisis negotiation team. So nobody works in a vacuum at Fresno PD. Uh, last year in 2019, we had 12 call outs for SWAT. And that could be calls that came in from the field or high risk search warrants that were written. Uh, the year before that, we had uh, just about 15. So it's right in that 15 to 12 range. So if there's no questions, I will move to the traffic safety section. Okay. Deputy Chief Reed, there'll be a lot of questions, but we're going to take them after we get through your presentation. Certainly. Thank you. The uh, traffic safety section is represented in the middle of that uh, organizational chart up there. It really is comprised of a couple of things. One, the traffic safety section, which involves uh, our motors that you see every day. It also involves our investigators behind the scene and some things that we do with trying to make sure Fresno is, uh, is as safe as possible relative to traffic issues. Um, so I'll go through those very, very quickly. Our traffic safety section is one supervisor, 10 officers, and one civilian. I'll briefly describe their responsibility. The uh, Collision Reconstruction Unit is a group of three, basically, top engineers. They go out and they use high-tech equipment in order to look at 
fatal collisions and get the best information available. They download information from cars, which is very technical. And they also are called out on a regular basis with our um, homicide unit whenever there's a violent crime that occurs in a car. So they have multiple uses. Uh, last year, they went out to, and typical of a year, but last year they go from 30 to 55 fatalities that occur in the city of Fresno. Uh, but they also go out to another 60 to 85 calls, depending on the needs and the violent crime that comes out. So that's three detectives in our collision reconstruction unit. The next one is three detectives in our hit and run unit. Uh, these folks go out when somebody has left the scene of a collision, typically when there's injury and sometimes death. Uh, they're highly trained. Uh, last year, they responded to 1,500 different cases uh, over the course of the year, and they make some very high-profile arrests from those folks and bring people to justice that left the scene of a, uh, an injury accident or a fatality. Uh, the next one is the grant DUI program. We have about $700,000 currently in office traffic safety grants. Uh, those are grants that are given, it's passed through Fed money to the state. Uh, we apply for those competitive grants and we get those. That allows us to do additional operations. Some of those operations are, uh, are click and ticket, for instance. We do, we wanna make sure we don't have distracted drivers. We do pedestrian operations to make sure people are following the process. So we do a number of different things uh, to make sure that we have a higher level of traffic safety and, and Fresno. One of the things that they also do is they administer a, a very, very effective program that's called Decisions for Life. So if somebody in the city of Fresno is convicted of a, for instance, driving under the influence, one of the things that they do is they're sentenced to an educational program, which is run through the city of Fresno. Uh, our police department takes the lead on that with these two officers. Um, they go out, uh, they set up a classroom setting and then as people go through it, part of it is looking at the stark reality of what happens when you drive under the influence. Last year, I mean, the success itself is, is, is amazing. Um, we talk about recidivism rates, which is repeat offenders. Last year, of the 1,877 students that went through the DFL program, those are community members, City of Fresno people. Only 27 repeat offenders out of that. That is a 1% recidivism rate. You don't see that anywhere else. It's a very effective program that really reduces the number of DUI incidents in the city of Fresno. Uh, the next unit in our traffic safety section is the tow unit. Uh, we have one officer and one civilian tow coordinator that oversees the 30 different tow companies in Fresno that are contracted with the city of Fresno under our exclusive tow agreement. Um, last year, 15,988 tows occurred in the city of Fresno. And so they managed every one of those vehicles. Um, they want to make sure that they go in right and that they're released at the earliest possible time. And that's what our tow coordinators do. In addition, we took in 344 evidence tows. Those are vehicles that were either used in the, in the commission of a crime or part of a crime that we could extract some evidence of. It. So they manage that. And lastly, as they go through and they do inspections of those 30 tow companies to make sure they comply with the requirements of those contracts. Under our traffic safety section, we also have an ABC unit. Uh, that is a, a person, it's a detective that's funded to the tune of about $100,000 from alcohol beverage control and to state commitment. So what they do is they go out and they make sure that, that people are complying with their conditional use permits, that people are complying with their ABC permits, and to make sure that if there is any enforcement action that needs to be taken, that person takes it. And they work in concert with ABC. So it's a force multiplier. Um, we get two or three bodies from ABC for the one detective that we put in today. Uh, we've had that uh, grant now uh, for the last seven years, and it used to be competitive, and now they just give it to us because we do such an effective job. Uh, we also have one phlebotomist. What we found out many years ago was that the hospitals were going to charge us $275 per person to do a legal blood draw. Uh, if you added all that up with what we did last year, that'd be about $130,000. What we found out is there's an efficiency by hiring somebody that's a full-time phlebotomist into our agency. And they not only do our blood draws, but they also do blood draws for California Highway Patrol. So um, they've been able to do uh, probably save us in the area of around $100,000 by using this approach. It also gives our people the ability to get back in the field quickly because we have them 
on site, so it makes sense. Uh, last year they did a total of 549 bug drives. Uh, 349 were ours. The rest belong to THP. And uh, traffic enforcement, and I'll just briefly go over that. We have four squads of motors. We have two day squads of motors with one sergeant each, and those are nine plus one. And then at night, we have our nighttime uh, traffic unit, which is 10 officers plus one sergeant. So uh, last year, they responded to 3,100 different traffic collisions, 854 injury collisions, uh, 44 deaths, unfortunately. Uh, they did 17 DUI checkpoints, 26 saturation operations, and four pedestrian bicycle operations in the city of Fresno. And what they did was uh, the biggest number was that they were able to take 2,488 DUI suspects off the streets, which means those folks didn't end up in collisions, killing some of the family members who we have in this community. So that's an important statistic. They also wrote 41,000 uh, different traffic citations. So that again is just ensuring that we have traffic safety in Fresno because you're more likely to be hurt by a, a vehicle in Fresno than you are with a gun. So we wanna make sure that we do that as efficiently as possible. The last one, traffic safety section, is our Skywatch operation. Uh, Skywatch operation is basically one sergeant, three sworn pilots, three TFOs or tactical flight officers, and two civilian mechanics. Last year, they logged 1,661 flight hours, responded to 3,598 police calls for service with an average response time of 38 seconds. I think that goes unnoticed sometimes, that that is a very, very fast way to get eyes over a critical incident and then feed that information back to patrol officers that are responding. Uh, from their air observations, they made 192 arrests, uh, and they took over 22 high-speed pursuits that were occurring in the city of Fresno. What that means is we don't have officers with lights and sirens following a bad guy. We're able to do that safely with the helicopter. Um, they also took 145 calls for allied agencies. So that is the traffic safety section. I will go on to our last one which is really um, kind of a special response session. And what we do is we have a variety of different functions in this section. Uh, there's a lot of people who work behind the scenes to make this one work, um, but it's, it's some of it's very high profile, some of it's not, so you may not know about it. The uh, first one we're gonna talk about is the K-9 unit. That's one sergeant, 13 officers, and one laborer. The K-9 units respond to critical incidents where they're needed in the field. So it's a patrol resource that we use quite a bit um, what we do is we quantify the activity of these canines. They do a, a variety of things from apprehending uh, fleeing criminals uh, to article searches to helping with missing persons to alarm calls, things of that nature. Um, last year in 2019, we went through 1,725 different calls where the canines were involved in. Um, of those, uh, we only had 21 applications where the dog was actually used. That is a significant statistic. That means 1.2% of the time, the dogs that are used are what they're called um, alerting to where the person is and that person gives up as opposed to a bite. That's a significant stat that we're very, very proud of. The other thing is, that this is also part of our community policing strategy is our canines go out and do a number of different demonstrations, over a hundred a year, where they go to schools, they go to events, and kids get to come up and meet the dogs and they get to interact with the animals and make sure that they're not nervous about that. Um, but it builds confidence with the community. And matter of fact, most of, in fact, all but about $26,000 of general fund money is raised through these events and donations to the unit so we can buy new dogs or we can buy vests for dogs, things of that nature. Uh, the next one is a uh, collateral responsibility. It's a mounted patrol unit. We use the same sergeant that is with the K-9 unit. Um, and we have six people that currently are certified to ride. Three of those are reserves, three are volunteers. What they do is, um, and it's a great unit to see, um, they go out and they do community policing events. So you'll see them um, up at River Park during Christmas time. You'll see them down at parades. You'll see them at the big Fresno Fair. There's a lot of interaction with those horses. Uh, so it's a non-enforcement activity. It's all funded through donations from the public, and uh, it is a very, very important thing. Last year, we had two people assigned full-time to that. Uh, given a perfect world, we'd keep those folks there because they did an amazing job. We just don't have the funding right now. We had to move them back into patrol. But the mounted unit is a 
collateral duty, and it's one that uh, we're very fond of for Social PD. The next one is the property and evidence control section. What we do is after we collect evidence, we are responsible to keep it in a secure facility until such time as it goes to court. Um, that's what our property and evidence control section does. We have one sergeant, 12 technicians, and one senior admin clerk. Uh, in 2019, they took in 35,840 items of evidence, and they were able to purge, which means release through a court process, 22,751. So as you can tell, we're trying to get uh, more balance in that. It'd be nice to have one in, one out. We work very hard with detectives and the court process. Unfortunately, it's been slowed down a little bit with COVID and the lack of court resources. But once we uh, get back full steam, we're gonna to try to make sure that we have that balance back in there. Uh, the next one was uh, the SACS unit that, that falls under special response section. The SACS unit we discussed before has two sergeants and 10 officers. Um, some of the stats that you heard earlier from uh, Greg Barfield was about 835,000 people uh, write SACS or BRT each month. And what we see is um, during the course of a year, about 15,000 calls for service. Uh, last year, we made 350 arrests out of that, seven felonies and the rest, 282 were misdemeanors. That is a uh, uh, basically a crime rate of 2.3% of the calls resulted in the loss of somebody. So that's very minimal. Um, the last I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the crisis intervention team. Crisis intervention team uh, is of a novel contract in California. What we did was we partnered with Fresno County Behavioral Health. And what they did was they said, let's look at how we provide crisis or mental health services in the field. And this is our homeless population. It's also people that call in our 911 system. So there's, there's a little bit of a twofold approach to this. And what we do is we take a specially trained person that that goes with a mental health care professional from Fresno County Behavioral Health, and they respond to calls for service in the field. Um, so it's a, a, a licensed certified social worker many times. Uh, it's subcontracted sometimes to Kingsview, um, and they provide mental health workers of different varying uh, abilities to this project. But we respond to our 911 calls and, and calls from the field in the mental health uh, related. So last year there was a total of 8,270 responses that we had. 2,912 were mental health calls for service that CIT handled directly and the other ones they did 5,300 with patrol in order to allow patrol resources to go back into the field handle calls for service while we provided CIT services for those folks. Um, in addition, we've, we've given a 40-hour class of crisis intervention training which is which is really intensive mental health training to uh, 417 officers. That equates to about 16,700 hours of additional training that we give our patrol officers and detectives to make sure that they have the most current information on crisis intervention. It's a de-escalation technique. It's uh, very important to what we do here. It allows us to handle nearly a million calls that we get every year in, uh, in the most interactive way possible. So. That is all the information I have. What I'd like to do right now is introduce Deputy Chief Phil Cooley, who's in charge of our control division. Thank you, Mike. Deputy Chief, welcome, welcome to the meeting. And we just ask whoever is Darth Vader and reading on the mic to back off just a little bit, because we can hear all the background noise. But thank you for being patient with this whole new platform. Go ahead, Deputy Chief, if you have a floor. Yeah, I'd just like to follow up. We, we work out of a, a 40, 50 year old building and the vents are rather loud in, in these offices. So that's what you're hearing, background noise from the vents. Perfect. We'll put on the list to get your brand new building, Chief. Thank you for clarifying <laughs> that. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, we'll wait for a council member Bredico to make the motion though. <laughs> Good afternoon, Council President Arias. Um, Madam City Manager Kwan and the other distinguished council members, thank you for allowing me to uh, share my division with you. Uh, my name is Phil Cooley, I, and I am in charge of the patrol division. And my division consists of the five policing districts, which most of you are familiar with, 
as well as the patrol administration um, portion of my district, of my division, I should say. We patrol over 112 square miles of the city of Fresno within these five policing districts. And under my division, there's a total of 485 personnel, which falls under my tutelage, I should say. Uh, the patrol division is committed to prompt responses to life-threatening crimes in progress and thorough detailed preliminary criminal investigations. We respond to more than 1,200 calls to service per day. Our proactive resources also are dedicated to crime prevention through deployment, specifically targeting gangs, drug offenders, and parole violators. Crime prevention is also addressed by providing target hardening strategies to businesses, schools, and individuals through our community meetings. As is often said, patrol is the backbone of our organization. Each district in our city averages about 806, about 86 personnel per district. One of the things I want to stress, which um, a lot of people do not realize, is that our staffing levels have been pretty much the same over the last five to ten years. For instance, um, here it is shortly after two o'clock, and for each district, there's approximately only 12 officers that is patrolling each of the respective districts at this particular time. At four o'clock, we will lose seven officers, but we will pick up six from our swing officers uh, allotment. So on the, on the average, we may have 35 people patrolling the city of Fresno each day. Um, as Deputy Chief Mike Reed indicated earlier about our staffing ratio, you know, we are behind the eight ball tremendously. The chief mentioned earlier in his opening statement, the number of personnel that are out with long-term absences or um, not being able to get a full complement of the actual officers that we totally need for the city our size. In my division, we also have three special response teams which only patrol the southern portions of our city. Uh, the north end districts do not have that allotted resource. We have one downtown policing district, which consists of one sergeant and five officers. And we graciously thank Council Member Soria and, and Council Member Capriolio for allowing us to uh, add additional bike units to the respective districts. And just to touch on some of the things based on handling calls to services, we also have the abilities to help give back, our, give back to our communities through a variety of community partnerships that have been established throughout the year and those before. If I can just touch on a few events from each of the different districts so you can have an understanding of what some of these officers accomplished while still handling calls for service. In Southwest Fresno last year, the officers were able to create a mentoring program with the Fresno Unified Schools District in which each elementary school had a partnering officer that helped tutor and mentor those kids after school. They also, they also started a leadership police academy at Gaston Middle School. At the time, Captain Salazar, who was in Southwest, brought back the good times at Frank H. when he partnered with the Parks Department. All of our districts deal with, um, perform co uh, coffee, with, coffee with a Cop and all of the respecting districts. We all attend numerous neighborhood watch meetings, but more importantly, we continue to build these partnerships in the various districts. In the Southeast Policing District, we were able to establish our first Hmong Residence Police Academy, which was about six weeks, and over 100 Hmong community members attended this uh, particular uh, meeting. We also partnered with the Boys and Girls Club, the Senior Citizens Village with their pasta dinners, we also have our Hispanic Residence uh, Police Academy. And of course, all of our districts participate in the Bringing Broken Neighborhoods Back to Life. We have turkey giveaways during Thanksgiving. We also provide toy drives, and we also have Santa's Village in most of our various police districts. Because of COVID-19, we were able to participate in numerous of these 
um, community events, which we love and, and we look forward to in building that bridge and our partnership amongst our different districts. In the Northwest District, one of the, the uh, items to note is that the National Hockey League donated equipment to our youth hockey team, the Fresno Force, by providing them with the necessary equipment. And that was a tremendous success in helping, once again, build that partnership with the kids in the Northwest Policing District. I can continue on, but I'm going to move on to some of the other administrative duties that uh, I handle in my division. Um, it was mentioned earlier, we talked about the Homeless Task Force. Uh, the Homeless Task Force consists of one sergeant and five officers. And just to give you a few different side notes, in, in 2019, the Homeless Task Force responded or came in contact with 8,186 homeless individuals. They cleared 6,500 caps. And out of that, only 1.6% of the homeless individuals accepted off, uh, services um, were, that were offered. The facts department. What percentage was that? Uh, sorry. I'm sorry, can you repeat? The percentage. It was 1.6%. We also have three officers which are dedicated to the sanitation division and they help target the uh, recycled thefts that are current within the city. Under my um, administration, we have the school resource officers as well as the school neighborhood resource officers. And they have done a tremendous job building partnerships and mentoring some of these children and students within the various high schools and middle schools throughout our city. And last but not least, one of the unsung positions in my bureau is, is our duty office. And they're almost like a, a 24 nonstop. Where they are the first responders when we have critical incidents and they send out several calls to all of the staff. But more importantly, they approve nearly 10,000 e-reports that come through our department. Because oftentimes many of the members will submit their report via email and these officers around the clock will continue to um, submit these reports and have these um, reports processed. That's an overview of my division here in the control division, and I'm going to pass this information on to Deputy Chief Farmer for the investigative division. Thank you, Deputy Chief. You're welcome. Thank you, Phil. Good afternoon, Council President, Council Members, and City Manager. Uh, my name is Deputy Chief Pat Farmer, and I'll be giving an overview of the Investigations Division. Uh, currently, the division uh, is compromised of one Deputy Chief, one Captain, 17 Sergeants, 117 Detectives, 11 Graffiti Technicians, 5 Crime Analysts, 1 Manager, 1 Senior Secretary, 1 PAR coordinator, and PAR stands for Prostitution Abatement and Rehabilitation, one senior admin clerk, and one forensic analyst. So the division has four bureaus, the first being the Street Violence Bureau, the second, the Family Justice Bureau, the third, the Special Investigations Bureau, and then the fourth, the Magic Bureau. I'm going to start off with the Family Justice Bureau, uh, which consists of the following units, sexual assault, domestic violence, child abuse, missing persons, elder abuse, and financial crimes. Uh, the sexual assault unit, uh, the first one I'll cover, has two sergeants and 16 detectives. Three of those 16 detectives are funded by the SAKI grant, which stands for Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, which is a state-funded uh, grant that we receive and um, is uh, totally 100% uh, funding those officers. Uh, we also have one detective assigned to the ICAC uh, unit, which stands for Internet Crimes Against Children, um, partially funded by Homeland Security that works the majority of our child pornography cases. Uh, we also have one non-sworn crime analyst. Uh, the mission of sex crimes is to conduct professional investigations uh, into allegations of sexual assault. In 2019, the unit handled and investigated 92 rapes in addition to child molest 
indecent exposures, sexual battery, and child pornography cases. They also are tasked with registering and monitoring approximately 2,500 sexual offenders uh, for compliance. Uh, the next unit in the Family Justice Bureau is the Domestic Violence Unit, uh, which has one sergeant and nine detectives, and their mission is to investigate all domestic violence cases occurring within the city of Fresno. And we also partner with the Marjorie Mason Center with four grant-funded advocates to help uh, women and children find shelter at the Marjorie Mason Center. Uh, in 2019, the Domestic Violence Unit handled 7,497 cases and 1,229 women and children uh, were provided housing, assistance with restraining orders, crisis counseling, and the unit also provided training to 160 officers at the Fresno Police Department. Next in the Family Justice is the uh, Child Abuse Unit, which has one sergeant and four detectives. Their mission is to investigate child abuse, child neglect, infant death, and child endangerment cases. Um, their stats um, for 2019, they investigated 950 cases of child abuse within the city of Fresno. Next, we have the Missing Persons Unit, which has two detectives assigned to that unit. And they investigate all runaways, missing persons, uh, child stealing, and any case uh, with possible foul play or uh, a medical uh, walk away from a facility. Uh, the uh, unit handled 3,650 cases in 2019. That's a big caseload for two detectives, but um, they do the best they can uh, with the amount of uh, bodies in that unit. And next we have the Elder Abuse Unit, which is also uh, <clears throat> staffed with two detectives. Their mission is to investigate elder abuse, dependent adult neglect, and financial abuse of our senior citizens. In 2019, they handled 500 cases for the year. And then the last uh, unit in the Family Justice is the uh, Financial Crimes Unit, which is staffed with one sergeant and seven detectives. One of those detectives is part of the FBI Financial Crimes Task Force, um, and one non-sworn data forensic analyst who uh, examines all of our computers and phones that need to uh, be analyzed. Uh, the mission of Financial Crimes is to investigate all check and ATM fraud, counterfeit currency, embezzlement, forgery, identity theft, internet fraud, and theft by false pretenses. In 2019, the unit um, handled 550 pieces of forensic evidence, mainly being phones and computers, uh, processed 261 investigations that had a significant, significant financial loss, and in total handled 4,200 cases for the year. So the total personnel for the Family Justice Bureau is one lieutenant, five sergeants, and 40 detectives. Next, um, I'm gonna go over the Special Investigations Bureau. Uh, that consists of our major narcotics, um, and including our HIDA, which stands for High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, our Vice Intelligence Unit, and our CCAT, which is Career Criminal Auto Theft Team. Uh, first of all, our major narcotics and HIDA um, has one sergeant and 10 detectives, uh, one of those detectives assigned to HIDA, and two on the DEA task force. Their mission is to impact large-scale narcotic sales within the city of Fresno and to prevent uh, drugs being delivered to smaller and mid-level uh, drug dealers, which impact neighborhood quality of life and crime. In 2019, the Major Narcotics Unit uh, recovered 40 kilos of heroin, 30 kilos of cocaine, 68,200 fentanyl pills, 12 pounds of powdered fentanyl, 43, I'm sorry, 433 pounds of marijuana, uh, 13,500 THC vape cartridges, and 70 firearms, in addition to 32 arrests. Uh, next, the Vice Intelligence Unit uh, has one sergeant and seven detectives. One of those seven is assigned to the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force. And we also have the one non sworn uh, prostitution abatement rehabilitation coordinator. Uh, their mission is to investigate um, and reduce human trafficking. Uh, they also manage all the massage parlors in the city of Fresno, gaming, both legal and illegal gaming. They monitor and conduct investigations on organized crime, investigate threats against public officials and officers. In 2019, they handled 162 human trafficking investigations. They rescued 130 uh, 
mainly females from human trafficking um, that were either uh, brought to uh, a nonprofit such as Breaking the Chains or uh, Molly's House. They conducted uh, 76 undercover operations that resulted in 224 prostitution related arrests with 133 of those being John arrests. They also arrested 94 subjects that were operating prostitution uh, illegally in massage parlors. Uh, the vice unit also uh, manages and conducts all the backgrounds and monitoring of um, the Club One card room uh, here in the city of Fresno. And the last unit in the Special Investigations Bureau is our Career Criminal Auto Theft Team, also known as CCAT, which has one sergeant and seven detectives and one non-sworn cr uh, crime analyst. Their mission is to reduce auto theft in the city of Fresno by arresting career criminals uh, who are sometimes gang members and uh, uh, habitual drug users that are either on probation or parole for auto theft. In 2019, our CCAT unit made 237 auto theft arrests, uh, 62 who were gang members, recovered 577 stolen vehicles, and 130 of those vehicles were rolling stolen. They also took down 44 chop shops where vehicles were being uh, parted out and recovered 18 firearms. So uh, in total for the Special Investigations Bureau, they have one lieutenant, three sergeants, 24 detectives, one PAR coordinator, and one crime analyst. Uh, next, the Street Violence Bureau uh, consists of the following units, night detectives, street violence tactical team, homicide, robbery, and felony assault. The night detective unit has one sergeant and seven detectives with the mission of responding to assist patrol on all serious felony crimes. They prepare the crime scenes on all homicides, attempt homicides, officer-involved shootings, and in-custody deaths. They also interview suspects at all of these type of uh, crime scenes. And the night detectives are also responsible for NIBIN, which stands for the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network that we receive uh, through ATF, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives. And the night detective unit uh, in 2019 was able to test fire 675 firearms, and many of these firearms we were able to match to multiple shootings and homicides within the city of Fresno and other agencies. Next, we have the street violence tactical team with one sergeant and six detectives. One of those is assigned to the U.S. Marshals Task Force. Their mission is to conduct plainclothes undercover surveillance and to arrest violent criminals within the city of Fresno. In 2019, they conducted 200 investigations, made 111 felony arrests, served 114 search warrants, conducted 309 surveillance operations, and seized 40 firearms. Next, um, the homicide unit, which has two sergeants and 10 detectives. <clears throat> Their mission is to investigate all street violence to include murders, suspicious deaths, in-custody deaths, and officer-involved shootings. In 2019, they handled 45 murders with a 77% clearance rate and 100% filing rate with the district attorney's office. Um, we know it's important for these detectives to um, do their best to solve these crimes within the first 48 hours, and so um, they get called out quite a bit uh, for any one of those um, type of crime scenes. Next, we have the robbery unit with one sergeant and five detectives. Their mission is to investigate all commercial and strong arm robberies, home invasions, and carjackings within the city of Fresno. In 2019, they handled over 900 cases and solved 17 series where multiple businesses were being uh, hit by serial robbers. They had a 93% clearance rate, which is very impressive uh, for the robbery unit handling that many cases. Uh, next, we have the felony assault with one sergeant and 10 detectives. One of those detectives is assigned to our extradition unit that is partnered with the Fresno County Sheriff's Department that travel throughout the United States for subjects that have fled Fresno and they bring them back um, to Fresno um, to hold them accountable for their various crimes. We also have uh, two non-sworn crime analysts. Uh, their mission in felony assault is to investigate all shootings, stabbings, assault with a deadly weapon. It could be anything from a hammer, a screwdriver, um, a baseball bat, uh, against a person leaving serious injuries. In 2019, they handled 650 cases, wrote 450 search warrants, and recovered 82 firearms. So the total complement for the uh, Street Violence Bureau is one <laughs> lieutenant, six sergeants, and 38 detectives. The last bureau in the Investigations Division is MAGIC, which is the 
multi-agency gang enforcement consortium, and the MAGIC um, consists of the MAGIC tactical and investigations team, adult compliance, uh, also known as uh, ACT, uh, as well as the violence intervention and community services. The MAGIC tactical and investigations uh, has two sergeants and 13 detectives. Uh, three of those detectives are funded by AB 109 money, um, and their mission is to reduce violence within the, within the city of Fresno by partnering with multiple local, state, and federal agencies to stop and disrupt gang violence. In 2019, 510 gang members were arrested for various crimes to include murder, shooting, <clears throat> stabbings, possession of illegal weapons, and narcotics possession. The MAGIC unit recovered 351 firearms from gang members last year. Um, we also have the adult compliance team, which is totally funded with state AB 109 money, uh, one sergeant and three detectives. They work with the probation department and other allied agencies with the task of uh, conducting compliance check on subjects who are on probation uh, who, who would have otherwise been incarcerated prior to AB 109. Um, the 2019 stats are 2,789 probation contact searches, 414 arrests. They recovered 72 firearms and authored 36 search warrants. Um, and the uh, next unit is the graffiti unit that has one manager and seven graffiti abatement technicians. Their mission is to make the city of Fresno safe and clean by removing graffiti within 24 hours of receiving the call for service. In 2019, they received 26,957 calls for service and removed 1,760,950 square feet of graffiti in the city of Fresno. Uh, they do a phenomenal job and uh, their response time uh, is usually within uh, 24 hours the graffiti is gone. And the last unit in uh, and under the MAGIC umbrella is the Violence Intervention and Community Services uh, Unit, which has one community coordinator and one <clears throat> admin clerk. The uh, mission of that unit is to provide outreach and services to individuals who desire to leave the gang lifestyle and in order to reduce violent crime occurring within our community. In 2019, 120 uh, Gang members were provided uh, services that wanted to get out of the gang lifestyle, and services that were provided to them were things such as anger management, drug and alcohol abuse counseling, tattoo removal, job placement, life skills, and uh, many more. There was 340 participants who had tattoos removed uh, for a total of 4,496 square inches of tattoos removed, mainly gang tattoos, that had a value of $325,000. In turn, these participants provided 697 hours of community service um, to the city of Fresno. And uh, last, I'd like to mention that um, the same coordinator that does um, all of the outreach uh, to help stop the gang lifestyle, um, Maggie Navarro, she also is very uh, involved in the Hispanic Residence Academy and um, since she's been uh, doing that, 197 participants have participated in Hispanic Residence Academy to learn about the police department and to um, have translation provided so they could uh, hear uh, about what the police department does to help build those community partnerships. And uh, that is a summary of the investigations bureau. I'd like to now turn it back over to uh, Renee Wadihiro. And, and we'll go to the next slide now. We'll give you a brief overview of our budget and we'll conclude and then go into questions. Camera? Oh, you got to open it. It is open. Can you see me? Are you able to see? Mm -hmm. we see yes, we can see you and we can hear you. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, we're looking at the final slide. Our, our, well, excuse me. I'm Renee Wadihira. I'm the Fiscal Affairs Manager for the Police Department. Our final slide is an overview of our general fund budget. It's our FY20 amended budget and it is $184,896,900. And it funds the various programs that you've just heard about. Primarily, it's made of personnel costs that represents 84% of our budget. 
totaling $151,533,900. Cost includes salaries, fringe, overtime, guaranteed leave, premium pay, pension obligation bond, and workers' compensation. Included is our overtime budget of $3,457,500. And we expect to end the year uh, within our budget uh, for overtime. The last time we were inside our budget on overtime was in FY12. I expect there will be an additional $1,035,800 of salary savings by, by year end. Non-personnel costs make up 4% of our budget and total sorry. $7 million. Can I'm I interrupt sorry? you? Can you repeat that last number again for us to cut off a little? The salary savings. The salary savings? I expect yes. $1,035,800 of salary savings by year end compared to our amended budget as you see it on the screen. Non-personnel costs make up 4% of our budget and total $7,424,000. And we expect to fully extend that budget. <clears throat> our non-PERS costs pay for things like building leases and utility costs for 10 of our sites, service contracts, primarily software, the body-worn camera contracts, our Glock gun purchase, the shot spotter contract, blood draw analysis and toxicology um, from our motor unit, outside legal services, evidence tow storage, training and hiring costs, just to name a few. Next are the internal service funds, for our internal service fund budget. It's $21,626,100 and represents 12% of our budget. The charges represent, uh, excuse me, they represent charges for service by other city departments, including information services uh, for computers and network charges, communications, which is for phones, fleet services, which are vehicle purchases and maintenance, facilities costs, and property and liability insurance charges. I estimate there will be a savings of about $388,600 in that, in that category. Lastly, you'll see the contingency line or category. It's $4,312,900. Basically, this represents money that has been swept out of our um, personnel budget, it's salary savings. It's been swept into contingency so that to protect it. Um, and it will be used to um, balance the city's overall general fund budget. Overall, um, I, I believe that we will end the year with $5,737,300 in savings that will be used to, to balance the general fund. And, sir, this completes our presentation. Yeah, I go ahead. you can go ahead and close out the, uh, the slide. Um, you know, I, I would just like to conclude um, that um, you've seen um, our officers do the presentation. You may have noticed uh, this band across our badges. Um, I want to explain what that represents. Uh, last week, Officer Damon Gottsweiler was, uh, was killed. He's a deputy sheriff in uh, Santa Cruz County. Uh, he was ambushed and, and murdered um, um, in the county. Uh, he'll be buried on Wednesday. He is survived by a wife, a young child, and, a, and a, an unborn baby who he'll never get to meet. So I understand we mourn the loss of life throughout our country. We only wear this for officers who are killed in the state of California. Because if we mourned every officer's life that were killed, we'd never take this off. So I just want you to consider that as we move forward, uh, that um, while we won't be able to march, we do mourn in our own way for the loss of life. Thank you. Thank you, Police Chief Hall. Um, and we're with you in mourning the loss of the officer's life and our thoughts are with this family. Is there anything else you'd like to add to your presentation before we go to public comment? No, sir, thank you. Thank you, council. We're gonna to go to public comment first and then we'll return to the council for any questions and comments. Those who wanna speak, please identify yourselves when we unmute you and we will allow you three minutes to address the council. And be warned, if you are inappropriate, we will mute and remove you and refer you to the police department for follow-up. So with that, we'll go to TJ Shelton, you're the first one up. Please identify yourself and address the council. Mr. 
can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, yeah, my name's Terry Brent Shelton Jr. I'm a fourth generation electrician. This is my only second time ever sitting in on a council meeting. Um, I was on the one earlier too. Uh, you know, with all of the technical difficulties, and I appreciate the the uh, the heroism that is probably behind much people who go into law enforcement. Same thing with firefighters, except I think they've got a cleaner name today than police department, fire department. And I think that, that Esmeralda and Miguel and, and some of the other people, sorry, I don't know most of your names, uh, uh, where they want to focus on like involving the community and mental health into first responders. When you guys respond to like suicide calls, could we not divert that someplace else? People trust firefighters more. Um, we're talking about you guys' budget and Personally, honestly, no offense to any of you gentlemen, I, from my perspective on this ball called Earth, I would uh, rather see more allocated to firemen training people to do this than policemen training people to do this because we have um, a technical difficulty that is a mental health, mental health crisis in this nation. And um, I don't want to eat up too much of your time, uh, but uh, I, feel, I feel for the uh, the officer who died, uh, I understand the band on badge, and I understand there are many good people in police enforcement and that we do need police enforcement, but uh, I do think that some of the money that is allocated to you guys, if we can't figure out a place in the budget to uh, come up with some funding for some local community organizations and oversight, maybe interacting with IA, part of your crisis intervention aimed at We lost Mr. Shelton. The next person up is Lisa Flores. You will be unmuted. Lisa Flores, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Andy, uh, first thing, please wear a mask because every time I see you in public. <laughs> oh, that was me. I do have a mask up. That's all we got here. Ms. Flores, are you still there? Ms. Flores? Yes. Yes. You still there? Go ahead. Please address your comments to, okay. to myself. Let's keep uh, it about the police budget, please. Okay. Well, the police budget. First, let me say I am a daughter of a retired sergeant. Um, so I come from the family of the blue. And um, I just want to say, reviewing the budget, it is very bloated. I personally would like to see um, a cut of $14.8 million to the budget. As I went through your budget today, I noticed things that kind of don't belong in our community, like your ammunition from 120K to almost $300,000. Really? We need that many bullets in Fresno? Um, and I also would like to know how come Workman's Comp has escalated so much? And. Um, what is it with the chemical and gas, a uh, line item 56114? Why do we need that in Fresno? Why are we getting so militaristic? I don't see the reason why the police budget is 53%. Thank you, Your Ms. own admission. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lars. All right, next person up is Ivanka Saunders. You're being unmuted. You have three minutes to address the council. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. This is Ivanka Saunders with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. And we work with community members throughout the Central Valley, including the city of Fresno. We work along with a lot of our partner organizations, such as BHC, Fresno Barrios Unidos, and Family Faith in the Valley, Fresno. And we've submitted a letter addressed to all you council members listing the priorities that community members have stated to us that must be funded through this upcoming budget. Some of those priorities I've already mentioned last week, the housing programs, truck rerouting, funding the advanced peace program, including increased public works and services and increased funding for parks and recreation. We just wanna reiterate that we support the demands of the Fresno State Chapters NAACP. 
we have such an incredible opportunity right now to reimagine public safety, not just for Fresno, but as a model for all of the other cities. Furthermore, the creation of the Commission for Police Reform must take steps of real public engagement. This commission to be truly transparent and transformative. We would hope to see that the commission's meetings are public held either on Zoom or after COVID in accessible public spaces that the meetings need to be shared with the public with a notice at least once one week before the meeting takes place, translation services, and the commission's work should be time bound with that proposal out by 90 days so that the momentum can be sustained in the implementation phase and not just become a status quo. We thank you for taking these, step, these initial steps and we look forward to working with you all as always. Thank you. Thank you. Give us one second here. We're looking at for some folks. The next person will be Ashley Rojas. You'll go next. And then after that, go ahead, Ashley, you have the floor. Hello, council. Thank you, President uh, Arias. My name is Ashley Rojas. I am a D1 resident, a fifth generation Fresno and the executive director of Fresno Barrios Unidos. Um, we know that budget speaks to values and we want to know fundamentally, do you believe that Fresno, that our community has the capacity to heal, recover, and thrive? Or do you believe that we will forever be a community that requires militarized police to keep us in order? <clears throat> our current investment strategy has failed to yield the return on investments desired. Our current investment strategy will continue to fail because it fundamentally does not address the basic needs of our community. We fail to invest in the socio-cultural environment, the physical and built environment, and the economic environment of our community. This systemic and historic divestment in our community leaves us with pervasive individual and community level trauma, resulting in intergenerational poverty, long-term unemployment, uh, limited employment, deterioration of environments, unhealthy and often dangerous public spaces with crumbling built environments, disconnected and damaged social relationships and social networks, and the elevation of destructive, dislocating social norms. <clears throat> we need now investments into our community more than ever with the resulting impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent economic crisis. Our community is in urgent need of reimagining safety so that we can invest in our community. This means equitable opportunities, uh, economic empowerment and workforce development. This means increased community wealth and resources, creating safer places throughout our community, housing, quality transportation, and reclaiming and improving public spaces, rebuilding social relationships, strengthening social norms and encouraging healthy behaviors. We're talking about community-based public health that is trauma-informed and culturally centered. <clears throat> there are opportunities to immediately reimagine safety by reallocating public relation dollars that the Fresno Department, a Fresno Police Department currently uses uh, to coerce relationships with community. And if they want to invest in building positive community relations, they would turn inward and improve their practices to mitigate harm caused to our community. There are also opportunities to get rid of the cannabis specialized unit, considering cannabis is a legal substance in the state of California and in the city of Fresno. There are also opportunities to demilitarize the police department. Uh, comments were made earlier about tear gas and the levels of bullets that does not even name the uh, highly militarized uh, vehicles and transportation that the police department has. There are lots of opportunities to cut the bloat from the police department and reinvest in our communities. And I urge you to consider this, this comment. Thank you, Ashley. The next person up is assembly member, Dr. Joaquin Arambula. You have the floor. You're gonna address the council. Good afternoon, council president Arias and Fresno city council members. I'm a longtime resident of the city of Fresno, and as a state assembly member, I represent 41% of the city. I welcome and support the local and national discussion regarding America's history of racism, inequity, and police brutality against African Americans and other minorities. Because police misconduct is often related to larger systemic social issues, I believe that local, state, and national elected leaders have a responsibility to help us heal. 
For my part, I am taking action to fix that system. Last year, I was proud to vote for Assembly Bill 392, which became law and set tougher standards for when law enforcement officers can use deadly force. Last week, I voted with the vast majority of Assembly members to approve ACA 5 and let the state's voters decide this fall if they want to overturn Proposition 209. These are only two small steps heading us in the right direction. It is now time for us to consider more expansive, systemic change. We see and hear the cry for it all across America, and its time has come. As you and we deliberate local and state budget priorities, I believe we must listen to the voices that are seeking change. The peaceful protest organized recently by the Fresno State NAACP is an example we can all learn from. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, people have rallied because they are angry and frustrated and want to change now. While I do not think that defunding our police department is wise, I do think a constant re-examination into how half our city's budget is spent is a correct course of action. Do all Fresno neighborhoods feel safer? Do all Fresno neighborhoods feel protected? We have limited resources in our state and city to fund programs. We must be more careful and transparent with taxpayer dollars than ever before. I am ready to help assist the city council in your efforts to better analyze your police budget. Would our community be safer? if some of the department's budget was directed to keeping young people healthy and productive. Fresno must meet the challenge of this moment. I believe we can. Thank you. Thank you, Assembly Member Dr. Joaquin Rambila for addressing the council. Next person is Jennifer Gallegos. And the public, we have approximately more than 40 speakers lined up. We're going to try and have the speakers rest with us for a minute so we can get through all the public speakers and um, get to council discussion on the most important topic of public safety police department. Jennifer Gallegos, you have the floor if you wanna uh, So hello council members, um, okay, there we go, sorry. Hello council members, my name is Jennifer and I'm calling council community member. Gary, I want you to pay attention and get off of Twitter. Unfortunately, like many others, I have all suffered from Police brutality, and if I'm being honest, I believe it was due to the color of my skin. Police brutality has greatly affected my loved ones and the community of Fresno. As you discuss the budget for law enforcement, I hope that you truly care about the community's input, not what happened with the whole Andy Hall chief. This is not a check mark for you to fill out. These are people's life at stake. Isaiah Murieta would still be alive if it wasn't for police brutality. Internal investigations don't result in justice, and that is not fair. As a social worker for child welfare, I can tell you that FPD gets paid too much for what social workers could be doing if we were the ones answering the crisis. Maybe our incarceration rate wouldn't be as high as it is right now. If we have community social workers controlling our streets, Fresno would be safer. Luis Chavez. You have up to 30% of your 2018 contributions that came from law enforcement. The estimate of that was $84,000. Will you be siding with the people that you are here to represent or will you side with your donors? Stop investing in the deaths of our community members and start protecting our lives. Jerry Dyer, is that's enough to say. When Council President Arias got called law enforcement, he got cited instead of his attackers. And then a cop went to every other city council member's house to protect them, even if they were not direct threats made their way. Invest in the people who gave you this job. If not, you will be getting booted out during your next term, and I will make sure of that. If, you would, if I would be calling FPD, who knows if I would be alive right now. We have to remember we pay their salary. Andy Hall, that is for you. We pay your salary. Start listening to the people. I yield my time. Thank you. All right, folks, we're going to keep going. Uh, we're going to limit it to a minute um, comment. Kyle Slopeschmidt, you are now being unmuted. You have a minute to address the council. Kyle, can you, you hear us? Thank you, City Council. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I would like to um, express my concern about the Fresno Police Department budget. I um, wanted to highlight one thing that I witnessed um, in March and kind of the early stage of the uh, pandemic, um, African-American youth was uh, detained in front of my house for over 
20 minutes as they bantered him with questions about where he was going, why he was walking, why he wasn't in quarantine, and that somebody had reported him as a suspicious person in the neighborhood. Meanwhile, um, other people had been violating the um, shelter in place order who were white and not treated in the same way by Fresno police officers. And in many cases embraced, including by our, um, our chief of police um, at the Unite, uh, at the Freedom Rally in front of City Hall. So I think there's an ongoing um, case of racial bias policing in our community that needs immediate um, addressing. And I think a dramatic way to do that is to shift um, significant amounts of the responsibilities that the Fresno Police Department has cobbled together over the years. And you heard that in the um, hearing announcement about graffiti abatement and transit policing and uh, mental health um, responses and homelessness responses. We need to defund the Fresno Police Department from those responsibilities so they can focus on um, getting right what their core um, responsibilities are and prove to the community that they can do those in a cost-effective way um, while we um, deal with the rest of our community safety issues in more, more coherent and um, logical ways than uh, people arriving with guns who don't have the adequate um, training or the adequate um, presence of mind to deal with the, the issues that our community faces. And um, in that case also, um, we need to be looking about our both built environment. I work in community development um, for the last two decades and um, dramatically have seen that um, by increasing park funding, by increasing uh, community facilities, places for people to uh, be in community together without the threat of police violence, um, that that could dramatically reduce the amount of crime that we have in our community. Um, and to do that in a, in a concentrated way. Um, in my particular neighborhood, there's two uh, facilities that Fresno police rent. Uh, one used to be the brother, Big Brothers Big Sisters office at Dudley and Fulton, which is the street where I grew up, um, that has a police use, but I rarely see anybody actually using it. So that's a facility that we may be renting that we don't need to. Additionally, the office um, next to High Top Coffee on Wishon uh, while a good idea of having a community police presence, I don't think has delivered on the uh, the promises that were made to the community about um, direct connection with the police and that that would be a community space. It's um, often you, blacked sir. out curtain. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next is Nicolas Lara. Nicolas, you are unmuted. You have opportunity to address the council. Can you hear us? Yes. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Nico Lara and I just want to address that the Fresno Police Department budget is 53%. However, resources to communities, particularly communities of color, are very scarce. Uh, my question is why, why is that? And why are we having this discussion to begin with? I understand some, and I repeat, some police go in with good intentions, but they are trained under the same corrupt system that upholds white supremacy and power disparity. Though police claim to offer peace, our people say otherwise, investing and patrolling effects of the system when the root is not addressed. The root is that police are militarized armed gangs that descend from slave patrols. You can deny this all you want, but your intended ignorance is continuing oppression in our communities to fund the police and invest in our community's health and well being. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lara. The next person is Michael Crane. You've been unmuted. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Michael, you have an opportunity. Oh, to it's, it's okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, um, I'll try to keep this short. Uh, so this past week, many in Fresno were told that the city had created a commission on police reform, uh, a commission focusing on community-based policing methods, among other to be determined uh, efforts. City council members, I want to explain why those efforts of reform won't work. Uh, let me paint a picture. Five years ago, the Minneapolis Police Department was under pressure in the wake of both the national crisis of police killings of unarmed black men and its own local history of unnecessary police violence. In response, the department's leaders implemented implicit bias training, de-escalation techniques, crisis intervention, increasing the diversity of the force, stricter use of force policies, adoption of body cameras, police community dialogues, and that list goes on. A lot of the same efforts that I imagine this commission in Fresno will endorse. 
Well, how did that work for Minneapolis and the numerous other departments and cities that have adopted these same measures? The research tells us that it didn't. What this conversation lacks to acknowledge is the expansion and the scope of intensity of policing in the last 40 years. Every social problem in poor and non-white communities has been turned over to the police to manage. Our schools don't work, let's create school policing. No funding for mental health services, let's send in the police. Substance abuse is an unaddressed epidemic, let's criminalize people who share drugs. Young people are caught in a cycle of violence and despair, let's put them in prison. There's a reason why the US only makes up 5% of the global population, but has nearly 25% of the world's population. So when we say defund the police, what we mean is that we need non-police solutions to problems that our community faces on a day-to-day -day basis. Let me quickly repeat that. When we say defund the police, what we mean is that we need non-police solutions to the problems that our community faces on a day-to-day -day basis. We must invest in housing, in employment, in healthcare, in ways that target the problems of public safety. Instead of criminalizing homelessness, we need publicly financed supportive housing. Instead of gang units, we need community-based anti-violence programs like Advanced Peace. We need trauma services and jobs for young people. Instead of school police, we need more counselors after school programs and restorative justice programs. And lastly, instead of budgeting nearly $2 million a year to pay off legal claims against the police in Fresno, we need leadership that fulfills the needs of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Michael. The next person would be Mariah Th Thompson. Mariah, you've been unmuted. I have an opportunity to address the council. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Mariah Thompson. I am a resident of Fresno District 1, and I am the uh, director of the National Lawyers Guild, the local chapter. Um, I'm here to support community calls for defunding the police, and I simultaneously want to bring up the related issue of community policing, because I think there is a misunderstanding and people think it is both possible to have community policing while simultaneously defunding the police. Community policing is a form of policing that increases police budgets significantly. It's not new, it has been around since the 1970s. It often serves to legitimize the police in the eyes of the community, especially during times of unrest. Um, it creates more money for cops. It puts more cops on the ground in communities who then work with community sources of power who rely on community resources to put more eyes on the ground and more involvement in the everyday life of um, citizens. Having more cops on the ground means more individual and cop contact, which means more opportunities for people to become in contact with the carceral state and get arrested and get cited. Um, and this is all very resource intensive. So this means more money. Um, so I think the city is rushing to find a solution to a very urgent problem, but also a problem that has long history. Um, a lot of things have been tried. There is data on this that we should be exploring before we make decisions. And so when the city is making decisions about funding or defunding the police, I think it is important to look at the overall structure we're trying to implement and make decisions about funding based on that and those values. And the community is saying to defund the police and put the money elsewhere. So we need to really consider if community policing is going to achieve that goal or be counterproductive. Thank you. Thank you for addressing the council. Next person is Grecia Alanis. You have the floor. Thank you, council member uh, or council president Arias. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to comment this afternoon. My name is Grecia Alanis. And today I'm commenting simply as a resident and not as a behalf of leadership council. I simply want to state my, you know, complete support of the previous comments that have been made and the prior presentation that the NAACP group has uh, conducted uh, last Thursday. Um, we do need bold new solutions. We need non-police solutions to the very real issues that many of the residents in Fresno face. Um, and the answer cannot be more uni uniformed officers, more armed uniformed officers you know, you can ask any person of color, is particular black people and black men, and they do not feel safer simply by having an armed officer in their community. That is not the solution. Um, as such, we need to be think more creatively and more innovative about the solutions that we are we are proposing. 
um, including having the Reform Commission be a supermajority of black citizens, because those are the lives that are um, being targeted right now and have historically been targeted. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Carolina Garza de la Cruz. Do you have an opportunity to address the council? <clears throat> yes. Um, I would like to start by saying, Officer Hall, I kind of anticipated the trauma of hearing something that would trigger a great emotion from the police. And I have to say that by you making reference to the police officer shot near our community by an alt-right extremist, and then referencing not being able to march like Black Lives Matters is a great concern. And we hear that from our police leaders from all over the Central Valley. And that is why we have no trust. I need you to hear us, that the blue wall has been broken. And that is a community that demonstrated that and that does not belong to Black Lives Matters. And we do not want cops to die. I, there is a blue wall outside of each of our homes. For some that provides a sense of great safety for others, it is refugee-like fear in our own land by public servants. So City of Fresno, listen to your community and the world as we engage, as we are designed to in a moral budget, one that answers to the people. We need to reimagine safety and that does not mean we want cops to die. The blue wall has been broken and it needs to be shattered. Understand that Chief Hall. Thank you. Uh, the next person is Kimberly McCoy. Kimberly, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President. My name is Kimberly McCoy. I'm the project director for Fresno Building Health Community. I encourage the council to pass a budget that reflects priorities like funding for our parks and green space, quality housing, youth programs, arts and trails, and programs like Advanced Keys. Every year we see 50 of the city's budget given to the police department, but little or no investment in communities of color. These communities are overlooked every year at budget discussions. So time is now to take a different approach to public safety and have a budget that reflects our needs in the most vulnerable communities. I urge the council to pass a, pass a budget like that to show investment, to show that we care about our communities, to show that we care about youth, and to let the young people know that you hear them and you hear their calls and you understand what they're asking for. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Brandy. You now have the floor to address the council for a minute. Thank you very much, council. Um, I want to um, specifically address, um, uh, repeat your support for an alternative to the homeless task force and divestment of funds to more effective efforts. I also agree with the other uh, articulate things said earlier. Um, I wanna add that in order to con not continue ineffective status quo, your team to, to respond and implement solutions should largely be made up of people who are experiencing homelessness firsthand, who know the challenges, who can tell you what they need and how to ad address the problems that the, the city has experienced with homelessness. And I propose the funds go to including the homeless in the action plan, develop an advisory council of homeless individuals, include them in your subcommittee, conduct surveys. Uh, the, the, most of the information you receive is mostly filtered for people who are relatively distant and are only responding to certain causes instead of all of them. Uh, one of the lieutenants mentioned the percentage of people who did not accept services. That was before the triage centers and did not include or take into consideration valid reasons why such as having to leave a pet behind or feeling more unsafe at the pub than where they were at. And I've also heard during that time, many, many more people who are never offered mm -hmm. services. Um, I support a team that includes advocates like Des and others who've been working with the homeless, social workers has been mentioned, the fire department has been mentioned. Uh, within the, the Fresno Police Department, I would like, I would propose to find that every contact with the homeless will be accompanied by a social worker. Uh, the homeless task force is not effective in eradicating the presence of people sleeping outside nor getting people off the street. For the most part, when they displace them, that's simply all that happens and it's a waste of resources. There's also been evidence and reports by the homeless and advocates that officers in the homeless task force, not all of them, but th that there have been th those who have verbally and physically mistreated and threatened 
the homeless while they're trying to preserve their possessions, simply trying to survive. There are many documented occasions when officers in the homeless task force have not followed protocol to document and store possessions to be retrieved and instead placed bicycles and wheelchairs in the crusher. Thank you, Brandy. Next person, Simone, you now are muted. You can address the council. Can you hear us, Simone? I can. Hello, my name is Reverend Simon Biasel. I'm a resident of District 1. You can call me Simone, though, if you like. Simon. I would like to first publicly express my appreciation to Mayor Brand for working with community organizer efforts to paint a Black Lives Matter mural on the street in front of City Hall. Not too long ago, I remember sitting in a town hall meeting when public officials refused to acknowledge that Black Lives Matter because they thought it was a controversial statement. I give credit to community leaders like Dr. Binion, Pastor DJ Kreiner, Dr. Atua, Pastor B.T. Lewis for their persistent work of drawing attention to why the Black Lives Matter movement is not controversial, but rather essential. However, it is not enough for the mayor to only support Black Lives Matter being painted on the street. It is also crucial that the mayor works to put Black Lives Matter in our city's budget. As recently reported, every time there's a shooting death in our city, it costs the taxpayers over $2 million. Many of these fundings comes directly from the police department budget. We know the victim of gun violence e unequally affects bl the black community. With this in mind, we've been budgeting millions of dollars for the death of black lives, but have not been budgeting enough to save black lives. Last year, the community came to the mayor and the council asking to budget only $300,000 for advanced peace, which has been statistically proven to save lives, specifically black lives. We are coming again this year, already having raised hundreds of thousands of dollars from the community for advanced peace. The community has done, has gone above and beyond to invest in advanced peace. And now we are asking for the mayor and the city to do their part. While the Black Lives Matter mural will send a strong message that our city stands with our African-American sisters and brothers, we know that eventually the mural's paint will fade. However, the dollars we invest in advanced peace will lead to permanent results of black lives being saved. Black Lives Matter is not a controversial statement. It is an essential statement. Advanced Peace is not a controversial program. It is a, an essential program. Thank you. Esmeralda, you are up next. Can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I am Esmeralda Luna, community member and former direct care staff at a short-term residential therapeutic program for adolescents ages 12 to 17, formerly known as Rip Homes. While there, I witnessed time after time the city failing our youth, including Fresno Unified School throughout all districts. Our youth often face underlying issues such as trauma substance abuse, parent neglect, among other issues. They often run away, putting their safety in danger, possibly putting them in this, on the streets, vulnerable to become victims of human, tra human trafficking. And when, and if they are found by PD, they are often criminalized, possibly thrown into juvenile hall. There is no consistency, no structure set up, up so our youth can truly overcome any and all barriers and be successful. I demand we divest from police and allocate funds for programs and services that will heal our youth from trauma, that allows them to explore their career interests and become independent. We need paid work-study programs, more social workers, more mental health services, more academic counselors to guide our students. Although some can argue that there are already services in place, there are not, there are not enough to equip to serve the needs of Fresno. There are lots of gaps. Why do we continue to fund policing when we can't even get our youth through high school? This is not a one specific district issue. This is a citywide issue. Our youth deserve better. Thank you. Thank you. Next person is identified as June. June, you are now unmuted. Go ahead and address the council. Hi, yes, my name is June Stanfield. I'm a lifelong Southwest Fresno resident. And I would like to address the diversity on your police department. 
out of 826 signed in police officers are sworn in, if I'm not mistaken, less than 100 of those are African American. Uh, that is an issue when you're dealing with uh, the issues we're dealing with right now with Black Lives Matter. Um, I think that's something we need to address, something you need to look at uh, seriously. And on top of that, um, I'd just like to address that it's sad that we're still here today, still talking about this police brutality. This has been going on way too long. We need to move on. We need more accountability. We need more transparency and we need more diversity. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, June, for addressing the council and for taking the time to do so. Next person is Rosali Baptista. You have been unmuted. And I want to acknowledge just like Yennefer did that you have the endorsement of MIMS and Dyer and we know exactly what that means. And we want you to correct that <laughs> for what it has been. And I think it's ridiculous that for over an hour and a half, we have heard from everything from cameras to canine meet and greets and every division ignored the public outcry for justice. Paul wanted to start by deflecting responsibility and framing our community in a bad light by highlighting recent stabbings, but he, as well as Jerry Dyer, continuously dismissed the countless unjustifiable murders of Fresnans by officers like the murder of 16-year-old Isaiah Marietta shot in the back of the head by Sergeant Ray Villalazo and the names that you see outside of City Hall today. Yet you acknowledge the loss of a police officer while ignoring the losses of our brown and black communities at the hands of your officers. The rest of the presentation listing their divisions and duties has only shown us exactly who and what we wouldn't need to spend money on if we invest, reinvested funds into preventing circumstances that create crime, like poverty, unhousing, lack of, in, lack of investment in mental health and education. It's also shown us all of the, the departments that should be handled by therapists, social workers, and medical experts, not unarmed, not unarmed ill-equipped police officers. We know exactly what needs to happen, just as NAACP has shown us. You see the demands and you hear us, but you ignore it this whole time. Not one person has taken responsibility for Fresno PD's crimes against brown and black communities in this meeting, and it needs to be dismantled immediately. Funds need to be reallocated to education, social work, public health, and rehabilitation. That's it. Thank you. Next person is Michael Dominguez. You have been unmuted and you can address the council. Mr. Dominguez. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Great. Uh, so I'm Michael Dominguez. I'm a resident here in District 5. I work in education and have been in the field for the past 10 years here in Fresno. We need care, not cops. It is absolutely ridiculous and unacceptable that our poorest and most marginalized communities are also the most heavily policed, surveilled, and incarcerated. Often these are communities of color, which is a direct product of redlining here in Fresno. Former police chief and mayor-elect Dyer is even known for saying that his policing practices most definitely factors in race. And to do this, Fresno PD receives more than 50% of our general funds. This authoritarian practice does nothing to serve our communities and is only operating as punishment with no possibility for positive change. Our city needs huge swaths of Fresno citizens to drown in poverty and only when they are thrashing for survival, only when they make waves to stay afloat, only then do we step in with handcuffs and gunfire. This is unacceptable. We must divest and defund police and instead invest our efforts and money into programs and practices that serve to uplift our communities and not punish them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Next person is Ariel. Ariel, you've been unmuted. You can address the council. Can you hear us? All right, we'll move on to the next person. The next person is Efrain Botello. Please identify yourself and you can address the council. Efrain? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so. Um, my name is Efrain Botello. I'm a resident of Southeast Fresno, and I'm just here to urge the city to listen to community and the nation, uh, nation, national movement to reimagine what public safety truly looks like. 
As decision makers, y'all could take bold leadership by committing to divest from the Fresno Police Department and investing in the community through an equity framework. From personal experience grow, growing up in Southeast Fresno, I've witnessed too many people not have access to resources and opportunities in order to reach their full potential. I also work with youth who similarly, similarly walk around with so much potential but still face the same barriers that I did growing up. It's unacceptable and unfair to continuously tell our youth that there is not enough money for their needs when we currently spend more than 50% of the general funds on police. Communities with limited police presence are, no, are nothing new and already exist. So this is not a radical idea. If you look at suburbs across the nation, there is little police presence. In neighborhoods of Northeast and Northwest Fresno, there is little police presence. Ironic enough, these are the communities where there is more opportunity and resources for youth and families. So why are we not treating the people of South Fresno the same? What message are we sending to our youth in South Fresno? If we continue to give the system, which heavily criminalizes and discriminates against them over 50% of the budget, what does that mean? Police do not put an end to community violence. Alternative programs like Advanced Peace and community-based organizations who have access to the community do. I understand that some of you are loyal to Fresno Police Department due to the funds they provide you. However, now is not the time for conflict of interest. Take bold leadership as a council member and stand up against the funds that the police department has robbed of our youth and families. The best way to reach our youth is to invest in their well-being and, and their development. You have an opportunity to do so by divesting from the police department and investing in our communities in Southeast and Southwest Fresno. We will never progress as a city if we are not open to change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Botello. Next person is Sarah, she, her, and know that we have about another 40 speakers. So you have been unmuted and you can address the council for a minute. Sarah, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. So last year I worked as a victim advocate with the County Crime Victim Assistance Center where I helped victims and survivors of shootings, attempted murders, assaults, robberies, and DUIs, as well as homicides. In my one year of working there, I alone served nearly 1,000 victims. The most common crime my clients had experienced was a shooting or other gun violence. I believe my caseload and that of FPD officers would have been much lower if Fresno had a program like Advance Peace. I now work in education and I am so grateful to be on this side of the work because it is messed up how at my last job, so many of our youth only entered my life when their lives were already over. Many of my cases also would have concluded much sooner if Fresno prioritized affordable housing. That's because relocation is one of the most pressing needs of survivors. In Fresno, relocation takes way too long because clients can't even find affordable housing to relocate to. Advocates' resources were also strained by those experiencing homelessness and untreated mental illness requiring services outside our purview. Both those issues could be better addressed through a housing-first approach, but Fresno won't get to try that or any other successful model without proper funding. I urge you to look at the human and financial costs of violent crime in our city and invest in evidence-based solutions. Redirect some of FPD's funds so we can interrupt and prevent violence through advanced peace and ensure our residents get roofs over their heads when they are most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for addressing the council. Next person is Mitchin. Mitchin, you've been unmuted. You have an opportunity to address the council. Can you Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Mitchum Callahan, and I just had some questions and also some comments on just like much as I've seen it. Um, I noticed on one of the divisions, there was way more special response teams in, in the southern areas of Fresno. And I think that just adds to the reality that we all know of that there's way more presence in the south than there should be. Um, and also, I wanted to know why are cops being taught about mental health? Like, they're they're not meant to be mental health professionals. Let's let's make their job easier and actually invest in mental health and social services people that you know are good at that job and they're specifically gotten a degree for it. Um, I also wanted to know how much money was given to SWAT in the EOD uh, sections because I I imagine it's a lot just knowing the military industrial complex and what I and what little I've read in the past and because I, I, I don't see a point why there should be heavy militarization or millions of dollars invested in that because w this isn't a war zone. Um, I also, also wanted to know how the gang prevention unit works because like what we, we lock up all these gang members then what we throw them in prison or the county jail and then what they just join more gangs in prison. You're not like the recidivism rate in prison is super high. We need to actually like rehabilitate these people like in that one what is it violence intervention where a lot of gang members joined 
and there's a lot of success. Like we need to do more of that stuff that actually changes people, makes them go into the community and say, oh yeah, I want to change. We give them the services. And I don't even think necessarily that has to be under the police department either. That could be in social services as well. Um, Thank you, Mr. Mitchin. Great comments. Next person is identified as Mickey. Mickey C, you have been unmuted. Please identify yourself and address the council. Hello, my name is Mickey. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello, my name is Mickey Chacon. I'm a District 4 resident. And in the police um, report, they had the last slide was about, you know, just the general figures of the budget, how much they asked for, how much they actually got, how much was actually spent. Um, they, if I wasn't mistaken, they mentioned a $5 million um, surplus or savings. And I want to ask if um, when you save money, like, do you still ask for that same amount of money like the next year or the next uh um, funding period for the police um, because a lot of police unions are uh, sketchy about police defunding but they don't even use all the amount of money that they are given anyway uh, so is that five million dollars subtracted from what they asked for in the following funding pro um, period thank you thank you next person is identified as Jessica Morales Jessica you will be unmuted you have a minute to address the council Identify yourself, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Hello, Council. My name is Jessica Morales, and I live in Council Member Travis's district. I am asking for you all to treat the budget as moral documents. They are an articulation of what and whom our city deems worthy of investment. We need to reimagine safety and invest the millions of dollars used on the Fresno Police Department to be reallocated and invested in communities who have limited resources. Study after study shows that a living wage, access to holistic health services and treatment, educational and employment opportunities, affordable and stable housing, transit access, and youth programming are far more successful in reducing crime in prisons. We need solutions, not punishment. I'd like to invite you all to think about how many individuals have already lived with limited police presence in their neighborhoods. If you grew up in a well-off, predominantly white suburb, how often did you interact with police? Communities with lots of jobs, strong schools, economies, and social safety nets are already in some ways living in a world without police. Police safety is bigger than policing. I hope that you acknowledge that there are other ways to think about safety than armed paramilitary forces with a proven track of racism, brutality, and a focus on responding to harm after it has happened rather than de-escalating or preventing it from to happen in the first place. The city of Fresno needs to disrupt the status quo, which is a seemingly never ending list of names, hashtags and lives cut way too short by pro police violence and a system that has ongoing harassment and intimidation by communities of color, of communities of color. We need to do better and build together. Thank you. Thank you. The next person up will be Des Martinez. Des, you have a minute to address the council. Can you hear us? Is that even Des? No, 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 no. Des Martinez. All right, Des. We're going to go to the next person. Oops, not even on mute. Marissa uh, Corp Corpus. We are unmuting you, Marissa. Hello, can you hear me? Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Marisa Corpus, and I'm a resident of D2, and I'm here to comment on the police budget. Um, right now is a time for us not to just reimagine safety, but to actually create it. And we all have that capability right now, especially all of you sitting here. Um, a safer future means getting to the root of the challenges in our communities rather than thinking police are solving them because of the budget they have. We have heard in our community and communities across the country time and time again that police are instilling fear rather than peace. Helping our community means that we reinvest the police budget into the community where we need it most, um, like creating safe, sustainable, and affordable housing, uh, creating jobs, especially for those who have lost them due to the pandemic that are um, city funded and starting at $15 an hour. Also calling for mayor-elect Dyer to decline his upcoming city salary and we can reinvest that money as well into the community. Um, invest in advanced peace in Fresno, 
Um, these are just some of the examples that we can use. And there's many more, but by reducing funds from the police department, we can reallocate these services that never required policing in the first place. Um, our safest communities are the ones that have the most resources, not the most policing. I trust that you will reinvest funding into our people most impacted by our, the pandemic, poverty and racism in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Marissa Moraza. We will unmute you. Marissa, can you hear us? You're up next. Marissa Moraza. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Perfect. My name is Marisa Morasa, and I'm speaking as a community member and constituent of District 2 today. $185 million of general fund money to the police department is astounding. Budgets show priorities. This shows we value policing over community. I urge the council to divest money from Fresno Police Department and reimagine safety. It is essential that the council create equitable solutions in order to cultivate safety and support our community. Equity means just and fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. Equity means investing in our most vulnerable populations and those who have been most affected by systems of oppression. We need to divest from the police department and invest this money into preventative services, safe, accessible housing for vulnerable populations. We need complete neighborhoods and investments in South Fresno infrastructure. We need youth development and employment programs that are trauma-informed and are a living wage. We need to invest in advanced peace. And the answer is not more community policing. We are not asking for more officers, training, and police community events. We are demanding investments in alternate, on alternative interventions to policing that support our community, not criminalizing them. Our neighborhoods have been destabilized because of lack of investment and neglect. And we need to address the systemic racism of our institutions. And this absolutely means looking at policing and police in Fresno. We must create a new vision for Fresno that centers the humanity of our community members, listen and work with community to create change and reimagine safety. Thank you. Mr. Dang, please identify yourself. You're unmuted. My name is Tian Dang. I'm with Fresno Barrio Sunidos. How do, we address, how do we address issues of poverty and crime underpinned by a grievous history of acute oppression? How can we help our community flourish? A large investment in the Fresno PD is a myopic strategy that reacts to the symptoms, not the racist root issues. It fundamentally stunts the imagination, creativity, and collective agency of our community. It proclaims that we're not good enough to heal from within. The Fresno PD receives 53% of our general funding. Crime has, however, continued to increase. How have you helped foster safety, build our community, a strong police presence can, in my personal opinion, in my personal experience, be perceived as a terrorizing force. Thanks to the people who invested in me, I graduated high school as a valedictorian. I just finished my master's. I invest into my community through effortless hard work. Oh, and by the way, I'm from the hood, Southwest Fresno. We are capable. And despite all this, I've been pulled over and harassed countless times by Fresno PD because I quote unquote, looked like I stole my car because I looked like I was carrying, because I looked like a gang member. How does this instill safety? It's dehumanizing. The underbelly of Fresno is not Southwest or Southeast Fresno. It's the Fresno PD. Defund the Fresno PD. Our neighborhoods, particularly Southeast and Southwest Fresno are in dire need of infrastructure improvements. Our Southeast Asian Americans are in dire need of more social services. How much funding are you directing toward our refugee neighbors? Fund the mental health sector. We need, foster, we need to foster fierce community leaders, or leaders. Invest in advanced peace in Fresno. Fund jobs that equip our community with trauma-informed and culturally sensitive frameworks to heal from within. I implore you to stop depriving us of our collective agency. Believe in our potential. Invest in us. We don't need terror. We need collective empowerment. We need healing. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Deng. The next person is Hannah Clark. You are being unmuted. You have a minute to address the council. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Go ahead. So I am a resident of District 4 in Fresno. Um, my name is Hannah Clark. And um, my dad actually worked in the program called Care Fresno in the late 90s. And a lot of those programs 
programs went into the community of education, having a place for kids to go after school and things of that nature. And that, um, although they did work in partnership with the police department, they um, accomplished goals of lower crime in those neighborhoods, um, independent of the police. And so I invite um, the police to reduce, drastically reduce and defund its budget of 53%. I also am a taxpayer in the city and I do not consent to my money being used in this way of being it put, it being put towards so much of the police budget. Um, as a taxpayer, I'm exercising my rights and uh, yeah, thank you so much. I yield my time. Thank you for yielding your time. The next person is Cato P. As in Paul, Cato, you've been admitted. You have a minute to address the council. Please identify yourself. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Cato Prado and I'm speaking as a concerned member of the community. Today, I urge the council to adopt the guiding principles outlined in the letter that was sent from Fresno Building Healthy Communities and other community-based orgs who work hand in hand every day with community members, especially young people who are impacted by the state of over-policing in Fresno. A violently massive police budget is not what our community needs. We need the council to prioritize reallocating FPD funding in order to directly invest in not just the protection, but the advancement of disadvantaged communities by ensuring their decision-making powers. The city must take seriously the need to redefine and reimagine public safety for the health and wellness of all people in Fresno. And with that comes a necessary task of strategically defunding the police department so that things like parks, affordable housing, public services, and research-backed programs to end violence like advanced peace can be intentionally invested in. I really urge you all to look at the other ways that cities have already begun to defund and demilitarize their police departments to see just how possible it is and to also take seriously and act upon the just demands of the letter from that inspiring coalition of CBOs I mentioned earlier, as well as the demands outlined by the Fresno State NAACP chapter. I would like to remind you that these kinds of demands are not new, rather that they stem from histories of grassroots organizing, the work of predominantly black and brown people that has now gained due momentum. Things must change in the city for us to recover from both months of COVID-19 and decades upon decades of systemic racism in Fresno. It is not through symbolism and empty promises, but through policies and explicit budget priorities that the city of Fresno must show their belief that black lives matter. Thank you. Thank you, Cato. Next person is Sadie Gleason. Sadie, you have been unmuted. You have a minute to address the council. Sadie, can you hear us? Okay, cool. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Sadie Gleason and I'm a senior SNCC camp student at Fresno State. I'd like to ask the council for a drastic reduction in the police budget and the transfer of resources to social services to actually address root causes and reduce crime before cops are ever even involved. It would be embarrassingly ignorant for the council to ignore the rampant racism and violence in the Fresno Police Department. The police are corrupt, irrationally scared of people of color, and they're not held accountable for the harm they do to our community. For example, in 2017, Officer Ray Villavalzo murdered an unarmed 16-year-old and was not held accountable at all, despite the assault being reported on video. This is just one out of the several Fresno police officers who have brutalized and murdered Fresno citizens and still walk free. In addition to the police's corruption, they do not even do the jobs they are supposed to. I'm not sure where to find stats about the Fresno police in particular, but I found some illuminating st statistics from the country as a whole. Across the country, rape cases result in a notoriously low number of charges. In 2017, police closed just 32% of rape cases. Also, according to an FBI database, about 30% of robberies and less than 15% of burglaries and motor vehicle thefts resulted in arrests. I asked the council to consider why should police departments be allotted so much money when they are not even successful at catching real dangerous criminals? I do not want my tax dollars to go toward funding the livelihoods of these murderers and bullies. Fresno PD is not keeping our community safe. They are terrorizing us and using their power to subjugate poor people and people of color. I ask the council members to open their eyes to the police department's abuses of power and white supremacist ideology, recognize that this is a systemic problem and not just a case of a few bad apples, and de-weaponize and defund this unsalvageable institution. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. The next person is Alonso Santos. You've been unmuted. Alonso Santos Gonzalez. Please identify yourself and you have a minute to address the council. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, is everyone listening? Uh, my name is Alonso and I'm with uh, Sunrise Fresno. And uh, I strongly urge the city council 
um, to defund and abolish uh, Fresno PD. Uh, we are raised to believe that these systems implemented by colonialist racist society will somehow lift us out of poverty and that they work for us and protect us and create justice while they turn around and kill our black and brown brothers and sisters with both bullets and with lack of economic health and environmental funding. We have some amazing leaders here in Fresno and some of whom have given comments uh, earlier today. And so I urge you to talk with these community organiza organizations, talk with these community leaders and actually listen and implement their ideas to rethink public safety. Money that goes to further militarize the police and pay for excessive force lawsuits and for the murder of black and brown lives needs to stop. And that money should go to fixing systemic issues and injustices. And a key part of that is investing in these communities such as South Fresno that are over-policed and underfunded. Thank you. Next person is Cassandra Clayton. Cassandra, you're being unmuted to address the council and the department on the police budget. Hey, thank you, uh, Council President Arias, and also thank you to um, our city leaders. Uh, my name is Cassandra Clayton, District 4 resident. And um, I, I just employ the council to please review and reduce the amount of funding for overtime and workers' compensation. To me, my impression is that this has been a money-making uh, endeavor uh, through pet by pension uh, spiking. Um, I hope it's not, but that's really what it appears to be. I mean, it's nearly um, close to $20 million for last year with the majority coming from the general fund. So I think that would be a good starting point uh, to look at the overtime and the workers' compensation. And it's unfortunate that in the budget presentation today that they didn't actually break those numbers out because they're actually quite significant. Um, even if it is a $5 million savings, that's still above 10 million, just in workers' compensation and overtime. And I also, um, I would like to know a little bit more um, about the crisis negotiation team. What's the difference between uh, the crisis negotiation team versus the crisis intervention team? And does, do they both have licensed mental health clinicians as part of their staff? because it sounds like this, this may be a duplication of services. Um, it sounds like they're, they, they kind of function as the same uh, role, but they didn't really describe uh, how they, um, you know, what the differ differentials are to consider which, which one responds to which um, uh, crises. Thank you, Ms. Klein. So, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you again, Ms. Clayton. Um, Council, we're up to 46 additional speakers, so be patient as we get through everyone. The next person is number 559-920-0558. You are being unmuted. Please identify yourself, and you'll have an opportunity to address the Council. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Leslie Martinez. I'm speaking as a resident of District 7, a voter in District 7, and a taxpayer. I, you have heard from community residents who many of us do this work for free. We are the ones that are being terrorized and we are here to tell you that we do not want reform. We're here to defund the police department. The, the police department in Fresno terrorizes and kills our unarmed children every single, it's ridiculous. And I'm tired of it because it hurts because those are folks that I work with directly. For us to forget that they are based in white supremacy and protect white supremacy is ridiculous. I also want to remind every single person on this council today, specifically those that stood on the front lines of those protests, that with protests comes action and requires action. Let's also talk about the fact that how many times black and brown communities have asked this board for help when it comes to help for rent because they could not pay for it during the pandemic. The, let's remind ourselves that we tell Fresno West, the Southwest Fresno, that the park they deserve is the only one on, the only one they deserve is on a landfill. Let's remember that black children are dying in this city at alarming rates while white children are not. This is no, there is no right, there is no wrong, there is nothing, there's nothing to argue here. What we need to do as a community is stand together and I don't want patrol, more patrolling in my city. I don't want to see my neighbors scared when cops race down my street. 
I want to see kids flourish. I want funded parks. I want funded community centers because enough is enough and we deserve better. And we do not deserve to be slaughtered on our own streets. Thank you. Thank you. I yield my time. The next person that will be unmuted is um, area code 206. You are being unmuted. You have an opportunity to address the council. Please Hi, ahead. good afternoon. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Madeline Harris. I'm calling in as a resident and voter here in Fresno and a member of the Sunrise Fresno movement. Um, first of all, I want to say that a $184 million budget for the police is completely unacceptable at any time and uniquely insulting at this time in human history. So I genuinely hope to see not a single one of you vote in favor of this proposed police budget. I'm calling in today in solidarity with and following the lead of black abolitionist organizers across the country to demand that city council defund and abolish the Fresno Police Department and invest instead in black communities. I encourage you all to Google the history of policing in the United States because it originated as a force designed to oppress and enact violence towards black people for the purpose of keeping money hoarded in the hands of wealthy white property owners. This is not an institution that I believe keeps any of us safe and I stand with black organizers across the country who are calling for the defunding and abolition of the police. The Fresno City budget must demonstrate value for black lives and repair and remediate the unjust discrepancies in this city by defunding the police department and funding services that black community leaders have been asking for instead. Things like parks, education in schools where police are not present, healthcare, housing, advanced peace, and the list goes on. So Fresno City Council do not approve a police department budget for $184 million. Um, defund the police and in invest instead in black communities to protect black lives and black joy. Black lives matter. I yield my time. Thank you. Next person is Rose Jones. Rose Jones, you're being unmuted. You have a minute to address the council. Please identify yourself. Hello, my name is Rose Jones. Can you guys hear me? Yes, please. Okay, I am a special education teacher and I live in District 6. Mr. Gary Bradford, I'm not sure if that's how you say your name, but I would like to point out that your individual statement for this district ensures increasing the staff of police. So I would like you to truly listen during this time. Also, uh, Mr. Andrew Hall, while we are saddened that cops lose their life, their, li their jobs are not even in the top 10 most dangerous jobs in America. And there is justice when their life is shortened. Those that lose their lives in the hands of policemen at work, unfortunately, do not get that justice that they deserve. Have you taken a moment to fight for the justice of families that have lost their lives at the hands of police like Isaiah and the other names you see on the lawn outside of City Hall? With that, we need to defund the police budget and get re give reinvestment into the community. The majority of our city budget should not be in policing and we should demilitarize the police. We need to reinvest into our community affordable housing, we have a food desert in West Fresno. Um, our education system and education in Fresno needs to improve as out of the thousand black students that graduated in Fresno, only 28 are CSU eligible. We need to increase resources to mental illness services so that those in the systems that provide these services can be properly funded and reformed as needed. Give our community the resources they need to get out of survival mode so they can contribute instead of being criminalized. Target the root of the problems instead of using police as enforcers to keep rushing it under the rug. I also stand with the demands of the Fresno State NAACP that they, give, that they gave during their meeting with the city council, specifically with opting out of the renewal of the current agreement with the police. Do not stay in the political realm and realize that the Black Lives Matter movement has been here for years and is here to fight for the most disenfranchised, therefore helping everyone in the community have human rights. Thank you, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Rose. The next person is Dominic. Dominic, you've been unmuted. You have a minute to address the council. Please identify yourself. Yes, um, hello, good afternoon, city council president and city council members. My name is Dominic Samaniego. I'm 17 years old and I am a local community organizer here in Fresno. So as we all know, 50% of Fresno City's budget is spent towards policing. With the history of violence against black and brown people with police officers that has um, persisted over the year, years under former police chief Jerry Dyer's reign and the killing of 16-year-old Isaiah Muretta Golding, the police are clearly not doing their job correctly. Our police system operates under a system that benefits off of systemic racism. With so much money 
is being spent on policing, then why is there no proper training for police officers? And why aren't police officers re um, receiving implicit bias training? Why are people still falling victim to police brutality? These funds are clearly not being put to good use. These funds can be put elsewhere, such as our low-income communities of color, which have been underfunded for years and have very limited resources. So as a result, I am asking for the defunding of police and redirecting the money elsewhere, such as the schools and such uh, low-income communities, mental health services, as well as youth services. I come from the projects in Southwest Fresno, so I have experienced firsthand such inequitable resources. Both my, fa both my family and I have experienced um, a lack of resources. And I've also witnessed other families in my community who have also ex um, experienced such hardships as well. The police do not need this much funding. The police do not need more money for, t for tear gas. The police do not need more money for bullets. The police do not need more money for militarized equipment. The people are crying for change. And don't I wanna know, don't you hear us? I strongly urge you all as city council members to consider this request and to make better investments in our youth and our community. You as council members must do better by our communities of color and do better by our people. Safety does not mean more police. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dominic. The next person is Cesar Casamayor. You have a minute to address the council. You've been unmuted. Yeah, please. Can you hear me? What? Yes, yeah. go ahead. All right. First, I want to thank everybody that spoke in the community. And I think that the next steps have to be, and I'm, I'm really interested in knowing what the city council is going to do or regards, or regards of being accountable to the message of what the community is saying. Mr. Bredefield, you should be ashamed because if you see the video, what happened to Isaiah Murrieta, I don't think that you would, if you are a person that uses common sense, you would not agree with that death being justifiable. We're not animals. Isaiah was hunted like if he was an animal and someone said, good shot. The consciousness of the officer to do that is disgusting and is hurtful. I also want to say that in regards of leadership, as a community, we cannot continue to rely, and I hope the city council is doing this, and I challenge Mr. Arambula, and thank you for, for your words, but in regards of defunding the police, let's have a conversation about what public safety is for our community. Let's have a conversation with the families that have been impacted, not just the community organizers who are our gatekeepers. That is very few. We're more than just a few 50 to 20 activist organizers Speak to the families. Speak to Tina, Isaiah's mom. Speak to the family, Gundy, Wallace. Speak to them. Have a better understanding and not just rely on what some community organizers are saying. But what we're all doing is best to show. It looks like we lost your audio. We'll move on to the next speaker. Estela Ortega, you have been unmuted. Now you have the floor to address the council. Estela, can you hear us? Sí, por favor. Sí. Sí. Aquí estoy. Adelante, por favor. Sí, buenas, tor buenas tardes a todos los concejales y muchas gracias por este espacio que me dan de decir mis opiniones. Este, pues he escuchado mucho la explicación de cómo invierten en los policías, muchos entrenamientos, talleres para los padres, pero no han dado la explicación de cómo es una seguridad efectiva para los residentes y sobre todo para las áreas más afectadas, que son las más desfavorecidas, somos discriminados. Yo como residente he sido víctima de vandalismo eh, por un agresor en mi residencia. Nunca se, se resolvió ese caso. Este, me discriminaron, fui discriminada por los policías. Este, me gustaría que invirtieran en los niños, en los estudiantes, para que ellos también tengan una buena educación y así prevenir la delincuencia, que empieza desde abajo. Entonces, este, es mucha la inversión que hacen hacia los, a los policías, pero los más afectados somos los hispanos. 
muchas gracias por, por dejarme decir mis opiniones. Gracias, señora Ortega. The next person is Pedro Navarra Cruz. You have been unmuted. You have the floor. Pedro, would you like to address the council? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello, yes, uh, my name is Pedro Navarro Cruz. I'm a Fresno resident. I, I do work with Communities for New California Education Fund, but I'm here as a resident today to say what's on my mind and in my heart. I also reside in District 7. I firmly agree with the demands that many of the resilient Fresno residents have shared thus far, especially those shared by the NAACP. But I want to remind everyone why we are having this conversation now and why our policing problems have run rampant in our city. The Fresno Police Department and Fresno Police Officers Association are using money to corrupt our democratic systems to buy their way out of being held accountable for their irresponsibility, uh, for their responsibility to our families and neighborhoods. The money they are using to influence politics and policy is toxic. To my knowledge, every person sitting in the council, except for Miguel Arias and incoming Tyler Maxwell, has accepted this toxic money for their campaigns. These toxic dollars have halted the badly needed reform they've needed that we've needed. Our democratic process no longer works if the FPD and FPOA can assert their power through toxic funding. What's worse is that this money is no longer available for the things our communities do need like quality education, parks that we can be proud of, health services, infrastructure or housing support. They leave our city underdeveloped and with unfinished neighborhoods. The FPOA is the largest union in Fresno and a major campaign contributor whose funding makes political hopefuls salivate and also silences any opposing ideas. Though policing is supposed to be a job where people proudly protect and serve, in Fresno, the department functions more like a corporation seeking to make profit and earn bonuses by any means necessary. We, the people of Fresno, demand that you stop taking toxic money from these sources. We will be monitoring all political, uh, future political hopefuls seeking to be elected and reelected. Your decision to receive these toxic dollars or not will show us your true intentions. We demand that you start taking your position seriously and scrutinize the role of the FPD as you consider the budget. Whether you listen to community demands will determine whether or not you keep your seat as an elected representative of the people. We've seen these toxic dollars at work and it is never in favor, and the, uh, in favor of the people who live in Fresno. For example, Major P received the majority of the votes, but all it took was for the FPOA, Jerry Dyer, and then Lee Brand to speak out against Measure P to strike it down using a false narrative of public safety. We are not fooled. They were buying their freedom to continue to operate without accountability. So to be perfectly clear, we are asking each of you to stop taking toxic money from the police association. Our community deserves accountability. Right now, the streets are filled with people demanding change. That change includes the money you take from police, and we are telling you to stop. That That must stop. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. The next person is Felicia Espinoza. Felicia Espinoza, you are up next. You have an opportunity to address the council on the police department budget. Thank you, Council President. Good afternoon, Council. I'm Felicia Espinosa, the Fresno Site Director of Root and Rebound. Along with the National Lawyers Guild Central Valley Chapter, we submit this comment to highlight our submitted letter regarding the urgency to reduce the police budget. As lawyers and legal workers, we know that economic and social vulnerability must be addressed by investing in communities, not in policing its members. It is crucial that you do that now and lean into this systemic change. We call on the Fresno City Council and the mayor to prioritize community through housing, jobs, education, mental health services, and infrastructure, and reimagine what real community safety and well being can be. As such, we ask that you reduce the budget allocation for FPD by 10% and increase the budgets for housing, affordable and transitional housing, allocate city infrastructure in Central, Southwest, and Southeast Fresno. Allocate for workforce development opportunities that target low-income neighborhoods. Allocate for mobile community-based crisis programs that use trauma-informed de-escalation and harm reduction strategies. Allocate for intervention programs, including advanced peace program, social and mental health services, and treatment for substance use disorders. And expand free legal services for low-income community members, including representation of immigrants and removal proceedings. Additionally, we call on the city to implement immediate measures for the community safety. Support Fresno's NAACP directive to renegotiate the city's MOU with FPOA to ensure more accountability. Decriminalize municipal code violations. 
prohibit FPD from responding to non-criminal calls, limit FPD's participation in the homeless task force, issue citations in lieu of arrests, and prohibit FPD from filling any job vacancies, from getting into contract with Fresno Unified School District for school resource officers, and from entering into contracts with private businesses for security services. For the community's true safety and well-being, Fresno must shift its priorities. This is the time to act and reduce the budget allocation for FPD by 10% and reinvest in restoration and healing. Thank you for your time and consideration of our submitted comment letter. Thank you, Ms. Espinoza. The next person is Benjamin Potts. Benjamin Potts. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead, proceed. Uh, good afternoon, City Council and others. My name is Benjamin Potts. I live in D22 and I'm involved in different projects here in Fresno. Um, I have some facts that I want to share today that I hope can provide greater context. Uh, according to the Community Alliance newspaper, Fresno liability claims for civil rights violations, excessive force, employment practices, and wrongful death lawsuits that closed from July of 2017 to October of 2019 totaled a cost of over $23 million. This is more than the 2020 operating budget for Fresno's after school, park, recreation, and community services combined. I'm going to repeat that. According to Community Alliance newspaper, Fresno liability claims for civil rights violations, excessive force, employment practices, and wrongful death lawsuits that closed from July 2017 to October of 2019 totaled a cost of more than $23 million. This is more than the 2020 operating budget for Fresno's after school, park, recreation, and community services combined. So in a similar time period, Fresno doubled those same costs compared to Dallas, Denver, Minneapolis, and many other city cities, despite a stark difference in both overall police officers and officers per capita. Fresno's police officers cost taxpayers more per capita with respect to these violations than the majority of places in the United States. In a time period where police have overstepped their authority all over the country with civil unrest, Fresno is one of the last places where we need to contribute more to a department that regularly gets some of the lowest marks in the country with respect to these issues, especially towards communities of color. Voters will be watching what you decide, and it's your job to reflect our will of a transition to community empowerment and defunding of an extremely bloated police budget that has many hidden costs and not just financial. I yield my time. Thank you. The next person is Ruth Stern. Ruth Stern, you have been unmuted. Please identify yourself and address the council. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. So my name's actually Sky Miller, but I'm using my uh, girlfriend's phone. I was, I've been listening since this morning uh, regarding the firefighters and how they sort of got, uh, you know, a little screwed over and we were looking for a way to afford um, to hire three new fire. Can you hear me? Ruth, sorry that we lost you for a second. Continue. Uh, so I was listening this morning when the fire fire we were speaking about firefighters and how they uh, they lost their opportunity at getting the grant, and you guys were trying to figure out a way how to hire. I think it was three firefighters or something like that for each precinct. Um, I think that reallocating some funds from the Fresno PD would be a great way to do so. I think that the amount of money that we are putting into the police, I mean, not even considering the, the effect that it's going on around the world, but the amount of money is insane. We could be placing it into other areas. I really like that you guys talked about having uh, firefighters possibly go out and deal with homeless or maybe put some more money into uh, healthcare providers or counseling people that are on the streets are mostly, you know, they have issues and they need help to, jail's not gonna do it, you know? We have police that go out and kind of disrupt the scene disrupt people's lives when we could have someone out there to help them you know we have co full, co entire communities scared of the police department i don't think that's good at all 
And I also heard you guys talking this morning about uh, maybe having some officers uh, move over and become firefighters. I'm not sure that's a great idea. And what if, what if they then we become afraid of the firefighters, you know? Thank you for your comments. Next person is Sukena. Sukena, you've been on me tonight. You have an opportunity to address the council. Hello, council members. My name is Sukena Hussein. I'm a resident in Fresno and the outreach director for the Council on American Islamic Relations in Central California. We also share our support and appreciation for the council heard before and the demands shared by the Fresno State NAACP, which are rooted in input from our most impacted community members. This is yet another opportunity for Fresno to intentionally reflect on its priorities and develop a budget where we put people first. You have heard from so many others before me that budgets are reflections of our priorities. We are demanding that you prioritize people, not the increased investment in the targeting, punishing, and militarizing of our communities of color, especially our black communities. We want to emphasize that the council should ensure that black community leaders and community members are included in the decision-making process as they have been the target of the worst of police violence, systemic racism, and exclusion for hundreds of years. In order to prioritize the black community, the council should follow the example of black leaders and their demands. This includes the recommendations as highlighted by the NAACP and community-based solutions such as advanced peace, which you have all heard about before. The disparities in our communities and lack of resources are backed by data and research. Mm -hmm. We know that systemic racism has manifested in our Southeast and Southwest communities as into decreased quality of life, de decreased life expectancy, fewer parks, fewer healthcare and mental health services, fewer healthy food options, and less funding for education and youth programs in our communities of color. These are not new issues. You have been hearing that they are well known to all those who are experiencing them. This budget, again, needs to reflect our priorities and invest in underserved communities. It should not include further investment into police. Thank you. Thank you, Sukena. The next person is David Jimenez. If you've been unmuted, you have a minute to address the council. David Jimenez, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Um, hi, uh, I'm actually here to speak on behalf of, our, uh, of one of the youth. He was actually going to speak, but he kind of got shy. Um, but I'll, I'll just start off. Uh, also with Professor Camilos. Okay, but okay, this is what he said. Hi, my name is Josiah with President Vice Camilos. I believe we should be moving money from the police and using it to help communities like creating new jobs, having better parks, and more counselors. And with with that being said, um, you know, I had a conversation with him, uh, and you know, he's he's afraid of the police, and you know, he has you know real reason to be afraid, and you know, this is why we really do have to make these changes as soon as possible. You know, um, we we need to make sure that we are we are investing our money and things that will prevent things like that from happening. So yeah, we fund the police. Thank you for your comments. The next person on the list is Matthew. You have been unmuted and you can address the council. Uh, thank you, uh, council member areas. I, uh, my name is Matthew Woodward and I am speaking as a resident of North Fresno, um, just outside of district two in a county island. <laughs> And uh, I want to speak to my fellow North Fresno residents who are emailing online or talking on uh, next door and that are talking about everything people are calling in to ask for to defund the police department. And the thing I've heard a lot is that people are in this area of town are afraid of the change that this could bring. And I would ask everyone to try in my area, including council members who represent my area, um, to keep an open mind and to consider how often you actually ever go into any of the neighborhoods um, and, and interact with the very people who are police department uh, police every day. And these neighborhoods right now are saying that the current system we have set up isn't working. And 
I mean, I acknowledge that, yes, I mean, police de- the police department is operating downtown out of an old building, and but that does not discount the excessive use of force we see the department using against unarmed people of color on video and, uh, and not on video that we don't know about yet. And just please, everybody in my area, keep an open mind. Thank you. I... Thank you. The next person is Mark P. Mark P, you have been unmuted. Please identify yourself and you may address the council. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right, uh, good afternoon, Council President Arias and council members. My name is Mark Pisania Jr. I'm with the Youth Leadership Institute uh, as an organization who works with young people from across the city who themselves and their families have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic who persist in spite of structural and racial inequities, whose voices and experiences should be considered and prioritized, and who every day are working to make Fresno a better place. We support the recommendations made by Fresno Building Healthy Communities, Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, Faith in the Valley, and Fresno Barrios Unidos. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Mary Coombs. Mary, you have the floor. Hi, thank you. I wanted to say that I believe that spending 53% of our city budget on police is not only ineffective, but also immoral. Um, Addressing social problems with armed forces only makes things worse. There's an example of a recent police shooting that I think illustrates this. And I'm not talking about the murder of Isaiah Marietta Golding. This is another case. On March 23rd, Fresno police killed Gerald Johnson as he was hiding in a car in his backyard. Um, His mom had called police saying that her son might be on drugs. He was threatening members of the family with a shovel. Police knew he had mental health issues. Police said that he waved a gun during the nearly hour and 50 minutes that they negotiated with him. The negotiating police team arrived as well. At two hours and six minutes, Gerald had stopped talking to the police. And at that point, they approached the vehicle. They said he pointed a gun and they shot and killed him. The alleged gun was a pellet gun supposedly, uh, but that's beside the point. Why approach a person they knew to be mentally in, in, in mental distress and that they say they thought was armed, why the impatience to take action at two hours and six minutes? I wonder, would those officers have taken this rash action if they had not been counting on using their guns? This case hasn't even met with a huge public outcry, but I think it illustrates the problem with priorities that devote over half of a city's resources to an armed response to our social problems. I feel this council needs to do better than pointing a gun at our city's problems. And I hope that the council will stand with the community to cut the police budget and to create change. And I think the public and basic decency are demanding that you act now. Thank you. Thank you, council. The next person will be Christopher. Leo Green Washington, you've been unmuted. You have the floor. Good afternoon, council, president areas and council to the city council. I am here to take the stance of defunding the police and state that the budget for Fresno Police Department is 53% of the budget. And this budget can be um, allocated towards other community efforts such as education, entrepreneurship, nonprofits, the housing disparity, and other vital and essential resources. Um, The unemployment rate in Fresno has increased to 16.7% in March, partly due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but other um, other jobs have been lost due to the funding of the police department. I would also like to acknowledge briefly that there are only nine um, internal affairs officers and that the policy and procedure, the dissemination of policy and procedure within the Fresno Police Department is only low, is extremely low that there's only one person making sure that the entire police department knows policy. And then um, another issue is that the police department has ownership of 30 tow companies. 
Um, I'm here to state that if um, the city of Fresno is to be known as a vulnerable city of progress and change, that we should seriously um, consider what our priorities are. Thank you, and I by the back of my time. Thank you, Mr. Washington. The next person is Angelica Garcia. You've been unmuted. You have the floor. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, proceed. Hello, Council. My name is Angelica Garcia. I'm a resident of District 4. I am asking for a reinvestment into our communities. When we think of safety, we should not be thinking of police, but instead of youth serving organizations and trusted adults that are doing amazing work in our community already. The city of Fresno needs to shift the way they think of safety and allow our communities to share what safety looks like to them. Safety for you does not look the same to our people in the Fresno community. And I think that has been clear throughout this entire time of our community members sharing. Invest in our young people and equip them with skills that support their growth and their knowledge. Use a more holistic approach and healing centers in our communities where it's needed the most. Now more than ever, we need to center people that are most impacted by the pandemic, poverty, and racism in our city. We need for our general funds, our general fund dollars to be put back into our communities now. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Pedro Hernandez. Pedro Hernandez, you are now being unmuted. You have a minute to address the council. Hello. Pedro, can, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, um, well, good afternoon. I'll, I'll start off by identifying myself. I'm the hub coordinator with the Fresno Sunrise Movement, but I'd like to, first of all, ex express my disappointment with uh, city council members and particularly Andrew Hall, who have screens off and are not paying attention, but I hope that you all can at least hear me and that my words can reach you. Um, I wanna first start off by saying addressing what the police were presenting and that everyone loves dogs, but community events won't ever wash your hands for what you did to Isaiah. If anything is clear, Fresno is showing up today to demand that we want a different future, one that's rooted in liberation and community. But investment in the community means nothing if we're still killed by the police every day. Everyone wants to condemn the racism that we've been seeing in the last couple of days and weeks that really has been present these last centuries but no one wants to commit to utilizing their privilege and their authority to become anti-racist and use their platform to become anti-racist in everything they do. And so this is a critical moment. And so I'm urging you all to don't throw it away. Missing this moment means metaphorically shooting yourselves in the foot while real bullets continue to hit us. Abolish the police. Don't sell out your communities anymore and end the Fresno police state. This is an outrage that the Fresno police force um, continues to side with racists and white supremacists while our communities continue to uh, bear the unfit burden um, and clean up the mess from all this. So we're urging you to do your job. And again, our lives are at stake. And all social media, all Twitters is, 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 is paying attention to what y'all are going to be up to. So don't think that we'll forget this. Thank you. The next person on the list is the 105 number. You have been unmuted. Go ahead and address the council. Hey, thanks a lot, uh, President Arias. This is Gary Hans. I'm a registered uh, citizen of Fresno. A uh, brief history lesson. Amendments means to change things. Andrew Johnson, after Lincoln was assassinated, made an amendment to enslave Africans once again. But we started to realize the police system isn't broken. It's doing exactly what it was designed to do, to uh, instill fear and terrorism amongst people of the communities of color. Shockley said it best. If you allow people of color to have what you have, where's the balance? If you want to be superior, you have to disavow them to a racist society, which is what we still live in. People need to understand something. We talk about poverty as though it's a third world country. Poverty is racism. When you have an economical system that this allows you to prosper in life, it's a system of control and dominance. The police is the forefront of poverty and enslavement of people of color. 
the first contact you have in a legal matter is the police. If they deem to lock you up, you go before a judge, a district attorney, and so forth, and therefore you are enslaved in the prison system. They keep the system flowing. Understand this first and foremost. They instill fear in our children at young ages. They instill fear in us as old people. It is set up and designed for white supremacy and Nazis to continue what they're doing. This system of America in the United States was built on the back of enslavement of poor people, of African people, of people of color, to maintain the status quo of white supremacy. Don't get it twisted. This system is not broken. It's doing exactly what it was designed to do. And it is up to us as a people to break the system. We don't need to fix it. It's already fixed. We need to break it. And I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Alexander Ramos or Casey. You have been unmuted. You have the floor. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Alexandria Ramos or Casey. I was born and raised here in Fresno and I love my community. So that's why I'm here today to unequivocally again advocate that we defund the Fresno police. And what I think the more important point here is, is that I hope everyone really understands who has the ability to vote today and the ability to vote for these budgets to really understand that the community is out here in numbers, not because we hate y'all, not because, not because we want to create division. It is because we care about people's lives. It is because specifically we care about black and brown lives. And I hope that y'all understand that when it comes to this vote, what you are telling us is your priorities. As I have said, as other people have said, as MLK said, these are moral documents. You are telling us exactly who and what you care about. So you have to ask yourselves, do white tears, because that, that is what they are here. These are white tears. Are you choosing to prioritize white tears over black and brown fears and over their livelihoods, over people's lives? This is about systemic murder. This is not about what events you can go to later on, who you're gonna get money from. This is about people's lives. So please understand this vote is not about you. This vote is bigger than all of us. This is a moment in history. And I hope that you stand on the right side because otherwise all of your positions will not be there. There are enough people at these public comments and people got enough time on their hands now to get every single one of you out of office if we wanted to. People got nothing but time now. So I hope that you take this time to vote for the people and vote for a budget that speaks to what your heart says and not who you care about if it's re-election. Don't care about re-election right now. Care about people's lives, because that's why we're here. Thank you for your comments. The next person is Dr. Venice Curry. Dr. Curry, you have been unmuted. It's your opportunity to address the council. Thank you, council member Arias, and thank you to the other council members. Um, this is a systemic problem that has existed for decades. And the police request is a statement about what we consider important and priority. I would say that public health and racism are one in the same, that racism is a public health crisis and that any tool that is utilized to sustain racism is a public health issue. We are asking the police to basically take their resources and do jobs that they have not been trained for. So rather than say we are defunding the police, which I support the idea, we are renegotiating the scope of work. We are asking people who are not trained to be surgeons to go in and do a surgical, a, sur a surgical incision. Completely ridiculous and doesn't rely on the fact that they have no training. We should be deploying mental health professionals, social workers. We should be investing in people who actually have been trained to do work and therefore omit the need for paying the police to do services that they are not equipped to do. To me, that would ensure two things. One, the community would be safer but you know, police would be safer also, because if you're not trained to do something and you wade into the water, generally the outcome is not good. And so I would also suggest 
that in light of the numerous concerns that police officers have voiced, that one aspect may be to add psychiatric evaluations for each and every police officer to give them an opportunity to check out whether or not they are emotionally fit, psychologically fit to carry on the duties of a police officer. No one is saying it is, it is not challenging work, but if you're not prepared mentally and physically to treat people without bias, if you can't set your biases aside, if you can't see people as people versus making sure that you treat one group of people a certain way and you may meter out justice to someone else, then you're not really fit or qualified to be practicing in this space. So I would offer two things renegotiate the scope of work for police officers, give them, the, give them the duties that they are trained and responsible for, and take those duties that don't belong to them, social workers, mental health providers, homeless social workers or caregivers, remove those items from their list of work. And that would mean that they would not be paid to do those services. And then provide them some extra support in the way of consistent and regular psychiatric evaluations with a forensic psychiatrist who can certify their fitness to serve. Because it is, after all, public service, and we are the public, and as black and brown people, you are not serving the public when you're shooting people and killing people. We are asking for justice, and you know justice is trying to breathe right now. And as you can hear from all of the comments of community members from all districts of the city, it will not, this, it will not silence, it will not be silenced and nor will people be silenced. So I hope that you will re look at the budget with fresh eyes and the ability to do your, use your common sense to say, if you're not trained, this is not a space you should actually provide services in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Curry. The next speaker is Matthew Jindian. Matthew, you've been unmuted and you have an opportunity to address the council. Matthew, can you hear us? All right, we'll go to the next person. The next person is Zach. Zach, you are unmuted and you have a minute to address the uh, good, good afternoon, council. I wanna fully support Dr. Curry's statement, which was absolutely amazing. Just to follow up, it looks like our homeless task force in fiscal year 2019 uh, spent about 12.2 million of which 83% was going to police homelessness is not a crime, defund police, fund social services. My next door neighbor out here in District 2 is mentally ill. Um, a couple times a year, he has the police called on him by his own family because he goes crazy. I've seen three, four, even five patrol cars come and confront him when one, one social worker would do. Defund police, fund social services. We're spending my taxpayer money, $2 million a year for, for police misconduct. Defund police, fund social services. I yield my time. Thank you. The next person is Josefa. Josefa, you are, have been unmuted. Go ahead and address the council. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, proceed. Hi, I am a member of District 7, Esparza's district. And I also call to please defund the police, abolish it. It is only upholding white supremacy and capitalism. It does not serve us. It does not serve black lives. If we're going to prioritize like black lives, let's start with infrastructure. Let's provide them with clean uh, drinking water. Let's provide them with adequate health services. Let's provide them with mental health services. Let's do more to address the food desert that they're experiencing. Once black lives matter, all lives matter. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Desiree Miller. Desiree, you've been unmuted. Proceed with addressing the council. Desiree, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please, please proceed, please. Okay. Um, uh, this morning at the start of this council meeting, there was a couple of aggressive racial comments from the public speaking negatively towards the African-American community. Um, a council member addressed this disrespectful commentary by stating that persons would, would not have had the tenacity to do so in an in-person council meeting. 
that parties are taking advantage of not having to show their face. The community is directly addressing Andrew Hall and the Fresno Police Department regarding how policing in Fresno has affected parties in the community and his camera is turned off. Shortly after the few, the first few public comments. <clears throat> I believe this is a direct reflection of the effort the police department is willing to put forth to engage and connect with the community. The militant behavior of the Fresno of the Fresno Police Department as a theme is the reason for the overwhelmingly unanimous community commentary towards defunding the police department. And I would just like to second that based off of my experience today in listening and work in in being a part of this city council meeting today. Thank you for your comments. Next person is Noah. You've been unmuted. You have a minute to address the council. Noah, can you hear us? All right, we're, we will move on to Gavin Garza. Gavin? Do you hear me? Yes, proceed please. Okay, um, my name is Gavin Garza. I'm with Sunrise Fresno and I work here in Fresno. First of all, I find it abhorrent that I'm not seeing every council member's face right now. I'm reaching out to the leaders of Fresno to make the commitment to divest from the police while relocating those funds towards services that better serve the community. I'd like to share with you the perspective of one of many police officers in our country, former Dallas Police Chief Dave Brown has expressed concerns about not only overworked cops, but putting them in situations that do not best fit their job criteria. We're asking cops to do too much. Every societal fa failure we put on the cops to solve, he starts. Not enough to funding, he later follows sarcastically. I ask you to challenge your assumptions here. What is a cop with a gun going to do in a situation where someone poses no threat is having a mental breakdown? What is a cop going to do for the person who is struggling with a drug addiction? Are we to dismiss them? Are we to lock them up? If so, then why don't we fund rehabilitation in our prisons for those with minor felons when we know it works? Why can't we give this treatment and care to the communities that side social services so badly need access to them? The fact that everyone on this board is, is even interested, no. I have doubt in the fact that everyone on this board is even interested in representing their district to its needs or by funding social services or by helping those that live in food deserts. So I'll leave you with this. Think about your own agendas for a minute. When the mayor elect goes in the office, you won't get the chance again to fund the things you want to fund for the city. I have no doubt that attempts for the budget will increase, will happen and your motives will be stifled. Your decisions are out on public display and everyone is watching you to see what you do. One good look at the news will show you that people across the country have lost patience. All right, it looks like we have lost you, unfortunately. The next person is Mary Bell. Mary Bell, you are now unmuted and you can address the council. Hi. Um, my Hi, my name is Maribel Galaviz. I am a Latina educator and I am a resident and voter of District 5. I have seen firsthand the effects of generational trauma, including poverty, domestic violence, neglect, homelessness, and substance abuse. This trauma manifests itself in children through social, emotional, behavioral problems at school. These children are more likely to get suspended, expelled, develop mental health issues, and eventually drop out of school. This becomes an endless cycle, almost impossible to break. As an educator, I know the importance of prevention, early intervention, and breaking that cycle of trauma. We need to address the root causes of this trauma instead of expecting PD to solve the social problems we face. As a city, providing more funding to community and public services such as schools, libraries, parks, affordable housing, mental health, and healthcare can help our communities of color break that generational trauma. We need to reimagine safety by investing in our communities instead of police officers patrolling the streets. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Maribel. The next person is Des. Des, you are unmuted. You have an opportunity to address the council. Des, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Des, proceed please. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Okay, so earlier I heard a gentleman come on, I forgot his name, but he said that they had made contact with 8,180 homeless individuals in Fresno, California. If that's true, then our pit count is off, way off. They're claiming about 1,700 to 2,000 
individuals are out here. And if there was only approximately 2,000 homeless that were out here, which I know is a lot, um, then that means that the police have had contact with each individual four times already. So why have they not sent them into shelter or anything like that? And um, they said only 1.6% is accepting housing. Well, I believe that all triage shelters at the beginning of the year were full within the first week. The, the warming center was full within 48 hours. And now we have just heard what the media is saying that we just sheltered 400 people during COVID with approximately 300 people prior to that. So I don't, I don't know who the gentleman was that was saying only 1.6. You know why it's only 1.6, sir? Because there's no shelters and there's no beds. So if we utilize some of the $9 million that the Fresno Police Department gets in order to address the homelessness, maybe we would have more shelter or more permanent solution. Four years ago, Dave, he, passed, he was passed out down in the Tower District. I called the Fresno Police Department and I asked for help. As soon as I said it was a homeless man that was passed out, they gave me the phone number to Adult Protective Services. Adult Protective Services will not come out to a homeless individual because they're not in a house, in a, in a house community. Ms. Mayberry was assaulted last year and all the videos on homeless in Fresno show the amount of police brutality on the homelessness. They're saying that sanitation helps them clean up. Sanitation helps them take away their survival gear, tents, tarps, and everything. Again, all the videos on homeless in Fresno will show that they show up, they take the survival gear, and they leave a whole bunch of trash. Chewy, yes, yes, yes. last year, can I have the yield time? Yes, go ahead, Des. just finish okay. up your comments, please. One more, one more. Chewy was assaulted, and let me just say, this is really important. Chewy was assaulted one year ago today. She was beat up by the Fresno police officer at 8.30 a.m. Why did the mayor's office call an organization that I know and ask to have her housed by 6.30 p.m.? If they did not do anything wrong, they would have not got her an apartment within five hours of her getting beat up by the Fresno police officers. She'd been out there for 12 years. Imagine that. You get beat up by the Fresno police officers if you're homeless, you get housed. So I think we need to take the money away. Thank you. Thank you, Des. The next person is Asano Josephs. You've been... Uh, unmuted. You have a minute to address council. Uh, hello. Yes. Proceed, please. Hi, my name is Incendio Jacobs, and I would like to comment on how the majority of the council hasn't even spoken. For example, Mrs. Soroya has her mic. She was sleeping throughout the time, and I thought that was very insectable. Mm -hmm. And also, I can't believe you all. You all are not this fucking is, making comments. This is fake, guys. Oh. Stop. That's just too mean, all right. Thank you. A point of order uh, to uh, Council President. Point of order, Council President. I, yes, I would appreciate uh, if people make their comments directed at you as opposed to individual council members. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, public, please address your um, comments to the chair and not to individual council members. Next person is Daniel Collins. You've been unmuted. You have a minute to address council. Hello. Yes, please proceed. Uh, I would like to say we should make like the again, guys, like more. Yeah, Mike, hold on. Sorry, I handle it from this side. Okay, sorry, just more defensive right. comments. Thank you. Next person is Carrie. Carrie, we will unmute you. You have a minute to address the council. Let's try and keep this respectful and finish it off. We have 11 more members of the public that wish to address council. Carrie. Can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Awesome, what a great day to be a president. My name is Carrie Lorene Gala. my pronouns are she or they. I grew up in and currently reside in District 1. I am a college educated queer Latinx community organizer, convicted criminal and filthy drug addict in recovery. I pay taxes and I vote. I have been asking council member Soria and her staff in many ways and on multiple platforms what she plans to do about police violence in my community for as long as she's been in office with the same tired and toothless response. Community policing models are not the answer and they do not work. Increasing police violence budgets and access to communities does not prevent violence. Jerry Dyer and Andy Hall are not accountable to us and everyone knows it. They do what they want, including hurting our community members and children. I support the demands of NAACP Fresno State Chapter as well as local, regional and state demands to defund police and invest in community. If y'all put half the energy and resources into investing in and supporting communities as you have into police, this would be a thriving community. The parks must receive a majority vote. People want community, not criminality. Do your job, support community. 
develop meaningful relationships with CBOs who do the beautiful and painstaking work of building relationships with communities that have experienced the impacts of complex trauma, including systemic racism, not just when it's convenient or an election year. For many years, folks have asked the question, why do you think people say, uh, say that success is to leave the city? Because for generations, progress has seemed out of our grasp, but it's not. A lot of folks are moving home and they're ready to lead. If you don't love us, you can't lead us. We're done waiting, get in or get out. Black life is sacred, I yield my time. Thank you, Carrie. The next person is Ariel Lopez. If you have a minute to address the council. Ariel, would you like to address the council? Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Okay. Hi, my name is Ariel. I live in District 2 and I was raised in District 5, so I'm very much aware of how an unequal budget affects different sectors of the city. First, I'm asking the council to reject the mayor's request for a continuing resolution because COVID-19 has created deep deficits in the budget that need to be addressed. And second, I'm asking the council to defund the Fresno PD. Millions of dollars are used to settle police lawsuits. These dollars could and should be reallocated towards our social safety net. The social safety net includes services for domestic violence, mental health, education, drug rehab, housing, food, and social work. Money should be invested in services that help our communities, specifically those neighborhoods that have been systematically targeted by the Fresno PD. Defund the police, Black Lives Matter. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. The next speaker is Jonas. Jonas, you have been unmuted. You have a minute to address the council on the city of Fresno's police budget. Hello, good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Thank you, Council uh, President Arias. Thank you, Council members. I spent the whole day with you guys. And uh, just to give you the uh, your inf uh, information about uh, the sheriff that's being dead, he was killed by a veteran, okay? So I'm, I'm telling you, I deal with these veterans here. I don't want this thing to happen here. That's why I continue to work as a volunteer. I love these veterans. They have mental health crisis. So what do we need? We need some affordable housing. Let's invest in some mental health. Let's invest in education. And let's let's put our dollars in Southwest because I'm a resident of District 3 Miguel areas. I want to see better roads, sidewalks, so our kids can be safe. And I'm just telling you, man, I'm in a lot of pain. And I was, I was physically assaulted by a neighbor and the police really didn't do their job. They, I had to move, and I actually met Sarah. I went to Sarah, the Crime Victims Assistance. So Sarah is a very good person. I didn't even have the money to move. So these things are real, you guys. I had to move because they did not. I didn't get the help. When I called them, they didn't even come. I was assaulted. I went to surgery. So let's reconsider this and think for better ways to spend our money in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. The next person is Maya Z. You've been unmuted. You have an opportunity to address the council. Maya? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, can you hear her. Yeah. No. <laughs> You're a little distant, Maya. Can you speak up closer to the phone? Hear me? Hello? Barely. Hello. Continue. Uh, oh, can you hear me now? I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Wrong microphone. Um, I just wanted to uh, call for support for defunding the police. I understand North Fresno does feel apprehensive. They feel fear uh, about the cost to defund police. However, people south of Shaw, especially black and brown people, have lived in fear of those same police our entire lives for decades and decades. And our fear is just as justified, valid, and important as the fears of North Fresno residents who are talking on next door, apparently. Also, one way that we can defend the police is Shot Spotter. Shot Spotter takes up millions and millions of dollars of our taxpayer money every year, and we need it because nobody calls the police when gunshots are heard. We don't call the police because we're afraid of the police, and we're afraid of what they'll do to innocent people and even to suspects. There's no such thing as constitutional extrajudicial execution. And um, that is one reason why we should get rid of Shot Spotter and fund the advance for the advanced peace initiative. I'd also support funding the creation and maintenance of a searchable database for police officers to show how many of them have multiple complaints and grievances against them. 
I would also support funding a community oversight committee that overlooks the investigative procedures of complaints against police officers, and that means no affiliation with law enforcement, past and present. Thank you very much. I yield my time. Thank you, Maya. The next person is Alex Orozco. You've been admitted. You have the floor for a minute. Hello? Yes, proceed, please. Hello, my name is Alex Orozco. I live in District 5. I'm a member of DSA Fresno. So I'd like to talk about uh, the fact that, you know, we have a lot of members of the city council, you know, people of color, um, you know, Democrats. So at what point are, um, because there's a lot of like posturing going on about how you support like Black Lives Matter, how you support the African-American community. However, at what point are you actually going to listen uh, to the African-American community and actually implement those changes that they're um, pushing forward in terms of defunding the police and more accountability. So we have people like Luis Chavez who, you know, he worked for Mike Bloomberg and, you know, his racist stop and frisk policy. So, you know, do we actually have, are those Democrats on city council? Are they actually, you know, supportive of these measures? It doesn't really look like that's the case especially since, you know, we also have members, you know, Councilwoman Soria, Luis Chavez, having taken money endorsements from the Fresno Police Officers Association. So at what point are you actually going to put the lives of our communities forward instead of just relying on these contributions from the Police Officers Association and their endorsements? Because it doesn't look like it's very likely that you know, you're going to push forward for these measures that we're advocating for. And also, it's very disrespectful to have your camera off. Doesn't look like you're, when, when people have their camera off, it doesn't look like they're paying attention. I know it's a long meeting, but you're getting paid for this. That's it. Thank you, Alex. The next person is Sebastian. You've been unmuted. You have a minute to address the council. Hi, uh, my name is Sebastian. I'm from District 5, Eastside, Fresno. Uh, I just want to communicate that individuals in South Fresno have always been criminalized and disproportionately policed, but have never been safe. And these past two years, city council have worked on policies criminal criminalizing homeless individuals, leading to further conflicts with the police department. The map point program is under resourced and shouldn't be treated as an alternative to a thousand dollar fine that homeless people can't pay. And I want to reiterate the importance of defunding the police and bringing that money towards helping the communities in South Fresno that need it. If you ask anyone from South Fresno what they need in their area, the last thing they'll say is the police. This means we need proper allocation and supporting policies like Measure P and Advanced Peace, rather than setting up a police commission by city councilmen who have received over 24,000 in donations from the police department. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. The next person is James. You've been a meter. You have a minute to address the council. James, please identify yourself. Thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me good? Yes, please proceed. My name is James Peters. I'm a resident of District 6. Uh, I hear a lot of two people today talking about how we need to be fun and abolish the police. But for right now, I'd like to talk about the commission that has popped up in a response to the um, uprising that's going on in this country. Um, and it seems like you know a good outcome will come of this. But when you look at who's actually on the commission, you see that there's people like Council members Soria and Chavez, who have been endorsed by the Fresno Police Officers Association, who take money from them, and it doesn't seem as though anything will change coming from this commission. We can't trust them or anyone else, or the other two people on the commission who have ties to police, um, to protect black and black and brown lives and make the police a better institution. When they are either cops or cop sympathizers themselves. Um, there is no reforming this institution that was created to protect the disgusting white supremacy this country was founded on. Abolish the police, I yield my time. Thank you. The next person is Jen Rojas. Jen, you've been unmuted. You have a minute to address the council. Yes, hi. Um, again, it's Jennifer Rojas, uh, program coordinator with Fresno Verdes Unidos. I'm reading a comment on behang, uh, behalf of one of our youth. Um, who has been on this um, Zoom call all day, uh, but was unable to give her own comment. Um, this is a comment from our, our women empowered youth, Jalea McAdams, who is um, a young black Fresno leader, age 19, uses she, her pronouns. 
and her comment is that people of color and black people shouldn't walk in their own city and fear cops. Fresno police are intimidating. I feel like right now there is no point in us saying anything because cops are always seeming to win over us people. If you guys don't do anything about this, it is always going to be this way. And sooner or later, before you guys think, Fresno, which is my home city, will be gone, just like any other city. Action needs to be taken and done properly. People like you act like you care about us, but do you really do something? You need to defund the police and use those finances to finance our, better finance our schools, better finance homelessness, uh, because these are the main things that the city of Fresno is struggling with. And again, that was our youth comment. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Noah. Noah, you've been unmuted. You have a minute to the council. Oh, I'd like to say kill niggers, fuck fat. All right. Next person is Rosita. Rosita, figure it all. Rosita, you have the floor. You have a minute to address the council. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Okay, so my name is Rosita Figueroa. I'm a resident of District 7, um, so Nelson Esparza. I'm not sure how many times I have to say this, but just in case, defund the police. Nelson, you said, um, as a council member, I'm committed to building a strong local economy, fighting for safer and healthy neighborhoods, providing access to city hot re resources, and reassuring that our city's future is brighter than the past. So please don't disappoint me. Esmeralda Lasoria, I supported you. Don't disappoint me. Miguel, Miguel Arias, I backed you up when those people went to your house. Don't disappoint me or we will vote you out. All right, the last speaker today will be Dr. Matthew Jindian. Dr. Matthew Jindian, you have the floor. You've been admitted to address the council. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Please proceed. Thank you, Council President Arias. Uh, my name is Matthew Gendian. I'm a professor of sociology, born and raised in Fresno, currently employed in District 4 and reside in Council Member Soria's uh, district. Uh, first, I support the demands made by Fresno State and AACP, as well as Faith in the Valley's call for funding for advanced peace and BHE's call for more funding for parks and green space throughout Fresno. Second, I recognize public safety requires a multi-pronged approach. It's important to identify what FPD is best equipped to do that others cannot do, and what they are doing that others could possibly do more effectively and efficiently. During the presentation today, I kept hearing FPD is understaffed for a city of our size, but it seemed that data point of 1.4 officers per 1,000 civilians, Chief Hall noted, did not include the 67 officers with fast Fresno Unified and Housing Authority. Also, this ratio is not just about generic recommendations for staffing, but about the specific need. Is there a demonstrated need for increased patrol officers? On one basis, convince the public of the need rather than just quote generic staffing recommendations. While I have officer engagement with our community, to schools and boys and girls clubs, I'm wondering if there's required volunteer community service requirement for FTD officers like there are for tenure track faculty at Fresno State. Finally, I appreciate the need for cost savings for blood draws. I wonder if that particular service that conducted 1.25 blood draws per day could be better provided through a public-private partnership than an FPD phlebotomist. Lastly, I want to point out my disappointment to repeatedly hear the phrase bad guys from one of the division chiefs. It's important to approach everyone as a person first and differentiate between the individual's behavior and the value that each has as a human being. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Didion. Um, after receiving thousands of emails on the city of Fresno's police budget and hearing from nearly 100 speakers, in today's budget hearing, I'm gonna ask us to take a 10 minute break and return uh, back for questions from the council. Council, enjoy your 10 minute restroom break and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Our SWAT team is called out anywhere between 12 and 15 times a year. So, yeah. um, and that's not just, um, um, and, and I apologize, I'm gonna go back a little bit for having my camera off we got a situation right now that may turn into a SWAT call. So I was monitoring that. So I wasn't uh, purposely uh, avoiding uh, the uh, deal, but I do have another job besides budget hearing. Um, 
but about 12 a year. So if you average it out about one time a month, that also includes high risk warrants. So these aren't just SWAT calls. These are, these are suspects or subjects who have a warrant and have a history of violence or gun use. Sure. So that's about 12 times a year. Got it. And then my, my last question, because I know my colleagues have questions too, and I'm going to be respectful of that. Do, do kind of walk us, give us an overview of what officers that are doing the traffic, um, uh, in the traffic division have, and I guess the question I'm really asking, Chief, and I know you're very familiar with this, that was your, your unit, do, do officers currently have a traffic violation quota um, right now that they have to um, abide by on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis? Um, is, that, is that accurate or is that not? It's absolutely not accurate. Um, they're told to go out, work school zones, and work areas where collisions occur. Um, they were specifically told not to cherry pick locations where collisions don't occur. Um, so we, we, we really try to avoid uh, the appearance that we're writing tickets uh, for the right reasons and, and not, not, a, not simply looking at a single stop sign way out in the uh, fringes of the city to look for a stop sign violation. We're trying to reduce collisions and save lives and that's always been our focus. And I think if you look at that, at the history of the traffic unit, we've been able to cut fatalities in half in our city, and I think it's been in a very effective program. And and so so understanding that, what is the decision making process, Chief, that that the, the department goes through for um, doing these uh, traffic stops? And and is is there a matrix or a formula, or is it just based on the calls that the department gets for unsafe conditions near school or an intersection? Walk us through what that looks like for the department. Well, well schools always get a priority especially the elementary schools where you have kids that don't pay attention. Um, we really want the traffic slowed down in our schools, So they get the priority. Uh, get, besides that, we get mapping. Uh, we get uh, collision mapping system that place uh, collision uh, in certain locations, and then we put officers on the spot. So it's a combination of those, right? It, it, it's calls that we get for, for, especially around schools. We do back to school. I know we've worked with our um, department on speeders and folks that don't respect the, the traffic signals and that sort. Um, with regards to the DUI checkpoints, is that what's the process behind where those get placed and how often? Well, there's a case law that specifically requires us to follow when we do a, a checkpoint. And there's a number of things. Ingersoll versus, uh, I think, the state of Michigan or um, is, is the actual case law uh, Supreme Court ruling that we have to follow. And it requires us to set up a checkpoint, how we set it up, the lighting, the number of phones, how we do the survey. We have to do speed surveys and things like that. But most importantly, we have to know that there are DUIs that are occurring in that immediate area. So every one of our DUI checkpoint locations has a collision map that's part of a package that we submit to the court uh, that will show collisions in the area of a checkpoint. And, and are those collision um that are registered in that collision map, um, are they validated to be DUIs or are they suspected DUIs or what's the, the matrix for that? These are these are collision stats. So where we've had a collision and a DUI arrest occur. Okay. Okay. Those are the questions I have for now. And like I said, any of those any information that we were able to get, I'd love to get that, um, especially if we were able to break it by zip code, that would be very, uh, helpful for me. Um, with that, President, turn it back. Yeah, you know, I want to clarify. I don't know if that information can be uh, given via zip code. So if it's policing district oh. uh, to help us save time, is that okay? That works. Okay, great. Thank you, City Manager, for the clarifying question. Um, with that, Council Member Soya, you're up next. Thank you, Council President. Um, and wow, it's been a long day. Um, I appreciate everyone's um, participation. Um, first and foremost, um, the public um, that took the time to sit through a number of hours and, and going through the, the budget hearing. I think that this is what, what demonstrates the, the strength of a democracy. And we, I, I personally appreciate the public participation. So I wanna thank everyone. Um, before, I have some statements that I'll make at the end, um, just of some thoughts that have come to mind over the, not only today, but over the last couple of weeks. But I did want to ask the chief some um, specific questions. 
some of them were related to, some of them were answered already from the questions asked by Council Member Chavez, so I appreciate that. I did kind of want to follow up um, on a couple of things that you did answer regarding those 30% of calls that involve, involve mental health um, issues and how we have partnered up with the Department of Public Health. Um, does that really happen in every single call? Because I just witnessed an incident um, less about a little bit over a month ago where there was no one with a mental health experience or a mental health professional that showed up um, to call was someone experiencing a mental health crisis. Uh, so can you speak to maybe um, what are the hours that the Department of Public Health is uh, responding to those types of calls? Um, how does that work? Uh, can the, if, if in fact the Department of Public Health is the first person that it is to respond to some of these calls, are they, have they thought about also helping us maybe cover the cost of sending a police for backup? I'm just trying to wonder those things. Yeah, uh, to answer your question is, is if 1200, we have 1200 call emergency calls and one third of those are mental health. Obviously the, the uh, half dozen or so uh, CIT officers that are paired with a social worker can't respond to all of them. So we have to prioritize that. We work two shifts, which is days and swings, which when most of our calls come in. Um, but, but to answer your question is no, uh, we don't have social workers on staff at the police department or the city. So we rely on the, the county's Department of Health to provide that service for us, and they get millions of dollars for that service. Um, so I don't know what call they respond to outside of our 911 system um, because I can't track that, but I do know the ones that occur internally. Well, this was a 911 call. That's why I'm wondering. There was no one from the Department of Public Health or Behavioral Health that showed up to this particular call. And I'm wondering what kind of training are officers receiving? Because I was there and it didn't seem like there was the, the, I don't know, I just didn't, I don't know how much training are folks receiving to address these types of calls because I just didn't think that it was the best way to respond to this, to this particular situation. All of our officers received, uh, received training uh, on, on mental health. Um, we're, we have nearly 100% of our officers now trained uh, in CIT with crisis intervention training. And, and that's, 40, that's a 40 hour training block um, where they get instruction from social workers, healthcare professionals, and, uh, and psychologists on how to deal with that. Um, I'll be honest, with you, some people have better skills than others, we know that. Um, and uh, the fact is, is, is we do the best we can with it. We are, as some of your callers, the call, people that called and pointed out, we're not social workers. Uh, we're, not, we're not trained psychologists or police officers who have been asked or demanded that we respond to these and, uh, and we do the best we can with it. Um, and I think, and I appreciate that. I'm, try, I'm trying to understand because I think that that's kind of what the community is saying. You guys are now, your demand in terms of responding to all these calls have become greater. Um, and yeah, you guys get some training, but is it really enough training to be able to respond to these types of calls? So that's, you know, just in kind of witnessing a, uh, a particular situation, um, I was curious about that. Um, I do want to dive deeper, um, you know, after this budget hearing with the Department of Public or Behavior Agency, really when are these people working? Because is it just from nine to five that they'll show up? Um, this was in a nine to five call. Um, so I'm wondering um, what moments or what hours are they actually responding to those 911 mental health calls? Yeah, they, they work till 10 p.m. Uh, so it's, it's from eight to 10 p.m. at night, seven days a week. But keep in mind that's six teams that we have out. So if you do the math, we may only have one or two teams out at any given time for the entire city of 110 square miles. So it's just not possible for um, a CIT officer and a social worker to be at all calls 
approximately 30 percent of our call and i agree with you council member that um we would love to be out of the social work business we would lo love to be out of the homeless business. um but the fact is is we're one of the few agencies government agencies that answer the phone 24 7 and on holiday that can respond with a live body so uh, anything we can do to work together towards eliminating these as police calls i would support okay um thank you for for that and i have a couple of more questions um i know that the previous our previous um police chief has mentioned in um other settings that when he was there, he had embraced Obama's 21st century policing recommendations. I'm wondering what those are, um, are, and are we really practicing them through our department? How are they working? Have we evaluated them? And then on top of that, um, how do those align and are our policies that aligned with the, you've heard the eight can't wait. Um, and I know that there's been a call for, for that. Folks are saying that we are only following two. I know that you more recently just um, issued a temporary ban on the chokehold. Um, I don't think it goes far enough. I think we need to permanently ban it. I think that we see, you know, bigger, um, larger municipalities going in that direction, many cities already um, in the state as well. So I think that um, it would show um, leadership from our end to permanently ban that. Um, so just wanted to kind of give you an opportunity to talk about those. Well, the pillars uh, that you're talking about, we were the, one of the first agencies in the nation to actually embrace them and implement them into our policy. I do have those available for you if you'd like to do them, uh, but we have already uh, done extensive work on it and have incorporated that into our policy. As far as the, uh, the it can't wait, uh, I believe that uh, we have, have met all eight, um, and uh, meeting with my advisory committee language that can be can be fixed but i believe if you if you all the eight can't wait uh, uh man's request on, on this department uh we're already we're already doing all eight uh, what about the elimination of the chokehold are you going to support the permanent ban again i'd like to have that discussion based on based on the facts i think i think if your life's in danger if it's if if it's to save a life uh, then I, I, I would be concerned about totally banning something uh, because um, there are situations where uh, if, if it save a life, uh, then, then it might be appropriate. In, rather than using a gun, for instance, if I, if I could um, get an officer to do that rather than shoot the person, I would probably uh, be okay with that. But I think it has to be a very high bar. But so then we wouldn't be completely aligned with the eight can wait because that's one of the eight can wait um, policies or reforms. Well, it depends on what what a ban means to them. Um, uh, I guess so. If it's if it's for the life of the officer or life of another citizen, uh, and the use of chokehold prevents other uses of deadly force, um, then we should at least have that conversation. Well, we'll be having, I guess, a more extensive conversation on Thursday, so be ready for that, because I know that this council um, will want to, you know, um, at least have an up, or up and down vote to see where folks are at. Um, and, you know, I want to just I'll just ask you, you've been the chief now, how many, how long, Mike? I promoted in August 16th of last year. So, um, you you close to a year, and so I know that you came in excited about the opportunity to kind of um, leave a legacy at the end of your tenure in terms of, um, you know, things, changes that can happen in the department. And so I just want to see what are some of those things that you have already instituted since you're, since you're becoming chief that you feel that are positive changes um, for the services that we're providing the community? Well, I think some of them has been just in the, in the change in um, on how we look at um, our officers' actions and how we deal with them. And if you, you know, if you look uh, and if you compare it from when um, the current independent police auditor was hired in 2017 and compare it to 2019 stats, our department generated 
internal affairs. In other words, when we when we uh, find a fault with our own officers, that has increased 66% in 2019. Where citizen complaints against officers actually decreased by 38%. Our terminations have increased by over 200% since 2017. Suspensions are up 88%. So total, our total uh, is, is uh, when you look at all demotions and suspensions and terminations, it's up 132% uh, since 2017. So I think, I think one of the biggest changes that I'm that I'm moving forward with is accountability. That's good to to hear. While the numbers are kind of startling, it's good to hear that um, we are trying to um, eliminate the bad apples that I think taint. The, the work that you guys do on a, on a daily basis. Um, question on training. Um, I know folks have, you know, you, you mentioned about the mental health, 40 hours. Um, is that a one-time one -time deal or officers are in a continual training mode for that? That's a one-time deal right now. We'll have to decide if, if we recycle them again. We're just now getting through 100% of our officers and any new hires. So at this point, we'll have to decide if we if we want to continue that. That was That's not funded by POST right now, so we don't get any reimbursement for that training. And it's quite expensive to send an officer to 40 hours of training, as well as the instructor's cost. Um, what about implicit bias? Do we have um, specific training as it relates to implicit bias? Um, is it a one time? How off or how, how many hours? Yeah, the implicit bias training is a reoccurring training that we do as part of our professional standards. So that is a training that, that is ongoing. It is approved by uh, post and uh, its officers are given it, I believe every every two years they, they get a course on that. How many hours do they get? It's a 40 hour course, but it's not just on, on, on excuse me. There's, there's ongoing courses, but I think it's a four-hour block of a, of a bigger course. Okay. Um, some folks have brought up the issue of the fact that our sometimes our officers are pretty overworked. They're stretched in terms of, you know, they do a lot of overtime. Do you believe that some of that can have an impact on an officer's ability to respond to a certain type of certain types of calls, if they're working um, a lot of overtime or they're having, they're doing all these extra contracts. I know like, for example, there's um, private contracts with like Bobby Salazar's in my district and other businesses. So if we have officers that are not only doing their 40 hour a week with us, but are doing all this extra, are we um, setting them up um, so that they, they're not, you know, um, responding maybe the most adequate way um, to our com for our community? To answer your question, yes, but I want to caveat that. We limit the amount of overtime they can work beyond their normal work hours. Uh, they can work uh, 16 hours a week uh, overtime, um, and they have to have at least one day off a week. Um, the, the problem occurs is that officers who work night and and uh, weekends often have uh, stresses at family with family uh, when the kids have to get up uh, or they have to babysit. Um, also court, uh, they don't have court during their shift. They have to uh, get up uh, at eight or nine in the morning. Well, if you got off at six in the morning and you have to get up at eight, sit in court for six or seven hours, that can have an impact as well. I think the biggest stressor on our officers right now is simply uh, it's simply the call load, the, the, the call, the call, the call, the call, and, and the call, the emergency call to the emergency call to emergency call has a has an impact on people, and, and it does weigh heavily on our cops. Thank you for um, providing the information. That was going to be my follow up. So we're hearing the call load is kind of the the biggest one of the a big issue in our department because our call volume is so high. Um, so could we better? Could we, do you feel like there's an opportunity in this moment to um, dive deep into kind of the types of calls and try to figure out how we lessen that call, the call load for our officers? I absolutely do, Councilman. Absolutely. 
is that part of your plan over the you know the, for the remaining time that you have with us well i have to balance that with services so if if i were to say that um we're not going to do community policing events um, or we're not going to do um, a bicycle patrol to handle calls for service um, or we're we're going to uh, we're going to eliminate some other service like responding to homelessness that's not a crime or to mental illness that's not a crime then then somebody's got to pick up that load and until we identify who that is I don't know who to give those calls to well and I think absolutely you're you're absolutely correct and I think that there is a desire at least from members of the community I know from my part I've expressed my uh, while I appreciate the work that, you know, some of the positives that of the homeless task force, I think that the 1.6% rate, um, success rate of trying to house folks um, tells me that we're not focused in, on the right issue. Um, we need to figure out investments so that we can provide the, the drug addiction, the mental health and temporary housing for folks and maybe give this, give that job to someone else so that our officers can focus on you know the real police, the criminals. Um, that that's what I that's what I would like, which is why I, I brought that motion um, forward. Um, the other um, question that I have for you um, regarding um, dispatchers, I know that this was a this has been a big issue over the last um, few years. We added um, additional uh, dispatchers. Um, how many vacancies do we have? Are we being successful in, in filling those vacant positions? Because I know that, that that was another big issue that the department had. Yeah, dispatchers is, a, is another high stress job. Um, very difficult, very, very difficult job, very uh, um, uh, skilled work. Um, the turnover is high in that unit. We have currently 10 vacancies. Keep in mind that six of those were approved by council to replace positions that we got rid of we just haven't been able to fill them yet so we're hoping uh, to fill those uh, that will give us uh, some help but, but keep in mind the state has recommended 40 additional dispatchers to come into compliance with uh, with state regulations and, and the fact is 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 when when it takes uh, sometimes four to seven minutes to answer a 911 call um, that's a tragedy that's a tragedy for our city and and I put that in perspective if you uh, pulled your son or daughter out of a pool and we're holding him or her and called 911. Can, can you imagine what that's like to sit on a phone call ringing for, for four or five minutes before we even start to respond? And, and that's, that's what we have to fix in this community. Yeah. Um, I, I've actually, I experienced that when someone broke into my home, I didn't call police because I knew that I wouldn't actually get a live person there just because of how, you know, the high volume that we have. Um, so a couple more questions that I have. Um, I know that I asked this information of the entire city, um, but I wanna get more specific, um, not just with actually the, the police department, I want this information across from all departments in terms of ethnic breakdown. Um, I know that there's been um, folks People have been concerned that um, our police force only has a small percentage of African American police officers, um, women as well. Um, so I would like kind of the ethnic and gen gender breakdown, but I also like to see um, that breakdown um, by the type of officer. If it's a regular officer, sergeant, captain, lieutenant, deputy, and then so forth. So if we could have the ethnic breakdown, I would appreciate that. Yeah, I can have that for you anytime you want. I can go over it right now if you'd like, but I can also provide you. I don't want to um, take more time of my council colleagues. If you could submit that to us, that would be great so that we, we can take a look at it. Um, the other last question that I do have, um, COVID-19 expenses. We know that the city of Fresno has been one of the four fortunate large cities when it comes to um, getting federal relief dollars. Um, are you guys claiming any COVID-19 related expenses? 
Yeah, I believe we, we are claiming about $750,000 in COVID related expenses. What are those mostly? Well, it includes uh, equipment for uh, uh, working from home, uh, but it also includes the additional patrols that we initially had for, uh, for businesses that were closed. And we were seeing a sharp increase of uh, burglaries to our, our vacated businesses. Uh, so we put out extra patrols uh, in shopping centers. But not like direct response, because I know that one of the issues was that, and I know we were not in kind of alignment with that. You, you didn't want to really have the PD focus on enforcement of any of our kind of shelter in place um, guidelines that we had set. So it doesn't include any of that, right? It does not include enforcement efforts. And what it included was uh, crime prevention efforts related to the COVID closures. Okay. Just because I think in my perspective, we saw missed opportunity. I think that um, given the fact that, you know, we, we were, were able to um, cover some of, uh, some of those expenses, um, which we know is a big, a big deal for our general fund. Um, but, you know, it is what it is at this point. Hopefully the, the federal government does allow us to use part of those dollars to um, deal with our shortfall. And I think those are all my questions. I did want to just, um, if you guys could bear with me, make a couple comments just as I was um, listening to to our residents and um, been participating or participated in the Black Lives Matter March um, weeks ago. We were sent for, for, for I think, um, the residents again for all their comments. I can tell you that I hear you. Um, over the last few weeks, I've heard the outcry from our Fresno community or the brutal death of George Floyd and the real injustice that permeates not only our country, but our city. And I hope that all of us that sit on, that are sitting on this dais um, have heard as well. I hope that you, that you hear that Fresnans want transformative change and that they expect nothing less. We are living unprecedented times as we are faced with a pandemic that is impacting black and brown communities in a disproportionate way. And that at the same time, through the murder of a black man, we are reminded not that we are reminded of the greatest sin of our country, which is slavery and the racial inequality that has yet to be erased or at least rectified. While these conversations may be uncomfortable for some, we must remember that this is our moment that we all have the responsibility to make things right and better. We need more than symbolically supporting, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, the art proclamations for stating that we, we do stand in, you know, with Black Lives Matter. We must capitalize on this moment to reimagine the system that historically has kept people of color marginalized. It is our opportunity to redesign how our city will work for all Fresnans and how we will bring justice to communities that have been left behind. We must evaluate whether our current policies, and I'm not just talking about our police department, I'm talking about a budget as a whole, um, whether our current policies are aligned with our community values. And by all the comments, it seems as though we are missing the mark and we must really do an internal evaluation of the work that we will continue to invest in um, through our budget. So with that, um, I just want to thank everyone for, for participating. I look forward to a robust conversation over the coming weeks and over the coming months as we try to determine how we better spend every single taxpayer money, um, how the community is asking us to deliver um, services. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, for um, the information that your team um, provided us. It was very detailed. I didn't even realize the countless specialized units that we have, um, I think that we may have to reevaluate that too, as we're looking at, you know, what are our priorities within our police department? Thank you. And uh, I yield my time, Council President. Councilwoman Soria, Council Member Sparza, you're up next. Thank you, Council President. Uh, Chief, I appreciate the presentation by yourself and uh, your deputy chiefs. Um, I think there was uh, probably more detail in there than there was uh, the last budget uh, last year. 
Um, so I think uh, it was a learning experience for uh, here, us here on council as well as the, the public. Uh, and of course, I do want to thank uh, everyone, uh, all the participants of the meeting today, uh, not just the folks who showed up here on Zoom, but everyone who's been engaged uh, throughout uh, the last several weeks uh, and the organizers who have, have, have really pushed uh, and helped uh, to keep momentum going. The level of activism that we're seeing right now is uh, truly incredible and uh, you certainly have met the moment. Uh, so uh, Chief, I, I wanted to, to follow up on something I had asked for, I think it was last week on Thursday, um, with respect to the homeless task force. I'm not sure if you uh, were able to gather this data yet or if the administration was, but you made reference to the 30% uh, of health uh, service related to, to mental health. I wanted to know how that compared to, you know, with, within the uh, homeless task force calls. I, I would venture to say that there's a higher rate uh, within the homeless task force responses, uh, but wanted to see if we were able to get that answer. Um, Council member, can you, what, what is exactly the question you're asking is the number of, of calls our homeless task force handled? Not, not the number of calls. So the, at the last meeting, uh, I had asked, about getting uh, a count of the, uh, or just sort of the percentage of calls uh, that were more of a, of a violent nature um, or that, that, that truly required uh, an armed sworn police officer. Um, in terms of the task force responses and the call for service they responded to. Uh, and, and again, I was reminded today, as you as you brought up how 30% of our, our service calls are mental health related. That's generally, uh, you know. So I wanted to know how does that compare to the homeless task force? Uh, you know, what what percentage of, again of those uh, calls uh, that the homeless task force is responding to require a sworn officer to, uh, to respond to? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I can get you the number of mental health calls that we respond to that are high priority zeros and ones, which are considered life threatening or emergency calls. That's, that's not a problem, council member. As far as the homeless task force, um, I don't think they break it down by mental illness or non-mental illness. Um, they just, they just respond to calls. And if you, you know, if you, you know, they, they cleaned up six, over 6,500 camp last year that about 2400 this year obviously the covid pandemic has reduced that number um, and we won't we won't hit that 6500 mark um, so i don't believe that the homeless task force tracks that i can tell you that um how many uh, how many arrests were made uh, as from the homeless task force um, and how many contacts and, and how many weapons were taken off but but it's i, I have no ability to say how many uh, would have required a police or not, um, because they just handled it. Does that make sense? No, no, it, it makes sense. I, it just, you know, leading up to, uh, you know, our, our vote on the budget next Thursday, um, you know, all, all of this data is, is critical. I mean, any, any type of data that there is, right? I mean, you're telling us, you give us this 30% figure, um, and then within that, you can break down the zeros and the ones. Um, uh, so we're looking for something similar within the homeless task force. And then looking for metrics, right? That could, you know, very clearly define for us uh, the um, again the the calls the homeless task force responded to that that really required a, a an officer. Uh, so I mean, the metrics that are available, data is available. That's critical in our decision as we're looking at. Yeah, most of our homeless task force calls are self-generated which is a priority seven, regardless if it's an emergency or not. If they're self-generated, they always get a priority seven. So there would be no way for me to, to calculate um, any calls that were initiated by the homeless task force, whether uh, they were simply just cleaning up a camp or dealing with a, a mentally disturbed person with a knife. I can tell you that, you know, we made um, 510 arrests in 2019. We're about 112 arrests this year. Uh, for various violations. That's, that's about all I can tell you right now. The, the, those arrest numbers were for the homeless task force specifically you're referring to? Yes, sir. Uh, so moving on to the SWAT, uh, one of the, I think it was Deputy Chief, might have been Reed, who <clears throat> told us it was about 12 to 15 
calls uh, per year on SWAT. And just for the public record, I didn't want to interrupt the presentation. Um, you know, when when these officers are not responding to a, a SWAT call, uh, they're I mean they're on patrol, correct? I mean they I mean what a, what occupies their their time? Are they uh, just yeah. rent they file? Don't get, yeah, they don't get to sit around in the station waiting for the twelve calls. Mm -hmm. They're all assigned to a job. Some are assigned to patrol. Some are a detective. They're, they're they're spread out throughout the organization. And when we get a call, that becomes a priority. They leave their assignment, come together for that call handle it, and then go back to their site. Uh, Chief, uh, so with respect to uh, some of the, the capital equipment, right, specifically what I'm, what I'm looking at here to, to start with is uh, the, the helicopter. So question, I mean, how many helicopters do, do the president uh, currently utilize? Do we have it? Yeah, we, we currently have two helicopters. Uh, we, we used to have a plane, but we sold it. Uh, I think last year, the year before last. Um, so we have two two helicopters, and they're about 15 years old now. I mean, and so I mean, given the given how old they are, just uh, you know, I, I'm looking to find out what the, the ongoing costs associated with uh, with helicopters are. Obviously, we we own them, right? Um, but in terms of uh, gas maintenance, uh, additional personnel, uh, any kind of synopsis you can provide in terms of the ongoing costs associated with the helicopter? Yeah, the operating cost for our, our air support unit um, for the helicopters and maintenance, fuel, uh, facility, and things like that, they average between about a million to 1.4 million a year, depending on uh, what breaks on, on the helicopter. Anything that leaves the ground is hugely expensive to repair. Um, so if if a rotor gear or something like that breaks, it's obviously uh, a big expense item. Uh, but, but probably you could say about a million dollars a year for operations, and then there's personnel costs as well. And are these, uh, are these two in the air on a daily basis? Uh, or uh, what is the criteria for when the, uh, the birds go in the sky? Well, truly, a helicopter is only effective if it's in the air when, when they're needed. Uh, by the time they, they get out, they fire up the bird, get it in the air, generally the call's over. Uh, so we do patrol flights. We fly about 1,600 hours per year. Uh, we generally fly during the swing shift time, our busiest times, but we kind of have a day overlap. Um, we average about 35, about 3,600 calls um, a year uh, with our helicopter. And our average response time is about 30 feet, 36 seconds, which is quite a bit faster than our normal seven minute response time for priority zero, our highest priority. Sure, sure. So, I mean, I, I asked some of these questions just uh, obviously to get an idea of what, uh, what the physical nature of, you know, of, of having the helicopters is. Uh, but just more with respect to uh, some of the concerns from my residents, uh, there, are, there are some that, that do appreciate uh, having them up in the air. Uh, there are, are many uh, others who, who do not. Um, and, you know, taking a look at my district, representing the central part of the city, portion of the southeast part of the city, um, you heard some, some of the sentiment from uh, the folks here on the on the call today, the audience. Um, and there's a lot of, of that sentiment throughout my district. Uh, they feel as if, you know, it hovers around our, our neighborhoods more often uh, than it does maybe in the north part of the city. Uh, so again, when I ask for the, the criteria, right, what is the criteria for where uh, it does hover? Uh, and obviously, it's on standby. Um, so that, that, that's what I was looking for. You know, where, 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 you know, whereabouts does it sort of kind of establish a holding pattern? Um, I know when there's calls, you know, they go. But I mean, uh, is, it con is, there, is it constantly a cycle of, of calls they're responding to? Uh, you know, what is the criteria for where, where the holding pattern is established? Yeah, you know, I used to be an observer in the in the Skywalk. Actually, I was a supervisor of the Skywalk program. So um, when you get up in the air, even though the city seems like it's big, uh, the city becomes a postage stamp for the helicopter. It's very difficult to stay even in the city limits. Uh, so they pretty much fly uh, the entire city in a loop unless they're called for service. Um, it, it would be very difficult to hover in one policing district. Um, you would just you'd get dizzy going in circles. 
so kind of broadening this conversation, um, just again for the, for the public's record, I know not everyone took, uh, was able to take the time uh, to go through the, the different line items of, of the department and the inventory, right? Folks, you know, have, have jobs and are uh, at this, this time making dinner and such. Uh, but just for the public record, right? I, I want to know what what other type of equipment that, that we're in possession of in the police department that it Trust. To, to be frank, of, of a militaristic type nature, um, right? Equipment that's not regularly used in the course of uh, police business on like on a weekly basis. Um, so what what are, what are we? Um, Councilman, Council, you broke up a little bit. Let me see if I got the gist of your question. You want to know what type of items we have that are that are equivalent to a military-based item? More or less, yes. You know, I mean, kind of some of the big-ticket items that uh, that we certainly don't see every day, um, right? That that we are in possession of as as kind of a a contingency type uh, measure. Uh, just for for the record, I, and and you know, I, I'm curious, uh, and I know. Uh, folks on, on this call throughout the city are, are curious as to what some of those items might be. Well, I guess the, the big ticket item would be uh, a Bearcat that we share with the uh, Fresno Sheriff's Department and Clovis Police Department. Um, it was, I believe, purchased with grant funding. Um, there's also, we do have a piece of military um, equipment. Uh, it's probably the only item that I, I believe we got from the military, and that was a, uh, an MRAP. Uh, it's it's really designed to uh, uh, it's an armored uh, vehicle that allows us to go in and rescue people to get them out. So, example, if we had a school shooting uh, and we had multiple casualties, multiple wounded, we would drive that in there. We would throw them into this vehicle. We could probably get about maybe 10 people inside of it and safely get them out. It has no weapons or armament. It's just uh, it's just a ballistic uh, van, uh, for lack of better terms. That's probably our most serious piece of military equipment. Uh, we do have a SWAT van. It's just a, um, a com you know, it's just a standard uh, command van that all police departments have. However, it's dedicated uh, to our to our uh, SWAT vehicle. To go back to the MRAP, uh, it, that was brought to council and was approved by council. Just uh, just for your recollection, um, but uh, that we have a SWAT vehicle or a SWAT command vehicle which is um, the standard, we re retrofitted, basically it's just a whole gear uh, for the SWAT team when they arrive. Um, it, it's, uh, we had a, a 1972 bus that we used prior to that, and uh, it was so broken down that we were actually having to get a tow truck to tow it to our SWAT call, um, and that was a little embarrassing. Um, so we eventually replaced that with some help from the council, as well with some help from the private funding. Um, other than that, uh, we, we have some uh, some items. You know, we obviously have crowd control uh, items, uh, pepper balls, uh, 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 gas, smoke, smoke uh, grenades uh, that are used for uh, a crowd control situation. Uh, that, to my knowledge, we haven't used in a crowd control situation in my 40, 42 years. Um, and and uh, we hope that we don't have to use them. Um, Obviously, the, uh, there are some, uh, some automatic weapons that are used by the, the uh, SWAT team. Uh, they're the only uh, team that has fully automatic weapons. Um, our patrol officers have the uh, semi-automatic weapon version of the AR-15. Okay, and then, but, uh, no, yeah, that's very, very informative, I think, for the public. Um, and then just, I mean, in terms of, uh, again, from the fiscal perspective, some of those, the earlier ones you, you mentioned, uh, though, I mean, we own those outright. We're not, I mean, that's not necessarily, notwithstanding sort of maintenance costs, uh, we're not paying on any of those. No, no, they're, um, they're all funded, um, including the, 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 the new SWAT vehicle that we have is all, has all been purchased and funded. Uh, the, uh, the MRAP was a donation and the uh, Bearcat has been in, in service probably eight or nine years. So it's fully, fully paid off. Thank you. Yeah, very informative. Uh, so switching gears uh, a little bit here, <clears throat> um, I noticed uh, this came to mind as looking at the uh, the org chart uh, for one of the divisions, uh, the video surveillance uh, unit. Uh, so 
the best of my knowledge, uh, looking back, I think that has been uh, operational since roughly 2006, sort of the current version. Uh, what is the video surveillance uh, unit? Um, and it's been brought to my attention uh, by, by some folks that over the, the years and through the changes of administration and changes in uh, police leadership, that uh, there was at one point sort of a mandated uh, independent audit uh, you know, for the video surveillance unit within Fresno PD. Uh, so I wanted to know, you know, it, to the best of your recollection, uh, as long as you've been uh, from chief or, or deputy chief, uh, do you know the last time that independent audit was uh, conducted? Or are, are you familiar with this, pro with this process, uh, this, this accountability measure within the uh, and again, I, I, I didn't, you know, give you any heads up about that question uh, or any of these questions, but that one kind of pops, uh, you know, that popped up as I was looking through the org chart and maybe the administration has some insight uh, into this as well. Yeah, the, um, the, there are two, two units. One is a body camera unit, uh, which monitors all of our body cameras. And then there's a video policing unit. I think that's the one you're referring to. That, that, that is uh, our last... Yeah, our last audit uh, was in 2013, uh, and I believe it was Oliver Baines that, that Wanger. Oh, Oliver Wanger, a retired judge that did that audit. Um, and the big concern was uh, back when we started the video police unit is that we had people monitoring these cameras and they were, they could control them and look around. We don't have anybody assigned to our video, video policing unit now. Uh, they mostly record uh, location street intersections things like that um, and the concern was obviously we would be spying on residents so now we just we go back after the incident and we look and at people leaving the scene to see if we can identify a vehicle so it's a lot, a lot less intrusive now than it even was when we started the unit and this is how we solved uh, one of the the, uh, the Hmong, uh, multiple murders um, in southeast Fresno as you recall uh, by, by watching vehicles leaving it that gave us our link to the uh, to the suspect. So it's a valuable program. I, I'm perfectly okay with having it audited again. Um, there's probably a cost to that. We can we can put it in the budget, or we can try to find it within our existing budget. Um, but again, it's, we don't monitor. We don't actively monitor those cameras any longer. Okay. Well, that, that's uh, that's. So you're telling me that uh, at no point there is there ever an active. Uh, <laughs> person sort of monitoring, it, it's sort of all retroactive, uh, having to go back and, and take a look. There's no active person behind these cameras at any given time. We don't have anybody assigned as a video policing unit right now. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go back and take a look at that language just because, again, I, you know, I certainly was, uh, uh, was in high school back then, right? So I, I wasn't paying a ton of attention to what the Fresno Police Department uh, video surveillance unit language was, um, but I, I will <laughs> Go back and take a look at that uh, the language, and I think it's an, supposed to be an annual audit. Uh, so, um, and maybe there's uh, adjustments that need to be made since there is no longer active personnel uh, behind those cameras. Um, so that's something I'll, I'll I'll take the lead on. I'll go into it as well, Council Member. And uh, if it, if it is an audit requirement, we're certainly happy to do it. We've got nothing to hide. Sure, sure. Uh, but I mean, but again, if, if it, you know, depending how costly it is, and then the fact that there is no longer uh, person behind it, you know, it, it maybe it goes by annual uh, every other year as opposed to annual. Well, either way, we'll either we'll either conduct the audit or we'll come back to council with a recommendation. Sure. Um, all right, on to uh, on to CSOs. Uh, I think you had mentioned within your vacancies there uh, there was a couple CSO vacancies. Which uh, which policing districts are those vacancies in? Where I mean, what is the status of, of CSOs altogether? Our community service officers. Yeah, those are, those are community service officers. Uh, they work crime prevention and they do a variety of uh, community policing events. Um, you know, events for community like a, a block party or a, a school event. Uh, the, the district that does not have one right now is the Central Policing District. Uh, and, and, and I heard you say that per the uh, per the administration's orders, that there's a hiring fee on the CSO position. I, I believe that was either direction from the council. I got it from my boss, and so we're holding it off right now. Uh, 
going on to the uh, the 27 uh, vacancies, foreign vacancies, uh, you know, when we asked the question last budget uh, about a year ago about uh, among sworn officers, I, I believe at that point it was still 826 authorized positions, but I think there were only 13 uh, at that point, uh, 13 vacancies. And now, correct me if I'm wrong, there's, I mean, we have 27. Uh, why why the, the, the difference there? Uh, you know, what is, you know, what is the sort of average number of revolving vacancies that, that we tend to have? I mean, I mean, in my second budget, you're the council member. And I think what I'm seeing here is the number of vacancies more than double. We, we, uh, we turn over about four officers per month. That's either through retirement, terminations or some type of other leave, medical or otherwise. So about four per month, so 36 per year. We'll lose just annually, annually if we don't if we don't pick up another cop. Um, some of the positions um, um, that we're trying to fill um, are just difficult. Uh, it, 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 the process is slow, and it, it's um, it's difficult to come by. I'll give you an example. Last year we did 175 background investigations on officers, and we were able to hire 36 police officers out of 175 applicants that got all the way to the background investigation. So um, the percentage, uh, it's just a, it's a slow process that's going to be made even slower uh, by the events going on today. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I mean, the, the events going on today certainly are going to have an impact um, and everything is to some degree slowed down. Uh, so given, you know, there was 13 last uh, budget season, right now, currently there's 27 vacancies. Uh, what would you say in terms of sworn officers, what is sort of the average uh, revolving number of vacancies? Oh, what, what would you say we have at any given time? Yeah, legal. Yeah, about. It's hard to say. We, we have generally stayed about 98 to about 97, 98 um, percent, you know, on um, filled. Um, it just depends on how many how many people we turn over on a given month and how fast is the academy cycle. And as you know, the uh, COVID uh, issue delayed the academy starting, so that starts to put us behind because we're not able to grab uh, grab academy graduates. So that got us a little bit behind the ball. Sure. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, right now. Given this, these number of vacancies, we're at about 96.8%, I think, full uh, capacity. Uh, so, so somewhere maybe 22-ish, uh, if you're saying 97, 98 is uh, the average where we kind of hover around. Is that safe to say? Yeah, I think 50 to 20 would be a very safe number. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're right. Okay. All right, Chief. Well, uh, I think that's through my line of questioning. I just wanted to, to make a, a few comments and, and such, um, but appreciate your uh, information you provided here today. Uh, well, I mean, given the the sort of number of revolving vacancies, uh, I think these positions continue to to be funded. We have trouble uh, filling some of them. Um, I think we we've been kind of holding a constant holding pattern with number. Uh, sworn uh, authorized positions in the police department. Uh, so given that, and again, rewinding back to this last budget cycle where the community was looking for uh, a different direction uh, of how we address the violent crime uh, in the city. And, uh, you know, we had advanced peace on the table uh, last uh, budget uh, cycle. Uh, and unfortunately, that was vetoed by uh, Mayor Brand but I'd like to make a motion to put that back on the table. Uh, specifically, uh, I'd like uh, the motion to be uh, we allocate $300,000 uh, towards uh, the advanced keys program. Uh, it looks like in giving our revolving vacancies, we can use uh, some of those salary savings uh, to, fund, uh, to fund this program, not only for this coming fiscal year, uh, but I'm that built in uh, over a five-year cycle, which I think was uh, the uh, so if I can get a second uh, on that. Council uh, member, um, can I have you repeat your motion? You're breaking up a little, and I want the city clerk to get the motion correct. Yes. Uh, so 
the motion uh, is to uh, allocate three hundred thousand dollars towards uh, advanced advanced peace program, uh, and the funding source would uh, salary savings uh, that come from the revolving uh, the natural rate of revolving vacancies uh, within the group. Uh, and not just for this fiscal year, but I'd like to see that built in to the five-year projection uh, for the next five years, $300,000 allocated uh, in order to sort of make that uh, commitment uh, to see the program through. Uh, clerk, were you able to grab all that? Um, so the motion is to fund, um, call on Carbasi, no interruption right now, trying to get clear on the motion. Well, if the city manager can't speak and her mic's not working, I'd like to work that out because this is a significant uh, Mike, uh, Mike, discussion. please, Mike, yeah. no interruptions. Let me run the meeting and get care of the motion. The city manager has IT in her office. They can figure it out. Uh, well, then we should hold to... off until that's fixed. Mike, Thank you. Thank audio you. works. Please don't There we go. Thank you, sir. Council member, you have the floor. What's your motion? Huff, 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 huff. City clerk, do you need me to repeat my motion? Please. Yes, please. All right, here we go. Third time. Let's see if I can get this, uh, get this in. Uh, the motion is to allocate uh, $300,000 uh, towards the Advanced Peace Program. Miguel, can you hear us? Sorry, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, okay there, there we go. go. There we go. Thanks. Okay, your mic's working, but please don't interrupt council members as they speak. Okay. Remember. I'm a broken record now. Uh, $300,000 uh, towards the advanced peace program uh, to be uh, paid for through the uh, nat natural revolving uh, salary savings uh, from vacancies uh, in the police department, uh, not only for this fiscal year, uh, but for also built into the five year uh, projection for the next five fiscal years. So that way we are seeing this commitment through uh, and giving the advanced peace program a, a fair shot and the fair investment uh, that it deserves. Can I get a second? I'll second. Oh, am, right. I allowed to, am I allowed to speak not now? Yet, no. Not yet, city manager. Let me recognize you, please. It's a long day and we're trying to get through this, so please do not interrupt each other. The motion uh -huh. has been made by Council Member Sparza. It's been seconded by Councilwoman Soya. City Clerk, are you good? Yes. Okay, now you may proceed, city manager. Um, so I want to point out that we do not have any extra salary savings. If you all recall, when we adopt the budget, we, we rely on, what is it, Henry, six point? Almost seven million. Seven million dollars to help balance the general fund. So every month we go in and we sweep salary savings from every general fund department with the exception of those that report to you. And we use that money to, to balance the general fund. So I understand that the motion's on the table, but I, I, I just want to make sure that it's clear that we have no additional salary savings. Oh, okay, so, uh, well, that, that, the, the motion will remain. Um, and again, I'm open to uh, sort of adjustments uh, on, the, on the funding source, but I mean, that having advanced peace uh, is a must. I mean, the community demanded it uh, last budget cycle, they're demanding it uh, this budget cycle. Uh, you know, it's, we're, we're it's summertime, so I think uh, violent crime is on full display uh, here in our city. Um, it's something I think needs to be funded uh, one way uh, or the other. Thank you, Council Mayor. Council Ms. Hoya, you have the floor. Uh, Council, Council President, I, was, I wasn't quite done. I'm almost, I'm almost there. Almost okay. there. Uh, so that, that'll, that. be, that'll be the, that'll be my, my sole motion for, uh, for now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just again want to say to everybody that you know, in, in, in restructuring how we deliver public safety in our city uh, and, and invest dollars in a manner that's more optimal for the health and safety outcomes of all Fresno residents, it's, uh, it's a heavy lift. But this is, you know, incredibly systematic. Uh, you can't really pinpoint the blame onto to one person or, or one entity. Um, and uh, really glad to be having this conversation about how we deliver the public safety. Um, and I want to remind folks, remind the public, remind uh, everyone involved in this conversation that public safety is a function of, of how us as legislators, you know, create policy. And we as legislators are a function uh, of the people we represent, right? And I think we've done things a certain way uh, for a very long time. We've seen some uh, small amounts of evolution, uh, but I think the, the, the will of our residents uh, has shifted. 
Um, and I think we have to make adjustments accordingly, uh, again, with the focus, with the sole goal of, of making our city uh, safer. Uh, so I want to praise, again, the, uh, all the organizers and uh, residents who showed up and uh, for your public and civic engagement and keeping this conversation largely, uh, largely respectful. And to our, uh, our officers, our law enforcement, who are also listening in on this conversation and are inevitably must be part of the conversation, um, I feel the need to communicate to you that you, know, you should not be interpreting these very productive conversations as, as an attack. Again, this, is, uh, this whole process is a function of, of the residents of this city. Uh, and uh, the officers will have our, their role in public safety. I think we're just looking uh, very seriously, at, again, at how we deliver that public safety. So thank everyone for being uh, part of this process. That'll uh, we'll yield the rest of my time, Council President. Thank you, Councilmember Marza, Councilwoman Soria. I just wanted to add, and this was related to the motion, that's why I wanted to speak before you concluded your remarks, Councilmember Esparza. I think that I, I get the, the concern that there may not be salary savings and so forth. Um, there are other mechanisms um, if we want this to happen to be able to fund um, this program. There is CDBG. CDBG should be uh, an allow, this could be also funded under CDBG because what we're trying to um, target and um, fix in our community or bring a different solution is um, the poverty and the crime that exists. So I, I, I believe that um, given how those funds come to our community, we could allocate um, you know, even CDBG funds if we really wanted to. I think it, it's a matter of willingness. And so if the administration and the mayor is supportive of figuring out a funding mechanism, it may not have to be the salary savings of PD because those are swept, like you said, but there are other ways to fund it. So when, when there's a will, there's a way. So I, I believe that we can, you know, hopefully in the next coming weeks and the coming months as we're reshaping our budget, we find um, the dollars to invest back into our community in a different way. Because what we've seen is that we can't continue to do the same and expect uh, better outcomes um, with the same type of investments. We got to modify things. Agreed, Council Member Soria. Agreed. All right, the sport is clear. Council Member Carbasi, uh, Bradfield, would you like the floor? I think you're on mute, you. Council Member Bradfield. Is Carbasi speaking or? No. Uh, whoever, they don't have their hands up, so I'm asking. Okay. Well, let, let me just say a couple of things at this late hour. I, I too want to echo the, uh, the appreciation I feel for all the people that uh, spoke. Um, I hear uh, the concerns that many um, uh, talked about. I have my staff here. They've written down notes uh, on many of the salient uh, points that people expressed. Uh, today, this is a hearing. There's no uh, actual uh, votes going to be taking place other than make motions. Uh, this will be decided in the budget. Um, and so there are many things that I heard that uh, I support. Some things, of course, that uh, I disagree with. Uh, I don't think the solution is to eradicate our police department. That's no solution. Uh, that would just uh, wreak more problems for our community. Uh, and I don't think people truly, a uh, significant majority of people uh, do not want to er eradicate, abolish our police department. I look forward to uh, discussions that are gonna take place with uh, the commission that was formed. I think all of us, um, people who are elected, people in our community, people who put on the uniform, uh, are open to dialogue, communication, looking at ways that we can improve policing. Uh, I think uh, our police chief uh, is open to looking at ways that we can improve policing. I think all of our law enforcement uh, want to look at ways to improve our policing. I think uh, in regards to that, we are all one community in terms of doing things uh, better. Um, so I'm open to that. I'm open to the dialogue. I look forward to further dialogue, communication, uh, that is honest, that's straightforward, uh, leads to good things and good outcomes. And so we will see how this continues to unfold. I mean, we have to approve a budget by June 30th, so uh, we will get there shortly, and we will look at uh, all of these issues and uh, discuss them further. But again, I want people to, to know that, that called in that 
that I'm listening and I hear the, the concerns and uh, we will see how it continues to, to develop as we, we get our budget together. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Brederfield, Councilmember Carbalti. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for your patience in this very long day. Uh, today clearly is an emotionally charged day, I think for everyone, um, that much is clear. Um, we've heard some callers uh, make very blanket statements about our law enforcement comments, which I wholeheartedly don't agree with, but we've also heard a lot of them. Some of our residents really pour their hearts out about some of the systemic multi-generational challenges uh, we continue to face in our neighborhoods, including childhood trauma, PTSD, um, inadequate access to health care. But the central theme of all that is poverty, poverty in our community and the trauma of that. Um, the murder of George Floyd and the national aftermath really provide us with a unique opportunity out of tragedy to not only have a conversation um, about the real multi-generational challenges in our entire city, but also working towards policy solutions that can make a real difference that will be felt in all our neighborhoods. Um, I'm, all, I'm really looking forward to learning about what the Police Reform Commission created last week comes up with. Um, it's important to note that um, we're gonna have a really diverse group at the table um, in, including representatives of our, of our rank and file officers and some of their toughest critics. And I really encourage them to have very frank discussions. It will be a tough process, but that's okay. Um, any lasting reform, um, you know, that has a chance of becoming real policy uh, it really, in our democratic process really has to have the support of a majority of this community. That's how democracy works. Um, it's important to have an open mind, but ultimately we cannot abandon our core responsibility as a city to ensure the safety of our residents. Um, I also want to, want to make a comment about Chief Andy Hall, and um, this isn't Andy Hall, the police chief. It's not Andy Hall, the police officer. It's Andy Hall, the person. Um, chief Hall and I don't have to agree on every single issue, but the reason why I respect Andy Hall, the person, is because at his core, he is very duty bound. And that's just the example I think we need for the next police chief. And that's, what I'm gonna, that's a quality I'm gonna be looking for as this city chooses its next chief. Um, lastly, part of the national conversation um, that we've been having, and, I, and, and one of my colleagues actually mentioned it, was implicit or cognitive bias in law enforcement. Um, what that really means that as individuals, um, our um, behavior is, isn't dictated by objective information, it ends up being dictated by um, our own construction of reality. So as council members, we're human, um, and we're human like anyone else, but we can't allow ourselves to fall victim to that same bias. Um, in a city of well over half a million residents, there are only seven of us, given the honor of making these, they're chosen for the honor of making these tough decisions that are before us today. Um, it's our responsibility to represent our districts, but we also have to do what is right for our city and represent the city as a whole and not to succumb to national moods. Um, defunding Fresno PD um, really is a blind solution to a greater problem. Um, it actually sends a message, not only did we fail, um, we don't wanna do anything about it. When it comes to public safety in Fresno, failure just can't be an option that's on the table. When this council was frustrated with code enforcement, we didn't defund it, we made it better. Making any hard and fast decisions about the police department without having the recommendations of the commission that's chaired by former council member Oliver Baines would actually undermine the reforms they'll bring forward. And I think these reforms can go a long way though to heal the hurt that is in this community that we heard today from so many of our residents. Now with that, I do have a couple of questions for Chief Hall and I wanna thank you all for your patience as I shared my feelings during my first budget uh, hearing uh, about a very emotionally charged issue. Chief Hall, how many calls for service do we get a year on average? You get about 429,000 calls per year. Now, do we have a number for how many of these calls involve any use of force? Yeah, uh, last year uh, out of those 400, 29,000, we used, we used force in 289 incidents, 289. Okay, that's what I, okay, one second, because I, I just want to put this into perspective. I mean, we have to take every situation seriously. So if my math, that's about one half of one ten thousandth of 1%, according to my math. Um, 
Now, can you tell me about some of the reforms you've taken during your tenure so far? For example, with overtime, my understanding is you've been pretty strict about that. Well, again, I'm, I'm, I come from a, a duty bound history of, of, of work history. And I believe that if, if you tell me how much overtime I have council, that's how much overtime we should spend. Um, and so when I came into uh, the department as the chief of police, uh, we were projected to be between 500 to $700,000 over budget in our overtime account. So we got together with our staff and we made some, uh, some significant changes to the organization. We met with the, um, the POA and uh, we were able to, um, we, were, we were planning um, on being about 100 to 200,000 under budget, which was pretty much a savings of just under a million dollars. Uh, for my projected overtime rate. Um, however, because of the, uh, uh, the protests and the events that occurred um, of recent, um, we're probably going to be within budget, at budget now. Understood. Um, again, to put this um, in perspective of how these changes are going to affect, how any changes at the decisions we make can affect the public, um, especially the folks in my in, in my district or or other neighborhoods. Um, so there's a demand to defund PD to no more than 45% of the general fund budget. And I expect one of my colleagues to make a motion for that because I mean, well, I'll leave it at that. Um, can you, according to my math, and I could be off a little bit, but that's about $14 million in, in lost revenue for the department. Can you explain to me the effect that will have on the community? I mean, the effect it'll have, how it's gonna look like, um, less patrol officers for the community policing model? Well, as I indicated, we're down about 45 civilian positions. Um, from our, um, we currently have 309 civilian positions from a, from a high of 450. Um, we're down to about 250 now. Um, we can't, we don't have the ability to cut any more civilian positions. We just don't. Without severely impacting uh, law, state law, and the uh, when it comes to our 911 system. Um, when you look at our budget, uh, our overall budget, 4% um, of our budget is on purpose. In other words, it's not in somebody's salary. Um, when you compare that to the, uh, the fire department, their 9% of their total budget is, is non purpose. So we're, we're very efficient with your dollars. Um, but the fact is, is if, if we're cutting $14 million, we're cutting cops. We're cutting cops in the street. And, and at some point, we, as this body, has to decide what services we're going to cut to the community. And, and, and I'll give you an example. ICAP, which is a, is a, uh, a combined team that, that uh, we share with other agencies for, for sexual predators. Uh, last week, we, uh, we arrested a sexual predator in the city of Fresno, who was uh, arrested on multiple counts of child molestation, including rape of infants. Now, um, is, I, I'm not sure if this is the type of downsizing this council wants. So what we'll have to do is we'll have to go uh, through our budget and decide how we get rid of 150 officers, because that's what the equivalent is about, maybe 100, maybe 140 officers. And we've got to decide what services we're not going to do, what, what, what we're not going to respond to, um, and, and that's going to be difficult because are we not going to we're not going to investigate elder abuse, or child molest, child neglect? Um, are we not going to respond to calls for service? Those are the kind of questions that you'll have to answer because ultimately you re, you report to the, the, your constituents, and this will have an impact on them. Um, I'm I'm excited to look at some of the options of, of not responding to calls for service like homelessness or mental illness or other social ills in our community. Um, but the fact is when you start cutting a budget, that has, that has consequences. And, and we're gonna have to be very upfront with the public on what those consequences are. Um, Chief, um, I'm just gonna comment on, on something you said. Um, I have a very um, large active senior population in my district. You mentioned elder abuse. My dad, who I love very much, was a victim of elder, elder abuse. Um, and I'm the one that had to take him and he can't walk very well. And when you have to go to court, you have to park pretty far away and make that long walk. And 
to see the perspective from a victim, and there are far more violent, worse crimes out there, and elder abuse can be part of violent crime as well, but the effect that victimization has on people that I don't think we've talked about a whole lot today, that's what I'm really concerned about, increased victimization and cutting the funding, because th throughout the whole step in the process, from the interview from the officer to the DA's office that came in and interviewed my dad, to the advocates he got at Fresno County, the victim advocates to help him through the process, to working with the assistant district attorney, that whole apparatus gave him protection. And I think that's something that needs to be discussed too, because I don't want us to lose any portion of the apparatus if we just simply defund. I think we need to talk about the real impact it's gonna have. Yes, we want reform, and I think reform is important, and I, I, I really want PD at the table for that. But I don't wanna undercut what the mission is right now, and to me, for the city, the core responsibility is the safety of residents, whether it's police and fire or any other apparatus. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I look forward to the continuing discussion with my colleagues and the decision we have to make, but um, I really do appreciate the community that came out and voiced their concerns. Um, and I wanna thank you, Chief, and um, the people that put their lives on the line every day to keep us safe. It is a very real fear you live with, and I think it was very appropriate you talked about the deputy that was killed because there are, there are people that are a threat to all of us, and you put yourself in harm's way, and I'm, I'm just, I wanna express my gratitude for that we've got to make things better but um i just i really appreciate the service of your of your department thank you <laughs> sorry council president stepped away for a quick second is there anyone else on the uh council that would like to speak Council President. Council Vice President. Vice President. Go, Go ahead, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's been a very long, long day and full of ups and downs and uh, very, very uh, grading energy wise with all the things that have been brought forward and all the diverse opinions, ideas. Uh, I haven't heard any specific solutions, but I've got a lot of. Uh, ideas and questions in mind. Uh, in light of the hour and so much has been said already, I'm not one to repeat what's been said or say it over and over, whatever. So with that in mind, uh, I'll reserve any further comments to Thursday during our regular city council meeting. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Council Vice President. Any other comments from the rest of the council before I begin my comments? none let me go down my questions um chief as, as you probably remember chief i wasn't a big fan of the hiring process that resulted in your hiring but since then when i've been asked i've given you a b plus for your performance based <laughs> only on your actions chief um and i do um want to vouch publicly that when you reference duty bound and honesty it's not just a soundbite but i've seen that you've demonstrated that ability with us so um, I appreciate the work that you've done in that area, and I do appreciate the changes you've made thus far to the police department. Uh, it's no small thing to reassign officers from special units into patrol. It's no small thing to have detectives work five days a week like the rest of us. And I know that there's significant pushback when you took those two actions in the best interest of the city. So for that, for that I, I want to acknowledge that, and I want to acknowledge that it's not easy, but that you've done it because you're duty bound. Um, so with all the kudos, now let's get to the real questions, Chief. Uh, <clears throat> let me start off with, um, Chief, you've seen the 15 demands from the last meeting that the council had from the NAACP. Um, have you yet taken a position or provided them a response to 15 demands for police reform? Uh, we, we did meet, we had a meeting, um, I'm, trying, I'm losing days, but uh, it seemed like last week we had a meeting with the group. Uh, I have a meeting scheduled for the week of the 22nd um, with the uh, with my advisory committee, which is a, a pretty diverse group of the community, to go over the, um, the, the eight demands. 
Um, I, again, I believe we've met all of them, um, with the exception of maybe the uh, carotid restraint. Um, uh, in the aid demand, it refers to the chokehold, which is a different uh, restraint technique than the carotid restraint, um, but we will vet that out. Um, I do believe that we could clean up some policy language, and I'm hoping that this committee can, can help me do that. My plan is to put our policy up on the board, read it to them, compare it to their demand, and see how they, they mesh. And if they don't, we'll fix it. Thank you, Chief. Um, and when you complete that process, if you could um, give us a memo with whatever it is that you've concluded around their demands, that would be helpful to us. Um, Chief, in your opinion, um, what needs to change in our policing practices and how is that reflected in your upcoming budget? Well, um, what I mean by policing practices, Chief, is you've seen the national response around police reform. You've been here for a year. You've done some uh, initial reforms around detectives' work hours, around uh, prioritizing patrols versus special units. In, in, in your opinion, uh, being a tenured officer in this department and now a chief for a year, what should we be looking at changing? If you could give the Reform Commission some guidance on where they should be looking, what would it be? Well, I'd like to, I'd like to get back into the community. Um, I think our officers are so busy right now that, that, that they've drifted apart from the community. Um, I can remember uh, when I came on, I had, a, I had a walking beat in El Dorado Park, which was back then Sin City. Um, I was uh, 23 years old and, and I walked that, that beat and I got to know everybody in that, in that area. Uh, it's one of the most highly dense, uh, densely populated uh, locations in the city of Fresno, and I think in the state of California. Um, and, and being able to, to meet the people, to talk to them, uh, to be a regular in their community uh, was a pretty special time for me in my career. And I believe it, it, it helped the community adjust. We were transitioning to the uh, Southeast Asian community uh, during those years. Now, many of them couldn't speak the language, so I got to meet their kids. And I got to communicate to the, to the, to the parents through their children. And, and our officers don't have that anymore. We, we don't have that ability to, to truly ingrain ourselves in the community any longer. Uh, it was my hope to expand on um, bringing broken neighborhoods back to life in our city. I think it's an amazing program. Um, and I had asked for positions in the fiscal year 21 budget. Um, unfortunately, um, circumstances aren't going to allow that. Um, so I think I think the best thing that I can wish for right now for my officers is time. And, and that may be available if we can um, look at services that can be handled by somebody, another department or another agency, um, social uh, ills in our community. Uh, that, that council member uh, Soria is absolutely right. Uh, probably should not be handled by police, but have been left to us because nobody else is here to do that. Um, so I'm excited about looking at opportunities um, to look at other ways and other departments that can maybe pick up some of that load that can free up our officers so that we can ingrain ourselves back in the community. I think diversity hiring is a huge issue for us. And that's my, my biggest concern. If we, if we go down this road of, of laying off cops, um, our most diverse work, workforce is our younger officers. Um, in the last uh, three to five years, we've done an excellent job of hiring from within the community. It hasn't been easy because we've had to go into that community and, and look and get, get people uh, to, to come to the police department. And we've had to train them from the ground up. Um, we've had to, uh, to hire them as cadets train them and get them ready to go to the academy so they could be successful. Send them to the academy and then get them to the program. And I, I fear that a lot of that, that will be lost if we go backwards at this time in our organization. Thank you, Chief. Now, Chief, um, that segues to my next question. Um, I, as you know, and has been articulated by you and others, over the last decades, sworn officers that have been asked to do more, go into schools and handle discipline, you know, clear out homeless encampments, go guard, you know, garbage, you know, dumps from people taking recyclables, graffiti removal, your, your sworn officers are, are now responsible for declaring individuals 5150. Um, and if we could help you, because I know you've indicated that you would love to be out of the social work and homeless business, 
if we could help take some things off your plate and the sworn officer's plate, where would we start in your opinion? Well, I, I think a good start is, is the homeless issue. Um, as you indicated, uh, only 1.6 of, of the recipients that, that we contact accept services. Maybe it is a time we look at a different approach to that and look at uh, pulling our police officers out and having uh, social workers or somebody, another department um, address those issues. Um, mental health system is, is quite honestly, it's broken. Uh, we put we put uh, mentally ill people uh, into the hospital, and only to have them out four or five hours later, uh, back in the community. Um, I can I can give you example after example where um, we we've, we've taken somebody to the hospital on a commitment, only to be released and commit a, a, a violent crime, um, or or get involved in a significant police action. So, um, it, 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 Lexington, if I had a crystal ball and I could make the world a better place, and I'm certainly willing to try, uh, both would be the areas that, that I would think we should focus on. Thank you. And, Chief, in terms of shootings, I know you referenced that shootings are up this year. And last year, the mayor and our mayor, like Dyer, opposed advanced peace as an alternative. Um, if, if advanced peace doesn't occur, what's the alternative that the uh, Fresno Police Department is prepared to implement? to reduce shootings in our city. Do you have an alternative well, I, at this point? Yeah, I, I believe we are working on a, a modification of, of advanced peace, and I'll, I'll let the mayor kind of address that, but it, it's modeled after that, but it's more Fresno specific. Um, and I think, I think the council um, will appreciate the efforts that, that not only the city has done, but the community has worked on it. So, um, before we move forward with a, a, a model not tailored to Fresno, um, I hope that as a council would be willing to at least entertain the thought of having a, a Fresno-specific version of advanced peace um, model for Fresno. Thank you. And, and I think you'll find that council that's willing to do that. Last year, the majority wanted advanced peace, and we gave direction to pursue a, a Fresno-specific approach. And um, I think it's clear that the staff has to June 5th, June 25th, and the mayor to come up with an alternative or else we're left with no other option but to vote on the motion on the floor. So we, we have some time before we have to cross that bridge. Um, yeah, I have to find a letter in support of, of, the, uh, of the group that is putting this program together. Um, and uh, I, I, I believe you'll find that it's pretty much modeled after advanced peace, but it's just a little bit more tailored to our community. Understood. Yeah, and I have um, H. H. Spees is on the line as well, and he was mayor and H. were hoping to make rounds with all of you to kind of address and, and introduce the program that they would like to invest in. Okay. Um, do, does he need to do it now, or does would he like to do meetings with the council members before the next before the twenty? I know the mayor's not available right now, so my, my recommendation is we do we set up some meetings, and okay. then we can, yeah, and then we can we can discuss it next week during one of our budget. Um, council meetings as well. I, I would ask the city manager that you prioritize the members who made the motion on advance fees first to meet with them first. We can do that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Chief, um, do you have any evidence or data or evaluations that um, demonstrate the effectiveness of special units in reducing crime? Have we ever done any kind of evaluation of, of the special units that we have? Well, I, I can tell you from experience that when we, we do do a focused effort, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, when we do do a, a, an effort to impact gang violence in our community, it does have a, a correlation to reduce uh, shootings in our city. Uh, the problem is that we can't sustain it because we simply do not have the funding or resources. So temporary suppression results in temporary um, reduction. Is that fair to say? Well, it, it, it does, but I can't control the courts or the judicial system, uh, the revolving door of that, of that system. Uh, so it, it, it does become temporary um, if they're in for two years. And when we see them come out, we see crime get first. OK, thank you. Um, Chief, um, we, a year ago, I think it was, there was some audit findings that were not too favorable related to the police academy and the police department. 
And we were told at that time that you guys were going to take action and resolve some of those findings. The audit committee or nor the council has ever gotten a report back from how those audit findings were resolved. Um, do you have an update for us? Um, you know, um, Council President, let me work with the auditors and um, get a trade memo out to you all because I need to fine. see what our, our typical process is. For, yeah, for I think oh. you, you, you guys promised us an update in six months and it's been about a year. So if you can just respond to us when you have an opportunity, City Manager, that'd be sufficient. Yep, we can do that. Thank you. Um, and Chief, I don't know if you've heard, but today the Supreme Court um, rejected the challenge from the president on California Sanctuary State Declaration allowing it to stand. Um, do, do you believe in Fresno that we're doing enough for our undocumented community, given that there's been this historic opposition to sanctuary city status? Uh, we follow we follow the governor's uh, uh, sanctuary city status. Uh, we do not uh, um, work with ICE. Um, we don't uh, uh, place uh, uh, immigration holds. Um, nor do we ask anybody their status as a citizen or non-citizen. Uh, it's just not something that, that the police department does. Right. Thank you for confirming that. It's reassuring to a lot of people who are watching today. Um, in terms of lawsuits, um, Chief, I know last year's budget increased our amount for lawsuit settlements from $2 million to $4 million. Uh, what it, what's your advice, now that you've been Chief for a year, on how we reduce the future liability of officer-involved shootings that result in some of the lawsuits. What what do you think we should be doing differently or we could be doing differently if resources was not an impediment? Yeah, that, this is a tough one because if you look at Fresno, we're, we're probably lower than most cities our size. And most of these incidents are mental mental health related that, that we're, we're becoming involved in. Um, what I have done is I've slowed the process down. And what we find out is that if we can slow the process down, we generally get much better results. Uh, so I have I have directed a recent policy after meeting with my advisory uh, uh, panel. Some who agreed with me and some who didn't. Um, but but we, we 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 talked about de-escalating. We even talked about just simply walking away. And and I've had a few situations where where we've walked away and and I've taken a lot of criticism. Um, from that, and, and I can I can give you an example. I know I know it's late, but I I have a, a relatively recent example where we had uh, committed a, a young man uh, for mental health issues at the hospital. Uh, he was released six six hours later. He went back to his parents' house and broke into his parents' house and took a uh, assault rifle or a, not assault rifle, but a semi-automatic uh, AR-15 out of out of the uh, father's safe. And then ran them out of the house. He was in the house by himself. Obviously, they called the police. We surrounded the deal, and we negotiated it with him for, for four or five, oh, I think almost six hours. Uh, we had mental health people there. We had negotiators. We had our SWAT team. Uh, ultimately, we had about 50 people on this call. Um, and I got the call at home at about three in the morning, and um, they wanted they want asked me what to do. And under normal circumstances, we would we would eventually initiate a, a SWAT call. And I remember asking my SWAT commander, I go, well, what happens if we go in? And, and during this time, these negotiations, he had fired this weapon off three times in the house. And I asked him, what, what happens if we go in? And he says, well, he, he, he shoots at us and we shoot back and, and, and we kill him. Uh, I, what happens if he comes out with the gun? He says, well, if he doesn't drop it, we shoot him. And, and I asked that commander, uh, I said, I said, do you think when that father called us to his house, mentally ill son, do you think he asked us to come over and, and kill his son? And uh, the SWAT commander says, no, sir, I don't. I don't. I said, well, I'm not prepared to kill his son tonight. And I said, um, what happens if we leave? Just walk up, pack up our stuff and leave. He says, well, um, he could kill himself, or he could uh, he could walk outside and go to a neighbor's house and kick the door in and kill a family of four. He could walk down the street with a gun. I said, well, those are all possibilities, right? He goes, yes. I said, but 100% for sure, if we go into the house, we kill this boy. 
said, yes, sir. I said, well, we're going to park this car down the street. We're going to advise the neighbors to call us if it's anything. We're going to find a place for the parents to stay tonight. Yeah. We're going to leave. And that's what we did. We left. Fortunately, we came back the next day. He was gone. He left the gun. We were able to collect the gun. Uh, we caught up with him a few days later after he came off in that high. He dozed off. And, uh, and he apologized, and we were able to get him help. So that's the kind of direction that I, I want to take this organization. Slow down. Let's think about it. Let's think about the consequences of our actions, uh, and let's see if we can do better. Thank you for that thoughtful response, Chief, and, and for the fact that you remind us that, um, you know, simply de-escalating is sometimes a better mm -hmm. option, especially when it's the livelihoods of our residents are at risk. Um, with that, Chief, I'd like to talk about contract policing. As you know, um, during COVID-19, we shut down the malls. Um, I think it was last week, I finally took my daughter to sh um, clothes shopping at Fashion Fair, and the Apple store was closed, and they had a fully uniformed police officer protecting a closed Apple store. Um, and we have similar agreements in Walmart and bars. Um, and by definition, those who can afford the you know, private security of an armed present police officer get immediate response while the rest of us have to wait however long it takes somebody to pick up the dispatch call and then get to the scene. Do you think that that should continue or should we limit our police officers from continuing to be rented for those who have the ability to pay? Well, the reason I, I asked you is not to put you on the spot, but because yeah, yeah, no, I, it, this yeah. is going to be an issue that the commission is going to have to wrestle with. We can, we can certainly have that discussion, council member, and I, I'm more than willing to have it. Um, but we got to keep in mind that the schools rent our police officers. Uh, the fair rent our police officer. Um, yeah, City Hall security rent our police officers to provide security at City Hall. So, um, yeah, it, it is something we have to discuss. It becomes a business decision for them. Um, the, the California law has made uh, uh, petty theft virtually shoplifting not a crime anymore. And, and the fact is these businesses are, are losing um, uh, merchandise at such a rate that it's um, more cost effective for them to pay for a police officer to be there than it is to try to stay in business. And I guess the fear is I would have if, if as we go down this route is to lose businesses in our city and, and you know the, uh, the consequences of that. So um, I'm, I'm more than willing to have the discussion. Obviously it's a concern of mine as well. Um, um, but this is driven um, by the fact that um, the businesses cannot protect their merchandise. Thank you, Chief. And, and I fully uh, agree with you that this started off as a supplemental support for public institutions, and now it's become a supplemental for por support for corporations. And, mm -hmm. you know, our, our frustration, of course, from residents is when your mom and pop business calls 911, yeah. it takes 20, 30 minutes to get there. When Walmart car calls, they have a full-time person there because they can afford it. So mm. it's just a, a point of conversation that we'll have to have as we continue um, because if, if it becomes about those who can pay, get the immediate police response versus the general public, yeah. it makes it much more difficult for us to demonstrate to the public that public safety needs additional local support in a tax measure or any other measure. Um, in terms of uh, response time, Chief, um, what's the current response time to pick up a 911 call and also for folks to show up to a priority one call on average? I, I think you have those numbers, right? Yeah, I do. I have in front of me now. Um, are you looking by district or overall? Overall. Um, how, however, you, you typically share the information. And then where does that land in terms of a state average or a city average, however you want to compare them? Okay, so from our, on our citywide average, our are from the time you call a 911 and we answer it, um, to get a police officer to arrive on a priority zero, which is our life threatening calls for service, it's uh, just under eight minutes or seven minutes, 7.76, uh, seven minutes and 76 seconds, 0.76 seconds. Um, the, the worst districts for response time are the Northeast and Northwest policing districts. Um, with 8.32 minutes and 9.13 minutes. 
um, respectfully. And then the, uh, uh, the lowest response time we have is in central service. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And what about for other calls that are not uh, zero life threatening? Um, but where does that average? Well, priority one would be our next. And I, I, I caution you that, that you know, when I say non life threatening, that would be a burglar breaking into your house or, okay. or somebody uh, fighting or beating you up, assaulting you. Um, even though those may sound life threatening, they don't, they don't rise to the level of a priority zero. That makes sense. Uh, in that situation, uh, for a citywide response, it's at uh, little about 15 and a half seconds, or 15 minutes, 30 seconds. It's about 15 minutes for a burglary assault kind of call. Thank you, Chief. And if you can give us that information in, in a memo, it's fine. I'd like to just get an understanding of um, how long it takes us, because um, as much as folks would like to see the reorganization, the reprioritization of public safety, I think often we forget um, what the current service level is also. Um, and then Chief, I noticed that you have a workman's comp unit. Um, wh why do you need a workman's comp unit in your department um, outside of whatever workman's comp lawyers and staff we have citywide? Well, that's to make sure that officers aren't abusing um, um, the system to make sure that uh, they are um, making their doctor's appointments to, that we're coordinating with doctors to ensure that uh, they can come back to limited duty as quickly as they can, or if we have to retire them because they can't perform the full range of duties any longer, then we have to begin termination process on that. What's the size of that unit? It's just one person. One person? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, when when we use unit, I, I, I think of a dozen people working there, but... Yeah. Council member, yeah. or council yeah. president, and, and every department has that to some extent. You know, typically not a full time job, but PD is large enough where it might take more. So, so, um, uh, assistant city manager, you don't have a centralized workman's comp unit, everybody well, has their own, like IT. Uh, yeah, they personnel centralizes it, but they're what, what the departments are typically doing are doing what Andy was talking about, and that's coordinating time off within the department, um, uh, making sure there's no abuse. Uh, they really work heavily with uh, our personnel department. That makes uh, sense. Yeah. Assistant City Manager, since I have you on the line, um, I noticed that FPOA has three FTEs assigned to them for labor work, while every other unit typically has one. Why is that? And what's our contribution towards that work? Um, we have two uh, full-time employees assigned to the Fresno Police Officers Association. Uh, that is paid for by the Police Officers Association, and those are fully funded by the association. We have one other additional position that was recently approved uh, for PORAC, which is the uh, uh, state um, associate, statewide association. Uh, that officer was elected on a statewide ballot, uh, and that that officer is also funded out of the uh, statewide association funding. There is no general fund money coming for their for their employment. Chief, um, when you count your sworn officers, are these three individuals counted as part of the sworn officers that we appropriate and not available for patrol or any other regular duties? Yeah, they're, they are in the authorized position, uh, but they're counted into that group that's funded by an outside source. Got it. Perfect. So on paper, it looks like we have three additional officers that could be available for duty, but they're paid for to do other duties by their association. And, and council president, to, to some extent, uh, that is also in each department. There are bargaining unit representatives that are, are representing employees. Bus drivers are a good example. We, we have representation there that uh, may not be behind the wheel of a bus. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, and the last questions I have for you, um, uh, police chief, is I've been reading a lot of the police auditors, independent police auditors um, reports. And um, what I've seen is in some of the cases, not to get into litigation, but in some of those cases, um, those actions are determined to be within city policy. But the independent police auditors report um, cites a series of 
uh, recommendations to address gaps. Are all those, have all those recommendations been implemented by the department or do you have a process to go through and make sure that every police, every case in which the police auditor um, recommended changes to policies or procedures are, is complete? Um, you know, I think the simple answer to that is that in every report, Council President, they um, John Gliotta makes note of what the department has implemented and the recommendations they've adopted. So if you're sp speaking to something specific, we can probably address it easier that way. Okay, perfect. That's fair enough, City Manager. Okay. And then, I can I can tell you that since I've been the Chief of Police, we have uh, adopted all of his recommendations that he's made to me. That's fair. That's fair, uh, Police Chief. And, and my last question for you, Police Chief, is um, where are we at with um, uh, with your budget? Are have we determined that? we need a thousand officers. And how did we arrive at that magic number of a thousand officers that keep on hearing every politician promise to deliver when they're running for office? Yeah, I believe it, it's based on a, a, pot, a formula for lack of better terms, council member, uh -huh. um, 1.8 police officers uh, per thousand in our community. Uh, as I noted before, the, state, the national average, and I believe the state for ma major cities is 2.2 per thousand. However, we were attempting to achieve a 1.8 uh, level of, of uh, per thousand citizens. Okay, perfect. Um, and the only thing I have left, Council, is for I have a couple of motions I'd like the Council to consider on the Police Department budget. My first motion is to eliminate the recyclable officers' tasks and reallocate them to other patrol tasks um, or anything else recommended by the Police Chief. I think it's time for us to stop you know, patrolling uh, garbage cans with uh, sworn officers and get them to other duties that the police chief deems Second. are higher priority. Thank you, Council Member Carbasi. Then I'd like to make a motion to remove officers from, from mental health calls and pursue Fresno County Behavioral Health to become the primary respondent to those calls with a police backup if necessary. I'll second that. And then I'd like to motion that the police department and city not bill school districts for the full cost of school officers when they're not at schools. In the case of this break that we've had from schools during COVID, I think those are easily reimbursable by, by the COVID funds. And we can make sure that the police department remains whole on their financing, but we shouldn't be billing people when officers are, are not at school sites. Second that. Thank you. Um, second by Councilor Esparza. And then my next motion is to have the police department evaluate the return on investment and effectiveness of all special units and report to the commission for police reform. I think it's gonna be critical information they need. And they, uh, Sorry, we had an audio hookup. Yeah. So the motion is, is to um, have the police department evaluate the return on investment and effectiveness of all special units and report to the, uh, and report their findings to the Commission for Police Reform. I'll second that. And my last motion is to um, have the Police Department evaluate the effectiveness of gang, gang injunctions. Do we still do those, Police Chief? Second that. I'm, I'm sorry, what was the last one, Council Member? Gang injunctions. Gang injunctions. Oh, do we do this? No. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't remember the last gang injunction we've done, Council Member. Okay. That, that kind of several years ago. So let me do this, Chief. If if you can just get 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 back to me on gang injunctions, and I will remove that motion for now. Um, if we're not doing them, then there's no need to evaluate them. Very good. Okay. That those are all my motions, Council. Um, I'm not going to go back to the rest of the Council for any last motions before we end the budget hearing today, Councilwoman Soria. You have the floor. And I just want to make a similar motion on the homeless task force. I think uh, the chief, you know, he was pretty clear in terms of them wanting to get out of that business. I think that um, similarly, let's take those folks out of doing that and back to patrol or whatever you deem them to be most appropriate and that we find a different model to address um, the homelessness situation. That may be looking at the fire department or it may be looking at social workers and outreach workers to try to get these folks um, the necessary mental health and housing um, services that they need. So that's my 
obviously police back up when they're when it's necessary, right? So, uh, Councilman, can you just repeat your motion one more time for a city clerk and then um, yes, see sir. if anybody seconds it clearly? Similar motion to what you made with the, the cops assigned to trash. These just are. Restate your motion, please. Just My motion is to look at a different model to respond to our homelessness um, calls. So that way that the homeless task force officers are reassigned uh, at whatever the discretion of the chief them to, to use. We can look at a different model, either the firefighters or social workers and outreach workers um, to get the folks the services and housing they need. Okay, is there a second for her motion? Second. second by council member um, Esparza. Um, give me one second guys really quick. We have um, our janitorial staff is starting to vacuum the building. So there's a little bit of background noise. At least we know they're working on schedule. Um, council president really quickly. Do you mind emailing us your uh, list of motions again, please? So we may, I make will, what about I email them to you like I did last time. I would appreciate yeah. that a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And council, I would recommend for the um, courtesy of our city clerk and our city manager, if you would just take an additional step and email your motions to the staff so that they can have it all, you know, correct. That so, is very helpful for us. Thank you. And to, motion to adjourn. The meeting. Done. Um, there's a motion to adjourn the meeting. Yes. Is there a second for that motion? Second. It's been seconded by um, Gavin from IT. <laughs> And we're actually going to technically take a recess until tomorrow. Um, so thank you all for this great experience. And Mike, you owe me a cup of coffee for interrupting me so much today. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you.